First up, Socrates. This guy is an absolute legend. He came to the astounding realization that nobody, including himself, knows what the fuck anything is or what anyone is talking about. We're all dumb as fuck and we should stop pretending like we're anything more than that. In my opinion, this is the greatest philosophy ever created. Nothing else even comes close. It's not something that you understand, you learn it, and you have it down. It's something that you understand more and more as you experience more about the world. Even in my own life, everyone always talks about situations as if everyone understands everything. Like this whole like h rock situation, we were just talking about it, right? If you see like Maya's and Pokimane's responses, it like reeks of the lack of realization that they're still students of mother nature. You know, deep fakes are a new technology. And yeah, like most people will intuitively say that it's bad. But even that, you have to prove it. You just have to think about it. Because otherwise, you're building your worldview on a foundation of, of blindness and softness to the intricacies of the world. Accepting things as, as so and not so without actually thinking about it is literally the very thing wrong with the world. Not by my standards, but by the standards of people claiming that there's something wrong with the world. Literally anyone who says that, like, oh, this is the problem, these people are the problem, or whatever, anybody who makes that claim, it all stems from one thing, deep down, and it's people enjoying the pleasure of holding opinion while avoiding the, pla while avoiding the pain of thinking. All anyone will ever do in life is distract themselves from their own mortality. And all conflicts and arguments stem from a disagreement about what the best ways to distract ourselves. We're, we're absurd, okay? We're not all knowing and we should stop pretending like we do know everything or that we even have a handle or grasp on even like the simplest things. And this philosophy is really what I'm using to judge all other philosophers. It's so good. It's the basis of ranking every other person on this tier list. That and um, like Agrippa's trilemma, right? Maybe it's like Muckhausen's trilemma, one of the two. I think it's both, but it basically simplifies down like a pathway of reasoning into a series of decisions that lead to a conclusion. Basically, it's like, okay, a line of reasoning can go down one of three pathways. Infinite regress, okay, which is, that's the why game. That's when kids go like, why? And then you give them an answer and like, why? And then why to that? Why, why, why? Over and over and over again, right? And somehow, if you actually manage to have answers for all of the why questions, even at the very end, it's still possible to keep asking why. So at a certain point, you're going to hit one of two roadblocks. And the first is an axiom or, or a fundamental belief, like, uh, you know, God is the most popular axiom or someone could just say, like, that's just how things are, or because I say so. Th those are all axioms, right? They're things that, like, you have to put up with or believe at their very core. Like, they don't have a layer below them. They are core beliefs on which all other beliefs are built off of. You could say that uh, an axiom that a lot of people hold is, like, uh, like, humans are inherently good, or humans are inherently bad. You know, I see a lot of people that believe both. And, uh... If you believe either of these, you also have to hold the axiom that good and bad are quantifiable things that can be measured, right? And this is the difference between the two. And you also have to believe the axiom that you yourself are qualified to make that judgment on what is good or bad. And you have to hold the axiom that you're capable of judging people to determine what they're doing is good or bad. So it's a really, when you really look at it, it's actually like a very, very, like, you have to be, be confident beyond belief to actually think that, um, you know, human beings are inherently good or, or they're inherently bad or whatever. Um, and you'd be, you'd be foolish not realize that it is something that you hold true to yourself based off your own life experiences or whatever, and that you can't assume that everybody else is going to hold those same axioms true to themselves as you are. So, um, and the final like pathway on like the final roadblock, uh, is circular reasoning. It's the chicken or the egg. It's like why a, because B, why B, because a, right. Um, and from a mathematical perspective, these really are your only three options when it comes to like a number, there's infinite regress, 
uh, which is an irrational number that never ends. It's uh, not terminating and not repeating. Um, an axiom is like a decimal that repeats. So like 3.333 repeating or like 3.0000 repeating, which also counts. And technically that terminates, right? But it terminates on itself. Um, and then there's circular reasoning, which is a non-terminating repeating decimal, which is basically the same thing, but they're both endings, right? They're both able to be, um, they're both able to be displayed by fractions, right? So it would be like, it's, it's a repeating decimal with any periodicity greater than one. So like point eight one eight one eight one, and the eight one keeps repeating, right? Or it could be like point zero four five six seven eight four five six seven eight four five six seven eight and the four five six seven eight is repeating right because circular reasoning doesn't need to just be two things it could be like y a because b y b because c y c because a the only thing is it has to go in a circle right because like this is pure math logic here and and these really are when it comes to like displaying a, a number anything that's quantifiable these are your only three options and that's that logic also applies to, to like literature, you know, this is Agrippa's Trilemma. Um, and you can kind of bypass Agrippa's Trilemma with a sort of like, with a sort of acceptance, like a, like a Zen Buddhism does this to a degree, or like a more Fati words it really nicely. <clears throat> but they all, once again, they all sort of dictate how you should live your life, right? The only really Amor Fati way of looking at Amor Fati is the philosophy of Socrates. Um, because it's the whole the idea is like, I'm not going to tell you how you should live your life. I'm just going to point out that everyone is fucking stupid, including you and me. And that's it. There is no moral of the story there or anything like that. It's the ultimate philosophy that trumps all other philosophies. So I'm using this as the standard to judge every philosophy there, uh, as well as like how deep it can go into Agrippa's Trilemma. And I'm not saying that like absurdism is the be all end all. It might be, but what I'm, I'm, I'm really judging the philosophers on is like how deep a philosophy can go into Agrippa's Trilemma, uh, into like regress without hitting one of the two roadblocks basically. Um, and how profound it is when, when you really get to those deeper levels. Some philosophies hit roadblocks very, very quickly. Also, actually, I'll use Occam's Razor as well to judge philosophies, right? And also, I'm a man of ego. So, uh, you know, their influence and their cool factor. Uh, I'm going to give it the full Doug score, you know? How deeply people resonate with it, how deeply I resonate with it is going to be much more important to me than how deeply other people. But it's not It's not like a trivial thing. I'm going to include that as well. Um, as well as like all my own personal biases in there just to tie it all up with a nice bow. So... That's how I'm judging this. So Socrates, um, you know, first of all, he didn't care about writing anything down. Any of his teachings, he, he realized the most profound thought to trump all other profound thoughts. And he straight up just went like, yep, that's good enough for me. After all, it's a personal journey and other people should go through their own personal journey and figure this stuff out themselves. So yeah, he's, he's the most ahead of his time thinker to ever live, in my opinion. And the fact that he was really the first to do philosophy at this level just puts him in a league of his own. And actually, I feel like puts him in a tier of his own, maybe. I do have a favorite philosopher, and it's not Socrates, but Socrates kind of doesn't count. He's he's beyond favorites. So yeah, this Davy Jones looking dude gets the top spot. S for Socrates. And potentially the only person that gets a spot on S tier, depending on how I'm feeling about my own personal favorite philosopher, which I'll get to. And... Okay, so Socrates doesn't count, right? He's the GOAT. And as you know, if you watch the UFC, the number one contender is not the same thing as the champion, right? There's like the one, two, three, four, five, there's like their own list, and then there's the champion, and they're in a league of their own. So to take off the real list is the OG, the first philosopher of them all, Thales. And uh, I think he was the first. I'm pretty sure he was the first, like, major one, at least. <clears throat> I'm sure, you know some dude drawing in caves, explaining to people, you know, how to be social, uh, you know, and why it's important to not betray each other. I'm pretty sure that guy was probably like the first actual philosopher, right? But unfortunately, uh, nobody remembers his name. So Thales or uh, Thales of Miletus, 
That's so cool how like people back then, like their names included like where they originated from. That sounds so cool. A Fraz of Atlanta. <laughs> that one doesn't sound that cool. But the thing about Thales is back then there was like no, uh, there was no like job of philosopher, right? And there was for sure people who had had philosophical thoughts. Uh, there's always been great like deep thinkers in society, right? Who like influenced the entire thought process of like the culture. And I guess, you know, up until this point, like before this, all those people were basically religious leaders. You know, this is really the first one with like a really solid recorded history to be doing this kind of thing and also make it separate enough to where you would call it a, a separate thing. And this is where this whole like the era of the Greek, right? The pre-Socratics or before Socrates, right? This is where that comes into play. Also, before I get into this, this entire tier list, this is something I just want to get out of the way right from the start. I might touch on it later on, but I just want to say this now. Philosophers can't be judged the same way you would judge a scientist or whatever, okay? But at the same time, there is a ton of overlap. Like, before people could just be paid to, like, sit around all day and just think, the best philosophers, so basically, like, the ancient ones, essentially, they almost always form their philosophy from what they did and their life experiences. These are brilliant minds living in the time period that they do, coming to conclusions about the world and the nature of truth. And in a way, this is science, right? Philosophy blends so much with, you know, di all different kinds of science and psychology and, and storytellers and artists and historians and comedians and mathematicians and, you know, just about like all other fields have a lot of overlap with philosophy more than any other field does with any other field. And Thales was just one of these people who was like, he was doing a lot, right? He was a brilliant mind. He was a scientist and a mathematician and all this stuff. In fact, if I remember correctly, he was the first person ever in recorded history who predicted a solar eclipse. So yeah, he, he was also someone who had like been through a lot in his life, right? Uh, he was like super active in his society, really well known. Uh, he was like active in politics and like somewhat of a major military leader and strategist. Um, there's an interesting little story about him. Actually, I might tell a story about each of the philosophers on this list just to give you an idea of like who they are, you know. So a bunch of people in this town were always like talking shit about dailies. And uh, they would say things like, oh, if you're so smart... How come you're not rich like the rest of us elites? And most philosophers weren't rich, right? On this entire list. And I think that's because they they come to the like the much deeper truth that like money isn't worth pursuing past a certain point. And Thales was the same. He didn't really care about money or anything like that, other than like basic necessities. But one day he was coming across people who were like making fun of him because he didn't look wealthy, right? So he used his vast knowledge of the world around him to predict what foods would be available and what foods would have shortages and all that stuff. And he made heavy investments into the machines that like harvested the food that he knew would be available. I think it was olives or whatever. And pretty soon after, you know, after a couple of investments and then cashing out and then to reinvest again, like pretty soon he literally had a whole monopoly on all of the useful agricultural equipments. Um, and everything else was basically useless. And he did this basically just to show off. Like, he's above these people. Like, he's smarter than them. They think they're so smart because they can make money. He can make money too. Way more than them. But he chooses not to because it's not worth his time. And I also want to, like, mention his biggest theory. And this is why I had that whole preface, right? Because it simultaneously shows the genius of these philosophers while also putting into perspective the fact that, like, the world we live in is so deeply embedded in the way we think that we aren't going to be correct on most things. So you can't judge them on how right they are or how many times they've been wrong or whatever. You can really only judge them on how profound their ideas are. So Thales was really the first one to come up with an idea of arche or arcade, not really, but like a archaea or whatever it is, right? Um, arche, it, it's... It, I'm not sure, honestly, how to exactly say it. I think it comes from the same root word as like archaic or like archaeology or archaebacteria or arch or whatever. Um, 
you know, basically during that time, uh, the ancient Greeks were trying to like find the nature of truth, right? Through all kinds of means. And an idea that seems pretty intuitive to reach naturally that sprouted during this time was like, there must be a singular, uh, you know, there, like a monoist view on the universe, right? That all things are created from a single substance. And um, it's the exact same struggle that the great minds of today have, trying to figure out the fundamental like stuff that makes up the universe. And, and you know, as far as anybody today has any proof of, it's made up of like 20 different, you know, fundamental things, uh, like particles, forces, um, stuff that's like indivisible um, into any other common factor. For example, like the electron, right? The electron field or, or the electron particle, it isn't made up of any other quarks or anything more fundamental than that, if I'm not mistaken. The electron is actually, if I remember correctly, smaller than any of the other quarks. But this, the standard model is incomplete um, and it's still all up in the air, right? String theories, it's, it's, it's out there, but <clears throat> it's, there's, no, there's no proof of any of this stuff just yet. But back then, the view was usually a monoist one um, that like everything in the universe is likely to be made up of like a single fundamental substance. And many people all throughout history all kind of threw their hat in the ring and took their best guesses. And Thales theorized that the fundamental building block for everything is water. Yeah, H2O is the thing that's the, but like, okay, look, I got to explain this thing about this flaw, these kinds of philosophers, okay? Let me tell you why it, he thought it was water, okay? He had a method to this. He had some criteria at first, and it was like, the substance has to explain existence, it has to explain motion, it has to explain life, and there was another one, I, I forgot, I think it's growth, I don't know, but basically like things that that constitute life and the universe right that's pretty reasonable if a substance can explain all three of these plus one more that i forgot like motion life and existence right if, if a substance can explain all three of these like that's a candidate for sure right so like for existence the thing is Daly's did a lot of stuff in his life um and his life experience is what led him to this conclusion an example is that like he would notice that when something cooled down, it would turn from a gas to a liquid to a solid. And if you were to heat something up, it would turn from a solid to a liquid to a gas. And water did this, and so did everything else, but not as easily as water. Water did this naturally, in nature, by itself, without any sort of human intervention. And and you have to like understand that like human intuition without scientific knowledge is really, really limited. Imagine you go your whole life not with any sort of education on the states of matter, right? But you know how things work. And one day you do an experiment to try to like heat up metal, to test out, you know, okay, what really is it? And it turns liquid, like water. That's crazy. You live your whole life thinking metal's like always a solid, right? And it turns into a water-like substance. So everything else in the universe can fall within these three states of matter if we push them. And that's actually not true. There's some things that, that literally can't be a solid no matter what. Um, maybe they can, but they would reach Bose-Einstein condensate first, literally. So, um, yeah. But as far as they knew, like, th there's three states of matter, and everything fall can fall within them. But water occurs within these three states naturally. And it was the only thing that they could see that did. Um, and water also explains motion. And this is why I love Avatar Last Airbender so much, because they literally, like, they, they, they basically revived, and in a way, they kind of invented, like, a realistic lore that humans would have totally came up with back then, but they didn't. It was actually original. Like, in the show, water is the element of change and adaptation um, and, like, community and love and that sort of thing, too. But, like, that's part of what it is, right? Um, it's the essence of water. And, like, think about this. At that time, people didn't know about gravity. They weren't even entirely sure if the earth was round or not. It was like half and half. A lot of people thought the earth was flat. A lot of people thought the earth was a uh, cylindrical, um, which I guess if the earth is flat, then technically it is still cylindrical if it's a circle. But yeah, like 
they didn't have uh, like an understanding of gravity yet. So they look at the seas, right? They look at how their boats are carried on water and they look at the ocean and the waves and 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 they they like go like okay, our boats are basically controlled they're basically at the whims of the tides, right? They're they're at the whims of like the movement of water and nobody's out here pushing this water. They're moving kind of the water kind of seems alive. It moves all on its own. So from their perspective, water, when it joins this like greater force of water, which is the ocean and the seas, it's no longer an inanimate object from their perspective. So water may not be alive itself, but all life comes from water. So it, it's not only moving, but it's like the essence of, of life. Humans don't just need water to survive. So do all other animals and all other plants and fungi and molds. Literally everything, every living organism today that we know of. Um, you know, even, even the stuff that, like, that they didn't know about. Microorganisms. Even the non-living organisms like viruses. They all need water to survive. It is the essence of life and carbon. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. So there's two ways of looking at this, right? You can say, wow, he was so wrong. I'm going to rank him low because of how wrong he was. Or you can accept that like most things anyone will ever say ever will be wrong, including you. And and if somebody makes a, a tier list like this and they decide to like put somebody high up on the tier list for being right about a lot of things, dude, that's not going to age well in the future. And your small mindedness will be on full display because... Eventually, all that shit's going to be wrong. If science has proven one thing, it's that science will always prove itself wrong, given enough time. Um, and that's the beauty of science. It's not a destination, it's a journey. But that's why I hate when people are like, oh yeah, uh, Freud said some things that you know don't make much sense. Um, even though he said a lot of things that make a lot of sense, he said some things that are like totally wrong. So yeah, I don't like him, and uh, I'm going to dismiss every... Like, bro, first of all, the shit that Freud said that, like, everyone thinks is so wrong is actually being shown, like, as time goes on to be more and more right, the more scientific data comes out on it. Second of all, the stuff that he came up with that was con considered to be right, all the, like, groundbreaking stuff about the unconscious mind, was so profound and so ahead of its time, you can't ever go, like... Oh man, I wish Freud never said this and, and you know, because he he's misogynistic and sexist and all this stuff. Because if he didn't say those things, he never would have come up with all these profound things that he came up with. You can't have one without the other. You can't you can't have a jig with no saw, you know, as as a wise man once said. And and you can maybe say like you wish Freud didn't think this way in general, right? But then he never would have thought of this stuff about the unconscious mind. That, then he never would have came up with all these profound things. So it's the kind of mind who would say all those things that everyone considers sexist and everyone hates is the same kind of mind to come up with something so revolutionary and groundbreaking like he did. You can't have one without the other. You can't ever come up with anything profound if you don't allow yourself to come up with shit that's like absolutely crazy, right? It's Kanye, name one genius that ain't crazy. And I know this from personal experience. When someone doesn't realize this, when they like say that they don't like people because they got some things wrong, that's my cue to like, like look at them differently and, and, and talk to them like they're idiots. Because they clearly haven't thought much if they haven't been proven wrong before. Because I've been wrong before, okay? I'm not saying I'm some like... I've clearly been wrong. If In fact, this is a humbling experience to me. I've been nothing but wrong. I've had my thoughts proven wrong over and over and over again countless times. Nine out of ten of all of my thoughts have been proven wrong consistently. And the one thing I've really learned from all these situations is that chances are the tenth thing that hasn't been proven wrong just hasn't been proven wrong yet, okay? Like there's, there's a way you can go about interpreting, you know, as you go through life, and you you learn the, the process of learning is literally proving something that you previously thought to be true 
is actually wrong. So you replace it with newer information. That's literally what learning is. If you haven't been proven wrong before, you haven't learned. Um, and, and so in the process of learning, you can take it in, in multiple ways. So like, let's say there's some situation with like, I don't know, um, Israel versus Palestine, right? And I, I, I have some opinion on it. I feel some way. Let's say I'm on the side of Palestine, right? And then I find out something new that puts me on the side of Israel. Uh, I was wrong before. And then I find out something again that puts me on the side of Palestine. I, t I was wrong again. And then it happens again. And then again, and again, and again, and again. And I keep switching sides. At a certain point, if I'm an idiot, I'm going to keep picking a side, right? I'm going to stay steadfast and, and, and hold a side. I'm going to grasp it firmly and be like, yeah, this is the side that's totally right. But if I have any sort of sense, after a certain number of times of me being wrong, I'm going to have to concede and go, you know what? I don't know. I, I can't say absolutely that I know this for sure. I know what I know now in the moment. But I should also take this into account. I've been wrong so many times. Chances are I'm going to be wrong so many more, right? I, I, I would be foolish to think that like after all of these times of me being wrong over and over again, it says a lot about me, the fact that I was able to believe these things and still be wrong. I would be foolish to think to myself that this is the time that I'm right. And when people don't realize that, and even after so many times of, of learning something, they still, you know, come to the conclusion that they should pick a side or, or whatever, or they should hold some kind of strong opinion one way or another it's blatantly obvious like these are the kinds of people who either one they haven't done anything with their lives to really learn shit about the world or two they just don't think like they don't think broadly enough it's like the story of the chinese farmer um who lost his horse right and all the neighbors came to him and they were like oh man that sucks you're strapped for money and your horse runs away damn that's terrible and the farmer goes like, maybe. And the next day, uh, the horse comes back and he brings two more horses. Um, and all the neighbors come to his place and they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, and the farmer's like, maybe. And the next day, the farmer's son was riding one of the new horses and he fell off and broke his arm. And all the neighbors came and they were like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. And the farmer's like, maybe. And then the next day, a uh, military leader comes to the village and they say all able-bodied men must come and fight in the war and his son you know because of his broken arm he doesn't get drafted and all the villagers were like oh my god that's so lucky and you already know what the farmer said and this goes on and on and on and on and and the thing is like that's life the more you live life the more the events stop being like good or bad events it all just becomes a collection of events and, and your outlook on life is whether or not you view them as good or bad. And this always happens. When I got kicked out of school, that was like the most devastating thing that ever happened to me up to that point, aside from like, you know, family tragedies and things like that. But now I, I literally can't imagine my life without it. Like I, I, I literally, I don't want to think about a life that I would have where I didn't get kicked out of school. If I were to go back in time, and have the option to change it, I would keep everything exactly the same to the T. It's like, it's like a, it's like Master Uguay said, there is just news, there is no good or bad. People who don't live much of a life, or don't think from a larger perspective, they always want to cast judgments on the things that are happening right now. And they think that like those judgments um, actually matter, and that they'll hold up throughout time. They think that like, we as a society right now, whatever we think right now is correct. And it's, you know, obvious. Uh, even when like literally just a few years ago, people thought that like different parts of the tongue tasted different taste buds and things like literally these people, if they, if you have this thought process, you have not experienced much in life, which is totally fine. You just haven't experienced much in life. If you think that like the thoughts that, that are correct by the society right now that people think is correct right now, like, oh, uh, you know, it's bad, slavery is bad, right? Totally reasonable thought. The rest of society also agrees. But guess what? The rest of society also thinks that owning pets are good. I guarantee you, give it 200 years or so, um, people will look back on us as like terrible, absolutely wrong, obviously wrong people for 
imprisoning, unlawfully imprisoning these animals. So to think that like, to think that like whatever society considers correct right now is, yeah, this is totally what's correct. It, it shows that like you either haven't done much in life or you, you don't think very well. So when someone says something like, oh, Thales, he was so stupid. He thought like the, he thought the core of what made up everything in the universe was water. Oh my God, how stupid can he be? When someone says something like that, like be, be careful, tread lightly. Cause in the future, your, you know, your dumbass offspring who carry the same dumbass genetics as you, they're going to say the same thing about everything that you said, because everyone is wrong about almost everything they will ever say. So don't worry about like, you know, don't worry about even what I'm saying right now. Don't take it so seriously. Don't hold some position about shit that like, like, you know, Palestine or Israel or whatever. Don't hold some position so steadfast, so close to your heart, you know, that's so small minded. Like, I swear, if, if another person made a tier list like this, they would say something like, oh, Thales was wrong. And, you know, he, he thought of the universe um, as being made up of water, even though we had no proof at all. It's just an interesting thought, but nothing more, right? So I'm going to rank him low. Like, motherfucker, people believe we live in a simulation. People believe aliens exist. There is literally no proof of any of this stuff. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe these are also just interesting thoughts and we give them a pass? But, like, your own life experiences influence the way you view the universe. Don't you find it kind of odd how, like, People during the time where water was the most important commodity ever and they were learning how to control it, they would use that to create the analogy to explain something greater. And don't you think it's kind of odd how like nowadays we think it's we think we're so clever, right? Because we came up with the idea that we're maybe inside a computer, right? Did it ever occur to you that no human had ever thought of that idea or had the mental capacity to come up with such a thing? until the idea, until computers were sitting in front of our faces for 50 years? Like, it, people are not so, so genius to come up with these ideas. The ideas are right in front of our face. We're just copying what we see. You know, 150 years ago, before anyone was talking about a simulation, people were talking about how the universe is made up of, like, the essences of, of forces that were all about pressure and they were all about dispersing pressure to like, uh, you know, disperse energy and compressing pressure to create particles that create the universe. And like the real cause and effect of things deep down are like about like compression and all that sort of thing and combustion and all that. Those are those guys who came up with those ideas. Those are like true geniuses, right? They came up with those ideas totally on their own. I mean, it's not like there was an industrial revolution with combustion engines and trains dealing with pipes where, you know, every, like, intelligent person is, like, staring in the face of, like, gauges of air and water pressure on, like, a daily basis, right? No, 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 no. We, we, we're human beings. We're so smart. We're so intelligent. Our views on the universe totally don't just come from what we experience in our lives, you know? So it's, it's foolish. The primary characteristic of an idiot is thinking that they're clever. That's a great quote, and that's a quote that I live by. And in that way, it's also, it, it also makes perfect sense. You look at the people who think they know everything. You look at adults, they, they think they have everything figured out. They pretend like, uh, you know, they have everything under control. They're the ones who people can't give the benefit of the doubt to. You look at kids, people who know nothing, the people who are ignorant, and they're the most innocent in society. They're the ones that everyone gives the chances to. And it's for a reason. I ignorance is actually a virtue in a way. I talked about this in my guide on how to be creative. Ignorance is not a bad thing. Um, and you'd be a fool to think that, like, you know, the theories that you hold to be true right now are any more than just fun thought experiments that people will laugh at in the future. And, and if you want people, to, people in the future to respect your intelligence for coming up with the things that you've came up with in your lifetime, then respect the intelligence of people who came before you. And once again, this is the philosophy of Socrates. Everyone is a fool, but the wise man knows he's a fool. And, and so eventually enough time is going to pass. And guess what? I'm going to be wrong about just as much shit that you're wrong about and that Thales was wrong about, except for one thing. And that's that I'm wrong. That statement right there, 
Or rather, I'm a fool. I'll tell you this much. I'm right about that. When I say that, I'm right. Okay? The fact that I am a fool is something I will say with confidence. Because it's the only thing I know to be true for sure. That's the one thing that I can say that will age better with time. So, yeah. Thales of Miletus was a great philosopher. He was the OG, okay? He, he traveled a lot. He was a really cool dude. And he would probably be really fun to hang out with. And you'd be a real idiot to underestimate him. He's going to go in a tier. Next is Pythagoras. At first, I was surprised to realize how popular he was for a philosopher. But then I realized, like I thought about it, and I would hardly even call him a philosopher. He was, he was more like a religious leader, actually. A religious leader and a mathematician. Um, in fact, he was probably the highest IQ religious leader to ever live. And high IQ is, I mean, it's really only one factor. It's a pretty small factor um, in like this kind of ranking, right? There's plenty of genius IQ people in China and India that aren't really out here changing the world. And that's the thing. Philosophy isn't passive, it's participatory. So just thinking profound thoughts is not enough. You have to institute them into the world. So, and I, okay, I feel like there's something I should address here. Um, many people consider Pythagoras' school to be a cult. And you know what? I can see that. But I have to ask, where's the line between cult member, fan, follower, and student? Like, you can say a cult is religious-based, right? But to even say that is to arbitrate what groups constitute as religious and what don't. And some people think that, like, religious beliefs are only, like, you know, people believing in popular religions like Christianity and Islam and that kind of stuff, right? But if that's the case, then Pythagoras doesn't have a cult because it wasn't religious by their own definition. It was based off of his own, sometimes arbitrary, personal beliefs. And if that's religious belief, if that's what you're going to constitute as that, right? Then all axioms that anyone holds to be true is a religious belief. I think, therefore, I am is a religious belief. So... You could say, okay, never mind, forget the religious thing, because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, cults are dangerous, right? But that's an even more tricky line to walk. Because what is actually truly dangerous? Are any one of us in a position to apply the label of dangerous onto anything, as if everyone else should agree with us? Like, okay, take, take something, COVID, for example, right? You all know about COVID. Everyone has something to say about COVID. So... Some people say that, like, people should stay inside and isolate. And some people say that they should go outside and socialize. And, and, and the thing is, these are opposites, right? And these are on two opposite ends of the spectrum, like, in terms of, like, people. They're divided. Yet both sides of people will consider the other side's solution as dangerous and harmful. And really, they both are. They both are, if you think about it. Going outside and socializing will increase your risk of getting COVID. That's obvious. Um, and it'll also increase your risk of getting sick with other things. And it'll also increase your risk of getting into a car accident or tripping and falling on something or dealing with like the medley of painful experiences that come with social interaction. All of these things, in a way, <clears throat> they hold danger to them. But staying inside, isolating yourself, not getting enough social interaction, not looking at other human faces their entire faces, not allowing nature to take its course. Look at what's happening in China. They're, they're in the middle of like, like a million people are about to die in China because of COVID, because they didn't allow it to spread in the beginning and they didn't allow any sort of uh, immunity to develop in the population. And now they're all incredibly weak to it. And, and, and now at this point, you look at it like most of the people in the developed world will get dozens of vaccines in their lifetimes, especially when just after they're born. So... Instead of strengthening our genetics over time, being one with nature, people have allowed themselves as humans to essentially not evolve and slowly get weaker and weaker as time passes. And as some would say, don't wish for an easy life. Wish for the strength to endure a difficult life. And best believe viruses are not going anywhere. They are so deeply embedded within life on Earth. They might have even been the first organisms to ever come into existence. Like, ever. In fact, for every single living organism on Earth, 
there was at least one virus that attacks it. And I mean every single living organism, every animal, every plant, every bug, every mold, every protist, every bacteria, every single celled organism, no matter how simple it is. In fact, even some viruses have other viruses as hosts. They're, they're a part of life. They're a part of planet Earth at this point. You can't accept the fact that you live on Earth without also accepting the fact that you're going to get sick with viruses. They, they're so deeply embedded in, in the ecosystem of the planet, more, way more than most people realize. We wouldn't even be alive without them. So human beings can go down the path of being stronger and adapting to our environment as it changes, of being one with nature, right? Or we can manipulate our environment and lock nature in a chokehold and make it succumb to our every desire, slowly getting weaker and weaker, you know, as organisms. Every generation having to get more and more vaccines because new and new things keep evolving and we just keep getting weaker and we can't... It's like quicksand, right? Nature has shown the more you try to escape, the harder it is to escape and the faster you're going to sink. And that's the problem that's happening in China right now. And it's basically on the verge of exploding globally in the form of superbugs, which are infections that are genetically immune to antibiotics because people want to feed cows like on complete antibiotic you know, diets. And if people allow themselves to keep getting weaker and weaker, you know, drinking only the most pristine clean water and always washing away the good bacteria on your hands before you eat um, and keeping everything around you sterile and sanitized, eventually a plague is going to come along that's going to start wiping people out the way that everyone thought COVID would, but didn't. And when that day comes, people's immune systems will, will not be prepared. It won't be ready. They won't be strong enough. So even from the perspective of people saying, like, go outside and do, the, do this thing that, like, you know, culturally is considered dangerous, they have just as much justification in what they're saying. It's simply just people on both sides finding patterns. One of them is seeing the longer term, like, the bigger picture here. But, um, and it's only natural that, you know, they're like the older population because they've seen more. Regardless, there's people on both sides looking for patterns in what they see in the world, right? And they're both just trying to, you know, go by what they feel and, and do what's best based on that. But both sides are dangerous. Literally everything is dangerous. It doesn't matter what you do in life. Choosing to do something is dangerous and choosing to not do that thing is also dangerous. Everything has danger to it. Um, for a person to say that like, oh, this thing is dangerous as if not doing that thing is also is, is not dangerous, that's also foolish as well. So to assume that a cult is just, oh, it's, it's dangerous. No, that's not how it works. And also, if you look at the COVID thing, not only are both sides, you know, trying to push for something that is potentially dangerous, and it, not potentially, it is dangerous. Both sides also hinge on beliefs that are at a person's core of their worldview, right? And also another element of cults is that it has a bit of secrecy bro look at this like the whole covid thing not because people want there to be any sort of secrecy but because the complacent masses have allowed social media algorithms to push for such strong group polarization that there might as well be secrecy like th if this isn't a cult if if the two sides of the covid debate are not cults i don't know what is okay i talked about this in one of my socs about how there's literally no difference between a fan base and a cult. Like, there's no, um, I mean, there might be an intuitive difference, but the line is so blurred that, like, cult is, at this point, a word people assign to certain groups and ideologies that they disagree with, personally, that they don't want to exist. But when they agree with it, they'll call it a fan base. And I have no problem with people doing this, you know, having their own opinions and finding their own patterns in life and choosing to agree with some ideas and disagree with other ideas. But to, to assign the label of cult onto something just because you yourself don't like it, expecting that cult label to also drag the negative connotation that the word has onto whatever you're labeling, that it's much more complicated than that, okay? You can't be so simple-minded. You have to be smarter than that in today's world. And honestly, it's really foolish to expect that anybody else would ever be on board with what you're, what you're gonna say 
if that's how you're going to go about like you know expressing your your moral desire for the world and, and reshaping the repainting the world in your own image right regardless I do think most people have an intuitive agreement on what a cult actually is, even if the line gets blurry at, you know, the end points. And I think most people would say that Pythagoras, you know, did have a cult. And to a certain extent, I would agree. Um, I would never try to convince anyone else of that, that he had a cult. Um, it's just, you know, my own personal opinion in my own personal journey. But despite that, Pythagoras is incredibly famous for a good reason. He really does does live up to the hype. Like he's 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 not anything less than what you'd expect, nor anything more. Right? He was a cognitive juggernaut, IQ through the roof. And okay, IQ is is in simple terms is a, is a sort of a rough measurement for a person's aptitude for pattern recognition. Okay, that's really what it is. Um, and that's why the highest IQ people in the world usually end up becoming mathematicians. And Pythagoras was probably better at finding patterns in nature than almost any other philosopher at that time. Maybe all of them. Like all the like I'm talking about the uh, pre-Socratic philosophers right now. And being such a powerful mind and having such a strong following will no doubt like lead your ego to to skyrocket, right? And and because of that, like all of his beliefs. Um, even the ones that he really shouldn't have been so sure of, he he really believed them like as if it was a matter of life and death, right? So like weird like daily routines, like things that, that he may have just thought about because of some pattern that he noticed, but like some innocuous thing, like which direction you're allowed to pee in and stuff like that. Like, okay, his pattern recognition was off the charts and he would find patterns where there probably wasn't any, okay? And he would believe them wholeheartedly. In all instances of the word, he was an extremist. I mean, like, after all, his greatest idea is the idea of the opposites, which is a bit too deep to get into right now. But it's, it's fucking beautiful to think about and to think that, like, the, the things on both sides, like, kind of have a matching nature to them. Um, and, and it goes really deep, and you can really examine your own psyche by doing that by, by looking into it such a unique perspective the problem is it's really extreme and like maybe he might not have come up with all these like great uh ideas if he wasn't so you know if he didn't hold them to be so true and, and he wasn't so extreme but regardless that's what he was and he also a lot of the ideas that he had weren't like super original they were kind of just piggybacking or you know building refining off of like a, a previous idea or innovating even you know but they weren't like a crazy original like even even Thales thought of this idea of the opposites to a certain extent and also like uh Pythagoras had a lot of students who like really expanded the things that he would say um way after Pythagoras's death well okay they weren't really students if Pythagoras wasn't actually alive to, like, teach them at the same time, you know? Um, if you want to call them cult members, that's totally fair. You can call them that. Um, one of his ideas that, you know, is really cool is transmigration of the soul, which is, it's reincarnation. He, and it's not, like, he was not the first person to think about this. But I'm a storyteller, first and foremost. And... I think it's kind of beautiful how even though, you know, a bunch of people like all, almost every culture on earth at the same sort of time had some sort of like reincarnation idea that came from like the greatest minds, even though they weren't like talking to each other about the idea, they all came up with it independently, which is like crazy to me. It means there's some sort of like deep merit to it, at least not in the idea, but in like something to be learned from it. Right. And what re really fascinates me is like, in, in, in every single one of these uh, versions of the idea, right? The goal was not to be reincarnated as something greater, but the goal of reincarnation was to escape the entire reincarnation cycle and return to God or whatever the hell, you know, they thought, each individual culture thought of, right? And it's 
it's crazy to see how like the Egyptians and the Chinese and the Hindus and even like the story of Adam and Eve, right? The pioneering greatest minds of every culture always viewed earth as like a punishment or at least like a place that we can and maybe should escape from, right? And as a storyteller, I think that's like the most fascinating part of, of reincarnation. It, it, it blows my mind that like this same sort of idea was also thought up by the guy who would like preach the essence of music and, and the stars and shapes and nature all, all boiled down to numbers. And now we know that the universe is entirely mathematics at its very core. At least we're pretty sure of it, right? But it's crazy that like he was saying all this stuff back then. And this goes like way beyond conceptualizing atoms, which happened after him. And the thing is, like, I can resonate really deeply with his more like mystical ideas. And and actually, I don't really care so much about like his contributions that he made in math, right? Which he did, he made a lot. And so did his students. They made way more than him too. But that's mainly because like all the experiences I had in school made me really hate math. But don't get it twisted. I actually used to love math. Like naturally, I really like math. Um, I used to want to do complex math for as long as I can remember. And I was damn good at it too. I remember like before I was even in preschool, I was literally running around um, playing with my toy cars. And my brother, who's four years older than me, um, he was with my mom learning multiplication. He must have been like eight or something at the time. And I remember like just in passing, like I was running by the hall, like they were in the room and I was in the hallway, like running back and forth and stuff like that. And I would hear what they're saying in the room, like as I was passing. And just from hearing the questions and the answers, I was able to pick up the pieces and I figured out multiplication on my own without anyone like teaching me how it works. And then like, once I figured it out, I was like so excited. And I showed my mom, like, mom, look what I can, I can do it too. And I, I told her five times five is 25. It took me a while to, to count it, but I did it. And, uh, she was like so happy. And that was one of my favorite, favorite memories ever. Super distinct too. It's really weird how it was so long ago, but it's like super distinct. Probably a lot of that memory is probably made up, but, um, I don't know. I believe that it really happened. Uh, it, even if like 80% of it was made up. But yeah, so like I resonate a lot with like the desire to do math and I have a lot of great memories from it. So, you know, part of me kind of like, I don't know, maybe I'm like a mini Pythagoras, right? Because like people, different people who know me, they either call me like super creative because of my stories or they call me super logical. And once people get to really know me, they realize that I'm not simple enough to be put into one category and really no one is uh, unless they like make themselves as such and they allow themselves to be so simple and, you know, robotic. But like the same sort of like seemingly polar opposite of like creative versus logical that everybody assumes like you can only be one or, or, or the other that like he really excelled in both of them. I do. I d do too. That sentence didn't make any sense, but you know what I mean? So I resonate a lot with Pythagoras and I'd love to learn more about him actually. And also just like Pythagoras, I'm not a musician, but I spent, you know, thousands of hours in the studio with other musicians and I've come up with my own basic music theory, just like how he did. And, and it's not like a, see, I'm no genius. I'm no Pythagoras, right? It's not a mathematical music theory the way he thought of it. Um, it's actually a character driven music theory, like a social music theory on like things people do when making music in the process and their motive and that kind of stuff, um, that will result in more success and things like that. So it's that kind of music theory. Um, but like Pythagoras, he was doing the same thing, but like he was a, he was a true genius. Like he literally invented the concept of the octave because he'd heard different blacksmiths with different size anvils making like different sounds, lower, higher pitch sounds when they hit metal. And he, he might have had perfect pitch actually, um, in which case his intuition on music and math, like, like how they were intertwined, would make a lot more sense, right? But he was literally able to deduce just from hearing hammers striking iron that like 
even though some sounds are higher and some sounds are lower in frequency, they're still the same notes. And how the fuck you figure that out without like music training when you're a child is fucking astonishing. Seriously, some of the philosophers on this list, I'm gonna have to like go through and convince you that like their thoughts are profound because they're kind of like self-evident in the culture, right? But if you want to be blown away, like you want those epiphanies, you know, those mind blows, you know, that feeling of like putting two and two together, you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? The eureka moment. If you want to experience that like a dozen times, right? Consistently, just like read up on Pythagoras' ideas. This dude came to the conclusion that the movement of planets and the stars were driven by math simply because his understanding of music was also driven by math. Which, literally, nobody had even thought of that up until that point. So, yeah, up until this point in history, he was clearly, like, the highest-ranking person in terms of intelligence compared to the rest of society. And yeah, like, okay, we all know more than him now, right? But if you compare us, the, you know, me and you and everybody, compared to the rest of the society we live in, we're all average, Right? Thales was just like a few levels above the elite class of thinkers in society. But during the time of Pythagoras, the greatest thinkers of society were his students. In fact, I couldn't blame you if you think of Thales as just like a really smart guy who had a ton of cool ideas, and Pythagoras is actually the first philosopher. Like, that's a totally reasonable thought to have. He, he it was in a league of his own at that point, and it doesn't make sense to put him anywhere below the top tier. But he was also kind of unhinged. And he would really go unchecked because nobody could really hold a candle to him at the time. And uh, yeah, he would analyze the world a lot, but he didn't really analyze himself all that much. And besides, most of my own philosophy personally comes from stories, not philosophers. And one of the great things that stories have taught me is only a Sith deals in absolutes, and for that, Pythagoras of Samos is going to go mm, B... Uh, I'll put him in B tier. I'll put him at the very, very tippity top of B tier, borderline A tier. And I'm considering A tier, by the way, the, the top tier of this list. Um, S tier is reserved for the people who, like, transcend even other philosophers. Oh yeah, and also like people like Pythagoras and, you know, basically these three people that have been on this list so far, um, as well as like, you know, all the other like truly influential people in the world, like Jesus and Muhammad and their religious leaders and things like that, none of them ever wrote anything down. They all basically had other people write things down for them. And that's partly why I don't write, I just speak. And other people write about me and, and what I say. In Zoomer terms... I stream on Twitch. Everyone else writes on Twitter. And before I continue, I know I've had a lot of prefaces, but I should mention this. If you consider the point of a philosopher to discover the nature of reality, that's no different from a scientist, right? It's just different methods, I guess. Different intuitions. But if you really try to break it down, defining philosophy is kind of impossible. It's one of those things that, like, you know it when you see it. So, again, I'm just going off of intuition here, right? And I'm leaving out a lot of great minds who are also like Pythagoras, like Einstein and Newton, all the mathematicians, right? And scientists as well. I'm leaving out scientists. I'm, I'm leaving out psychologists. Um, because, I mean, some maybe, I, I don't know, I have Jung on the list. A, a psychologist that leans more towards psychology than philosophy. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave them out, right? Because, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, expand my threshold, even though they're very similar. I don't want to include, like, I don't want to include Freud. Because if I do, should I also include Adler and Piaget and people like that? And honestly, in my opinion, the greatest psychological discoveries, or just my opinion, they, they weren't, you know, discovered by the people who were trying to determine what the world should be. But rather just, you know, people trying to observe the world for what it is and just figure out why like Skinner with the rats and Pavlov with the dogs and, and Zimmerman um, or um, Zimbardo? Philip Zimbardo. 
with the Stanford Prison Study. Wait, then who's Zimmerman? Zimmer, I think Zimbardo's right. But where do I know Invader Zim? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm not really including people who are like, you know, more scientist than philosopher. Because if I'm making a tier list on like people who found out deep fundamental truths about reality, it's a different tier list. I'm probably going to put Darwin at S tier then. But like, it's tricky because at a certain point, scientist blends back into philosopher. Like, I can kind of separate them because I've made multiple videos on my channel about how I think like modern scientists like that are alive today for the most part are just fucking stupid. Like, I don't like Bill Nye. I, I love the show, but I think the person Bill Nye is a political puppet. Um, I think Michio Kaku says some interesting stuff, but outside of physics, he talks about stuff that's like way out of his depth. And, and he just repeats himself way too much. He's been repeating himself for like 10 years now. Um, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is unsure of really what he wants to be. And if his goal is to get more kids into science, he shouldn't like, you know, take shit in science so seriously. He should have fun and he should be fun. And he shouldn't poke fun at the people who are fans of Pluto. That's fucked up. So I can, I can compartmentalize like a different form for science and philosophy, right? And I can only do that really right now because of my ignorance, because I don't, I, I haven't dived deep, deep enough on both subjects. But at, at some point, the thought process kind of loops back around to like the Galileos, to the Thomas Kuhns, to the Aristotles and stuff like that, right? So the lines get blurry and it's going to take a real philosopher to argue what a philosopher even is. But I had to stop somewhere. I know I'm missing a lot of people that uh, other people would consider to you know, be on this list and I'm, I'm not going to put them and that's because they don't matter. If your favorite philosopher is, on, is not on this list, then sucks to suck, I guess. Actually, you know what? I'm putting Freud in here. I'm going to put him at the end and just put him like in there. Okay, cool. Okay, hold up. I need water. Let me, I'll be right back. Okay, I always have this one viewer every single time, the same viewer. If you're not a bot and you're an actual real viewer watching this right now, say something in chat. Otherwise, I don't like, I mean, I mean, I'm not complaining. One, one viewer ain't, you know, if I was viewbounding someone, I would give them like at least 10. But so next is Xenophanes or Xenophanes or Xenophanes. I've heard all three, and I think I've heard a few more. Um, yeah, I'm putting this guy in F tier. I don't even want to get into how many things this guy thought of that, like, is considered like his best stuff, but that's um, not really all that intelligent. There isn't, there doesn't seem to be any like controversy around him, I'm assuming. But me personally, like, a lot of his discoveries were just plain and simple the antithesis of deep thinking. Also, if you're going to complain about something in society, like at this level, at this level of, you know, philosophy, at this level of thinker and, and fame and recognition, if you're going to be complaining about something, offer a solution. Otherwise, why are you speaking? And if you want me to go in depth on why I think Xenophanes, Xenophanes or whatever's ideas are literally like anti-observation and deduction, I can, I can get into that in a different stream. Uh, if you want to like... You want to make a video on it with me or whatever? You want to make the next tier list of me? Or just hop on stream? My Discord is linked in the about page on my Twitch, um, on like a panels, and it's also in the description of all my YouTube videos. But yeah, I think, honestly, this guy right here was the start of like a wave of philosophers who like, instead of actually trying to think of anything profound, they just wanted to look smart. And... Like, I'm, I'm not really judging so much on what they got wrong, because, like, everyone got some stuff wrong. But it's like, I'm looking at his name. I, I, I think his name might be where xenophobic came from. I wouldn't be surprised. He had a lot to say about a lot of other different cultures. Um, and, and maybe it's not, right? But if, if it is, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Which brings us to Parmenides of Alea, one of the two main Greek pre-Socratics who... I'm not even gonna, like, I, 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 like, I'm gonna be straight up with you. I don't really understand them completely, even though I've read a bit about them. So this dude, no doubt he was brilliant, right? But, like, he doesn't make it easy. He was really, he was really the first to ever think about, like, fundamental particles that make up everything else. He even theorized, like, that, uh, you know, the state of matter of things is, like, 
determined by the density of these particles. And like the dense particles are colder and more rock-like, and the, the lesser dense particles um, are more like, they're hotter and they're more air-like. And he also came up with like a, a really impressive, like purely logical deduction in poem formats on why the universe exists way before any like, I think therefore I am stuff. And like, yeah, it can be shaved down a little further because it's not, you know, I think therefore I am, which I think is as, as solid as it gets. But actually, maybe back then it was, it was as, because now we have like microscopes and we have like drugs and stuff to assure us that like, we can't be truly sure if this reality is even real. But like, his logic was really good. And it led him to the conclusion that like, matter cannot be created nor destroyed and it's like all purely logical like essentially mathematical truisms that led him to these conclusions and it makes sense like simply by creating a differentiation between existence and non-existence he was able to conclude all these things like that that line of logic led him to conclude that well i don't know if he explicitly said it but like basically everything in the universe is predetermined right Without probabilities, today, nobody would be saying we live in a simulation. Nobody would go around all pretentious, like, actually, time doesn't exist, and saying shit like that for no reason, right? If, uh, if any of these philosophers, except for Socrates, was, like, a candidate for someone who had broke the matrix, this is the guy. So far, at least. There's people who, uh, who are a bit deeper, but so far, this is as, as like, close as it gets to someone who can claim they broke out of the matrix and what that means is up to you but whatever it means to you he did it definitely my one problem or not really a problem but like what i would say to him in a debate is is i would be like parmenides you believe that whatever is is and what doesn't exist doesn't exist and can never come into existence nor even be thought of because it doesn't exist just like how people cannot think of non-existence. They will always think of something that does exist. Thoughts exist, right? Like, like if, if I tell you, don't think of a purple elephant, you're thinking of a purple elephant. You cannot not think of something. Um, and so by trying to think, our thoughts and deductions are operating on the plane of what does exist. So that which does not exist cannot even be imagined. And that that's that's cool and all, but when you use this as like a justification to say it, like the only way we should be thinking about the world is like a purely logical way of thinking, like pure rationality, not on any opinions or beliefs. It's kind of it's kind of contradictory, right? Like if all of our thoughts, regardless of of their rationality, are operating within the realm of what exists, and they're not even capable of thinking about what doesn't exist. Doesn't that mean that all thoughts, regardless of how like fact based or opinionated they are, that they're like that that it's like all deductions on what does exist? Doesn't that mean that like thinking about the world in a speculative way is still totally valid? So why do you insist that people don't speculate? If it's not possible to speculate on what doesn't exist, then why not think about every thought possible, you know? So in that way, you can like truly catalog all that does indeed exist. And, and that's just, that's what I would tell him if I was in a debate with him. And uh, I'm not going to rank him yet, actually, because I'm actually going to put him and Heraclitus in the same tier together next to each other. If you thought that like Parmenides had weird ideas or like had confusing ideas, just wait. So you see what Heraclitus has to say. Wait, did I? Hold up. Did I fuck up the Heraclitus and Zeno pictures? I swear I literally just picked the first picture that was on Google. The first picture that made, I don't know, whatever. They look different enough. Yeah, it looks like they're the same exact statue. Oh, well, whatever. So, okay, one of these, so this is either Zeno or Heraclitus, but whoever it is, pretend this is Heraclitus. So what he said, as far as I can tell, Actually, I, I can't tell. I don't know. I'm kind of scared to even like summarize his ideas because 
I think I'm probably going to contradict myself. Maybe his ideas were contradictory in nature. I don't know. I'd actually love to go back through and like just make a separate stream just exploring like Parmenides and Heraclitus. I haven't actually read a lot about Heraclitus, but I really, really want to. Um, I'll actually do that the next stream. But for the time being, like just know Heraclitus of Ephesus was, I would say he was a doomer on the outside, but actually a chad at heart. And Parmenides of Elia was a tweaker. <laughs> they both go in B tier. So yeah, next stream, I'll attempt to read Parmenides' poem again and somehow try to not lose my mind doing it. Okay, so I, I messed that up. I'm gonna have to fix that in a second. So Zeno was a student of Parmenides and in my opinion, he was quite a bit smarter than him. I knew about the paradox of Zeno for a long ass time and I solved it when I was like 10, but I have the privilege of, you know, being able to watch black hole videos on YouTube. So yeah. And if you're wondering how to solve it, um, if you don't know, like, okay, yeah, it, technically it's not possible to travel over any distance actually that's infinitely divisible um, because there's an uncountably infinite number of steps needed to go anywhere. So you wouldn't ever move anywhere at all um, with any finite amount of steps. But this is a Hilbert Hotel problem. You can exhaust um, like an infinitely divisible distance by assuming an infinitely divisible time. And I, I feel like it's normal to have an epiphany one day that there's a possibility that we live in a universe where like every distance to and from everything is always an irrational number, right? Whether we live in such a universe or not is, is irrelevant. It's still up in the air, actually, um, I think. But this kind of mindset makes things like, a, you know, the, the Banach-Tarski paradox way easier to understand. In fact, it, it actually makes it kind of intuitive. In this way, Zeno is more like a bridge between scientists trying to figure out what universe we live in and logicians trying to figure out like the nature of any kind of universe that can be imagined. Without Zeno, I honestly don't think people like Einstein ever would have developed the theory of relativity. I don't want to go too in depth on him, um, not because he's not interesting, but because he's so interesting that I feel like everyone should go out and explore his ideas by themselves. There, I'm sure there's plenty of videos on YouTube and he's also gonna go in B tier. There's actually two Zenos here. Let me just rename them actually. And this is, I mean, I think this is him. I don't know. I kind of messed up the pictures earlier. I don't know who else is messed up at this point. But contrary to what people might believe, Zeno, as far as I can tell at least, um, is the true inventor of Stoicism. The problem is all of his works are lost to time. Other people wrote about him, so there's a bit that we know. But like everyone else from this long ago, everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. What I find crazy is that even though he had like a dualist and monoist view at the same time, he had the foresight to see through the Cartesian idea that like the spiritual world is separate from the physical world. And he did it like, what, 2000 years before him? I think when people think about Zeno, um, the first thing they think of is Zeno from Dragon Ball. And then the second thing they, th second thing they think of is Parmenides zero here, not zero. Zeno here with the uh, Zeno of Elia, and then the third one they think of is Zeno of Sidium. Honestly, though, this guy right here was an absolute genius. And if you dive into his ideas more than anyone else out there, like me, me personally, when I dove in, more than almost anyone on this list, like my mind was running. Like, oh, I wonder what he would have thought of this. I wonder what his answer to the trolley problem would be. I wonder. What would happen if he spoke to this person or read up about this person or he met, you know, this group of people or he met the Japanese or he met the, you know, they explained the Ikigai to him. Or what if he, you know, traveled south of Egypt and they explained Ubuntu to him or he went to India and, you know, that sort of thing, right? And, and your mind runs on like what he would think of this and this and this and this. And people often imagine these kinds of thinkers to be like cold and calculated, right? But Zeno was Zeno of Sidium was 
the first and really the only philosopher that I find that is warm and calculated. Like, his true writings didn't survive, so we'll never know just how great he actually was. But, at least from what all the other accounts say about what he would preach, he was damn good. And um, he wasn't exceptional, but he was smart. And he was much smarter than Descartes, um, that's for sure. Super underrated, but despite that, I personally don't imagine him as like a true genius. And he read a lot, and... Um, based his philosophy off of what Socrates said. So, like, you know, he, he had a pretty unshakable foundation. And he studied with, like, a star-studded cast of great thinkers around him. Um, and also, Stoicism is my favorite philosophy right now. I think it's, like, probably one of the most important philosophies to learn in the 21st century. Maybe the most important. And I'm forever grateful to him for inventing it and also creating the group that called themselves the Stoics. But... I'm not going to speculate here. Realistically, he was probably just like a really hardcore dude. And um, I, I think he's actually pretty mediocre for a philosopher. Tough decision. But if I look at the people on this list, I'm, I'm going to put him C tier. So next is Empedocles. This guy right here has a huge list of achievements under his belt. So many things in so many different fields. I literally don't even remember off the top of my head because there's so much, like stuff in literature and psychology and medicine and fashion and politics and biology and physics and like everything, dude. He was he, so much stuff um, and he was damn good at everything he did. But, you know, he also would like consider himself like an actual god and a bunch of people believed him somehow. Um, not even metaphorically, like they actually worshipped him. But honestly, that's like, you know, pretty standard for philosophers from this time at this level, you know? And I actually don't even know that much about him. He's an example of one of these guys that like uh, make it clear that what you read in history is is just is just a story. It's just his story. You got to take it with a grain of salt. What I know about him is that apparently he died at around 60, according to Aristotle. But according to a lot of other accounts, he lived into his hundreds um, and he died by jumping into a volcano and then ascending to heaven from the inside of the volcano. We, like his body ascended upward into heaven, um, which, you know, there were supposedly witness accounts of. So, yeah, fascinating guy um, for sure and lots to dig into, but... Personally, I, I don't actually see anything crazy that he really, like, contributed, you know? Earth, fire, water, air. Okay, cool. Everyone was, like, hard at work figuring out the elements that make up the universe. It's only a matter of time before someone came to that conclusion. Um, if he didn't, someone else would have. So, a league above, you know, the people around him, in, in the population around him, for sure. But, like, come on. We're dealing with ancient Greek philosophers. So... He ain't nothing special. Pretty much all the Greek philosophers are really going to be near the top of the list. Except for this guy. I'm, I'm putting him C tier. Next is Democritus. My guy, man. In my opinion, probably the worst offender of the whole, like, um, you know, brilliant works being lost to time. Like, and there's a, there's a case to be made that he may have been the smartest pre-Socratic philosopher ever. He might have been even above a... a Pythagoras, possibly. And it sucks because, like, really barely anybody knows who he even is. And that's because accounts say that he apparently wrote over 60 books um, on, like, all different raging, ranging topics. But guess what? Not a single sentence from a single one of his books have survived. But, you know, despite that, and despite the fact that they call him the laughing philosopher, this dude is no joke. It was, a, it was a long journey to get to this position in, in pre-Socratic philosophy and in this point in history, right? And, and, and people have been like, you know, um, thinking about this kind of thing, like the Arche, for quite some time now. But this guy, Democritus, he's the guy who came up with the theory of atoms. 
Like everyone always talks about like, oh, Adams, ancient Greeks came up with Adams and all this stuff. This is the guy. His whole idea was there's atoms and there's a void and that's all that exists in the universe. But honestly, I think this is speculation, right? But his idea of atoms was probably nothing compared to what was in those books. I haven't actually heard that much from his ideas um, because there isn't actually that much to go around. But from what I have heard, he's one of the extremely rare minds who have like extremely powerful processors but while also having super high-end SSDs. Usually a philosopher can either, you know, think really heavy thoughts or they have a lot of knowledge. And it's rare to find someone who has both. And it's even rarer when they can actually put it to good use. It's just a shame that uh, his works are gone. I would say that he's underrated, but he's actually kind of not. Like he's, everyone who knows him considers him one of the best. He's just unknown. What I would do to go back in time and read those books. I don't even want to say any of his ideas other than Adams. Go look them up for yourself. As far as I can tell, all anyone really cares about with Democritus nowadays is his atomic theory. But I think his views on how to live life and his perspective on how to compartmentalize like friends versus sexual partners and all that stuff is like way more fascinating. In a way, if Plato is Aristotle's father, then Democritus is like Aristotle's prodigal brother or cousin or whatever, who gets none the recognition and lives a way more humble existence as a result. So I'm going to put him in A tier. Just, you know, personally. Lucippus. Um, okay, yeah, he's, he's, I have the void here. I didn't think I was actually going to use the void in this tier list that I made. I mean, I guess I should explain if you don't know. Lucippus is best buds with Democritus. He was actually Democritus's teacher. The problem is, such few records of him actually exist. And they did their dedu deductions together. Um, it's impossible to know which ideas are actually from Lucippus and which ones are from Democritus. Some people believe like that he actually didn't even exist, but I think he did. It's, it's still debated, but I think he did. I think most people think he did. But yeah, it's like, I would say it's like Batman, like Democritus is like Batman and Lucippus is like Alfred or Lucippus is Lucius Fox. So I'm just going to attribute all their ideas to Democritus and pretend that Lucippus never existed. If he did though, chances are it was actually him that came up with the atomic theory first, which to me isn't that big of a deal, but to everyone else, it's pretty serious. I mean, like, this was already like hundreds of years after people had been trying to conceptualize the RK. So, and their atomic theory was also really weird. Um, to say that, like, it's the defining moment where atoms were truly conceptualized is an arbitrary moment in history at best to pick it. Next is the main man himself. To say this guy is influential is a disservice. Half the philosophers on the entire list would consider Plato the GOAT, and just about everyone on this list would uh, put him in their top three. Despite this, he's actually seen by some of the people that I talked to to be kind of overrated. And it's also that he hated Democritus and his ideas, and he was actively, actively trying to burn Democritus' remaining books. But there's also some accounts that he never did that and that it was just a thought and he was talked out of it. Personally, I don't think Plato would ever do that kind of thing. And I remember like, look, we're not even sure if the guy who invented atomic theory was even real. So you have to take all these stories with a grain of salt and you have to kind of Occam's razor your way into conclusions. And, and these things are up in the air. You can have your own interpretations and look at it your own way and, and nobody would really call you wrong for thinking about these things like this. I personally don't think he's overrated at all. I think even though people consider him the greatest, I think he's still underrated. I always, you know, understood the concept of Plato's allegory of the cave, but literally only like a month ago, I had one of those like epiphanies, right? One of those like, oh, I get it now moment, like it clicked, right? Where Plato said that like, if people in the cave had the option 
to kill the person who re- who reached the truth and tried to educate them about it, if they had the option to do so, they would kill him. And I see it now. I totally see it. It's a brand new understanding, so I can't really explain it very well, but I see it in my own life and with the people around me. His theory of forms is also stunning. It's beautiful. And it strikes at the heart of like all these other you know, things the like the ship of Theseus and all this stuff in like quantum mechanics and astrophysics. And I feel like this is like the, the idea of forms plus our imperfections is literally what makes us human. Like it's what separates us from the robots, right? And I've talked about this a bunch. Like if you want to know, if you want to understand NPCs better, right? And you want to have a deeper appreciation for the matrix and you want to know where humanity is headed, Look no further than Plato's writings over 2,000 years ago. He also wrote a lot about Socrates. And, um, you know, like I said, Socrates never wrote anything down. Plato would hear him speak and then write for him. Uh, So he was a brilliant writer and a brilliant philosopher. And he really did dedicate everything he had into expanding the consciousness of others. The world would not be a tenth of what it is today without Plato and all the people who were influenced by him. And and considering the fact that, like, he literally could have just made up Socrates and all of his teachings literally only exist because Plato decided to write them down, he is probably, I would say, the most influential philosopher of all time. Because it wasn't just Socrates' philosophy that exists because of Plato's. Plato's philosophy is also nothing to play around with. He would be in S tier if Socrates didn't exist, but I'm going to put him in A bordering on S, right on the edge. I'm going to put him above these two as well. So next is Aristotle. I mean, do I even really need to say anything? Like, successor to Plato, rival to Democritus, kind of. He literally, he wrote so many ideas that he wrote more ideas about most other philosophers' ideas than they wrote themselves. And, And it's like, his his influence is literally he wasn't alive during the turning point in human thought he is that turning point he's responsible for it he is the culmination of all of the wisdom of the greatest era of philosophy in human history it's pretty damn obvious a tier for aristotle the only reason i can even make this tier list to begin with is because of all the records that he kept about everyone else's ideas and all the people that were around him they also kept records too, all of his students and stuff. For all these other great philosophers, I think like, man, I wonder what stories they told about each other, to each other and stuff like that, that were lost the time, right? Because they didn't write anything down. But Aristotle had the foresight to know that people like me are going to be talking about this kind of thing thousands of years later. He is the first breath of fresh air in a series of philosophers who have this like really frustrating habit of thinking that all their teachings are going to live forever if they just speak them and never write them down. So that's the thing about the three greats right here, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Socrates, he was the smartest out of the bunch, but he wrote nothing down. Plato was almost as smart and he wrote some stuff down. Aristotle was almost as smart as Plato, but he wrote hella down. And that's not to say that Aristotle isn't smart. I mean, like you already know that. You already know everything about Aristotle. There's no point in me even saying this. And if you don't, like, go back and read what Aristotle wrote. It'll sound like, it'll sound like a modern day professor, the way he, he he was such a good communicator. You have to be even smarter to communicate that well. Like, Parmenides wrote using poems. Um, Plato wrote you in beautiful stories. Uh, Zeno wrote using riddles. And Heraclitus, oh, Heraclitus wrote using fucking moon runes, but Aristotle, Aristotle wrote in plain English. I mean, Greek, uh, he was Greek. They're all Greek. I've only talked about Greek so far, but yeah, English translation, you can teach it to anyone. I think you, people might learn some of it in school, maybe depending on where they go, but you can literally teach it to like elementary school kids. He was an excellent philosopher but he was the best teacher, maybe ever. And that's that's like what it really means to like live up to someone's potential because boy, did he teach. 
It takes, it takes a genius mind. I think it takes a genius mind to come up with a truly profound thought. But it takes an even more genius mind to understand it well enough to explain it to the non-geniuses like the rest of us. To be totally real, Aristotle doesn't have like a singular successor. We're all successors of Aristotle. We're all descendants of a student of a student of a student of Aristotle. And just like Plato, he's borderline S tier, but unfortunately for him, Socrates exists. Next is Diogenes. This is my favorite philosopher of all time. Let me tell you, let me actually tell you a little story. I meant to tell stories about everyone, but I'll, I guess I'll start here. So one day, Diogenes, who is an unwashed, penniless hobo, was just sitting outside in his barrel that he lived in, um, doing really nothing at all, just soaking up the sun, I guess, and just existing peacefully. And someone shows up to pay him a visit. It's Alexander. Yeah, the, the Alexander you're thinking of in your head, that one, the great one. The guy who could literally have whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, with whoever he wants. At that level of power, the world just becomes your own personal sandbox. There isn't a single person who doesn't bow before you and worship you. And because of that, it must have been such a relief that Alexander finally met someone who wouldn't bow before him. So he goes to Diogenes and he says, Hey, my people told me about your philosophies and how you don't care about material possessions and how you're satisfied with what you have and all that jazz. And I'm a big fan and I really admire your way of thinking. And look, I'm basically like a trillionaire by today's standards. So, you know, if there's anything that you want, anything I can do for you, just let me know. And Diogenes replies, quick as a fiddle or however the saying goes. Yeah, actually, you can do something for me. Move over. You're blocking my sunlight. And as you can imagine, Alexander was so shocked to finally find someone who sees him as just another human being. But Alexander is no slouch. He had already heard about this guy's attitude on life. He knew there weren't any tricks or games. Diogenes genuinely wanted Alexander to move out of the way and nothing else. And so humbled, he replies, if I was not Alexander... I would want to be Diogenes. And Diogenes replies, if I was not Diogenes, I would also want to be Diogenes. And I mean, I said Alexander was no slouch, but I never said he was lightning. To be fair, there probably wasn't a mind alive at the time who could have kept with Diogenes. Diogenes is the living embodiment of the phrase, he is the living embodiment of blank. He is the definition of being the change you want to see in the world. And this way of thinking is basically like almost universal among like all the great philosophers, right? Philosophy isn't passive, it's participatory. Plato's allegory of the cave literally hinges on the idea that like certain truths, right? Important truths, they can't simply be learned or taught by someone explained or a book or whatever. They have to be experienced. And a person's philosophy isn't just tied to their own personal life journey. It is their own personal life journey. And once again, it was really Socrates who was the first guy to be saying this kind of stuff. Plato's allegory of the cave is literally just uh, Plato's simplified explanation on why Socrates was sentenced to death by his own government, just for telling the truth. These ideas all actually stem from Socrates. Philosophy isn't just your thoughts, it's your entire being. It's your decisions and your impact on the world and the way you interact with others. A philosopher who spends all of his time just reading philosophy books is nothing. Be the change you want to see in the world. Manifest your philosophy on, on the path to pursue truth. Live the truth that you want the world to see. And that's really the purpose for people like this. It's, it's you know, these artists, they're not here to play it safe. The masses are going to sit around and be followers and play it safe and do whatever's considered socially acceptable. But, you know, these people are here to say a bunch of shit and do a bunch of shit, and most of it will be wrong. But occasionally, one of them might stumble across saying something or doing something absolutely necessary in the process. And the problem is that the world isn't really ready for these kinds of necessary truths. I mean, they're really not ready no matter what period you say them in. And, and this was also, this was actually a philosophy, I mean, it started with Socrates, but it was mainly created by Plato, because he saw how, like, the ultimate truth-sayer, Socrates, was treated by everyone and subsequently killed. 
it's kind of funny how like so many people hate Plato nowadays when like the core of what he preached was open mindedness. I swear it's probably those same people who want like people banned on social media like Andrew Tate. They never want Andrew Tate's words to see the light of day, right? But unlike most philosophers who, you know, preached one thing and then practiced it somewhat, Diogenes right here, this guy was the opposite of all talk. This man is the Giga Chad of all Giga Chads. He was such a Giga Chad, he literally transcends it. He is he is history's mad lad. That's who he is. Like there was this one time after he moved to a new city that uh, like they had gotten word. The whole city had gotten word from people that they were about to be attacked by some army or some nation or whatever. So everyone, you know, starts panicking and running around aimlessly, you know, basically like someone just yelled fire in a movie theater, right? So Diogenes, he grabbed his barrel that he lived in started rolling it up a hill and then letting it roll back down. And then he rolled it up a hill again and then let it roll back down. And he just kept on doing that. And someone came and asked him, like, what was he doing? And he just responded, I'm just trying to be as useful as everyone else here. <laughs> like, man, you could not bring this man down. Like, how do you, how do you kick the dirts below the ground? You know, it doesn't matter what you do to this guy. He is truly and utterly free. It, it, like, it's, it's like trying to break something that's already been broken and accepts the fact that it's been broken and is happy regardless. Like that, that's what it means to be free. Even when he was a slave, actually, um, he was still free. And that, yeah, by the way, he got sold into slavery, if you didn't know. And you guessed it, it didn't even bother him. The only time he was ever annoyed was uh, when the bidding to buy him started at a low amount. So he basically went up on like the stage and pretty much did like a a very short comedy sketch about why it's like not fair that he's so cheap and they should all pay more for him and they should start the bidding at a higher amount. And apparently he was so good as usual that nobody could deny it. And because of that, the guy who bought him was actually like a, the, the head of like a wealthy family household. And instead of using him as a slave, he actually just made him the tutor of a group of kids. Dude, that's, that's insane. To be sold as a slave and then end up at a teacher just because you made people laugh. Like that's, that's what it means to be unbreakable and free. And I like, I read about Diogenes and I think to myself, like, I can't define freedom. It gets complicated, right? There, I mean, all these philosophies get complicated. I can't define freedom, but I know it when I see it. And this, what this guy had, this is freedom. And what I have today, like me, I think about what I have. Dude, I'm a slave. It reminds me of like, a, you know, when people are trying to like press someone, they're trying to like square up with them and the other guy like just pulls their pants down and uh, like the person who was trying to instigate the fight, like he doesn't want to fight anymore. If you were to say to, to Diogenes, like, oh, I have freedom and you don't Diogenes, he would probably like, he probably wouldn't even say anything. He would probably just start like publicly masturbating and then that would be the end of the arguments. He like through and through, I feel I need to say it again. He was truly free beyond anyone else around him. He didn't just break out of the matrix. He broke out, found the person who made the matrix and fucked their mom. There was also another incident um, where with Alexander and Diogenes, uh, this is considered by some people to be the same incident, uh, but like, you know, that's neither here nor there. Basically Diogenes was digging through a pile of bones on the ground and Alexander asked him what he was doing. And Diogenes replied, I'm trying to find the bones of your father, but I can't tell them apart from the bones of a slave. And the crazy part about like the way Diogenes talks is like, if you don't know Diogenes' philosophy, it sounds like he's saying one thing, but if you do know it, it sounds like he's saying something else with like everything he says. And I think he was like aware of that. So he was doing all this like lightning speed, but he was also making like a double meaning to it. Because like, if, you, if you're not a familiar, you might just think like, oh, it sounds like he's criticizing people for creating a distinction between like the rich and the poor or whatever, right? Or like the royalty and the peasants. But knowing what I know now, there's like a second meaning. And I think what Diogenes was really trying to say was that he can't tell the bones apart, not to imply that like there's no difference between a slave and a king, like they'll both meet the same fate in the end. I think he was trying to imply that his father was the slave. Like, he was a slave to the crown. And you know what? I'm not even going to tell you about his philosophy. I'm not even going to walk you through it. 
you're probably wondering like what like this kind of a guy would come up with as their philosophy right it's called cynicism if you want to look into it which you should and it's very different from the cynicism that you probably know that you probably see today it's a different it's philosophical cynicism it's a different thing um you just gonna have to figure it out for yourself because i i kind of i can't do it justice but go in and realize that like he isn't just a self-aware hobo he is a true genius he could have been a pythagoras he could have been a zeno but he chose not to and i i can go on i can go on like this with stories and stories and stories about how he literally just did not care like he is he is the origin of the literally me character and like i always knew he was great right but the moment i found out that he would go into plato's classrooms j not even to learn but just to like eat food during class and like distract the students and like constantly disrupt the class and dispute everything that plato said that's when i knew like okay this is my kind of philosopher and the thing is every philosopher like has their cool stories like i'm explaining right now i know all of Diogenes' stories because he resonates with me and I looked into it. But don't think that he's the only one that has interesting stories like this just because I'm saying it. I'm biased. So if you if any of their philosophies resonate with you, that's how you can go and find your favorite, right? Because for most people, they'd hear these stories and they might consider him their favorite, but that's because they haven't heard the stories of everyone else. And also I think like his philosophy was really I think most people would look at it as like a terrible way to go about living life. But for, for me, as I get older, I, I'm able to see the beauty in it. But that's because I don't also, I also don't get offended easily. And everyone nowadays is so like soft and sensitive. They see the worst in everything. Like if someone tries to make a funny joke, they'll like, they'll lie to themselves and say that they shouldn't laugh at that. They'll be like, man, that's, that's not funny. You shouldn't laugh at it. They'll stop themselves from laughing. They're, they're, they're literally, think about it. Think about it. They're literally bringing themselves to, to stop being who they are deep down and prevent themselves from being a genuine, honest man by stopping themselves from laughing at something that they know is funny. Like, you, you really think about it, right? A lot of people w might, you know, just hear, like, bits and pieces about Diogenes and think that, like, oh, this is going to be my favorite philosopher. But really, don't steal my shit, bro. Don't jack my fucking vibe. Go find your own one because chances are the majority of people would not consider him their favorite. Like, especially people who get offended at stuff. If you take Alexander in the scenario, right? Alexander could have interpreted what Diogenes said in one of two ways. He could have had his fragile little ego hurt when Diogenes told him to move aside. But no, he actually felt a sense of catharsis. And he talked about this because unlike most of these like sensitive ass snowflakes today, Alexander had actually been through some shit. He'd actually done things with his life. And also because like the, the whole situation transpired because, you know, he had like kind of waged war on like everyone on the planet and um like even during peacetime he would literally like kill hella people he like killed his own family members just so he can grab power so this was around the time where alexander was starting to come to terms with the fact that like if hell existed he's going straight there so um he kind of wanted to like in one sort of final act of goodness i guess you know he wanted to give away his riches and glory to people who like he thought truly deserved it. So when he offered Diogenes a favor, that he was like on a mission, like he fully intended to make several people, including this one man, like one of the richest people to ever live. But, you know, when Diogenes seemingly didn't care at all and was kind of disrespectful, he didn't take it in a way like where he was offended. He was actually really happy about it. Like, because at that point, Diogenes truly did live up to the hype. And also you can judge a person's intentions by this kind of thing because alexander was like he lived in paranoia that like someone would try to kill him at any moment right some assassin would come after him and at his level doing what he was doing that kind of paranoia is justified that's just like normal precaution so he actually was like really happy when he was disrespected utterly disrespected by diogenes and uh man i wish i could have seen his face in that whole interaction the king of the world who can have anything and everything is stuck looking over his shoulder and the man who has nothing is the one who has the true freedom so there's clearly very clearly something out there that money can't buy and that day alexander showed that uh even though he could give everything 
he still couldn't give Diogenes what he really wanted, which was the sunlight. Even the great Alexander wasn't capable of that. Which, that's crazy. That Alexander came with the intention of giving everything to Diogenes, but instead, Diogenes gave something to Alexander. And, and also, like, when he basically implied that his father was a slave, like, a normie today would be offended at that kind of thing. But for Alexander to see that, like, it, it must have, like, there's, there's a message in there that, like, maybe, you know, no matter how the chess game goes, all the pieces go back into the same box at the end. Right, and he could have interpreted that kind of thing as like, you know, it might mean that like in the end, your decisions on the on this earth don't actually like matter all that much in the grand scheme of things, right? And that kind of message would like alleviate that that would like lift a huge weight off of his shoulders. So like, there's a way to be offended and disrespected at the things that Diogenes would say, but there's also a way to take it in a positive way. So people who get offended at everything and who see the worst in everything. Diogenes will not be their favorite philosopher if they actually like look into it like you know remember that, that one meme of that one chick like Brie Larson who was like what is that like a personal attack or something Diogenes if Diogenes was there and she asked that this giga chat would have been like yes it is a personal attack and uh you know nowadays you get canceled for that kind of thing but basically like I think essentially I would say like the majority of people from LA would hate Diogenes, like genuinely hate him if they knew him in person. And I, I think that's also because like people like that generally hate like the whole, um, even though they may not say it, like their actions show that they, they hate people who like speak their mind freely, you know, who value authenticity more than not offending people. And who also who don't see any value in material possessions because people from LA won't be able to relate to that. So if he was alive today, he would definitely be banned off social media. But he was like a true genius and, and you could see from his like philosophy and the way that he would talk and the way that he would do things you can kind of put yourself in that mind state and realize like oh shit this guy is this guy's actually right like he he stands tall even in the worst situations like if you take um someone like andrew tate you know andrew tate was trying to like change everyone and change the world but diogenes he found a way to live and love the world regardless of whatever it was and he actually did, by the way, get banished from the city he lived in at one point. It's kind of similar to how someone gets banned on Twitter today, but like much more serious. Um, and actually, when he got banished, uh, like someone came up to him and they were like, why would you do this stuff if they knew that uh, they would punish you and make you leave your city? And Diogenes responds like, that's fine by me. I'm punishing them by forcing them to stay in the city. I swear, dude, nobody is as quick as Diogenes. And I feel like you look at the difference between people who are like considered great thinkers today, right? Like if Andrew Tate wanted to go out with a bang, he should have said something like, hey guys, I'm living an honest life. I'm telling you guys, I'm bringing you guys nuggets of truth. And I'm no longer on this platform because they kicked me off. So if you really think about it, the real punishment, the real way they brainwash you is by allowing you to stay on the platform. So, you know, because real people don't live in a fake world. They escape from the matrix and this is a fake world. So, if anything, they've given me a gift. And that would have been so badass if Andrew Tate said something like that. But he never would. He's not intelligent enough to come up with a strategy like that. But, I mean, even if you're in the mindset of Diogenes, you could come up with a strategy like that. And also the whole idea of, like, Diogenes himself is literally proof that you don't need to be rich to break out the Matrix. That's just, that's another lie told to you by the Matrix. And it's just, I don't know, like, he's just my favorite. It's so funny how his thoughts, like, despite the fact that he barely puts any care or effort into them, they just, like, trump everyone else's and make even, like, the greatest minds look stupid in comparison. Oh, and also, I find it interesting how he would literally criticize every other philosopher and all their philosophies, except for one. And uh, I don't think I need to tell you, but uh, I think you already know who that is. And I guess, I guess it makes sense because like, like criticizing someone who calls themselves a fool, you're either, you're either proving them right, in which case you're a fool for even like adding anything onto it because they already said they're a fool, or you're proving them wrong and making them not a fool. So there's really nothing you could say to that. But you know, compared to Socrates, 
Plato was kind of a he was kind of a know it all actually, and like Diogenes really got a kick out of like proving everyone wrong, especially when people were like really well respected like Plato. Actually, let me show you a little excerpt from this uh, Salmonella video. Conventional desires in favor of a simple, moderate lifestyle. But while many philosophers keep it simple, there's nothing wrong with a simple and humble life. Down to earth guy out there. Literally, he lived on the ground, in a big tub in the marketplace where he'd beg for a living. For a while, his only possession was a wooden bowl, until one day he saw a child drinking out of his hands, and he was like, Pfft, what do I need this shit for? When someone today wants to go against society, they dye their hair blue and make a blog post about how there aren't any obese women of color in Super Smash Bros. On the other hand, when Diogenes has something to say, he just jerks off in public. Takes a dump in the amphitheater, <laughs> pisses on passerby, whatever. The way he saw it, he really did all this, by the way. He really did all this. Forming much needed bodily functions while also protesting the superficiality of the civilization around him. Keep in mind, though he was an unwashed, publicly defecating homeless man, that's not all he was. His wit was easily on par with his philosophical contemporaries, and his lack of inhibition meant that everyone knew it. For example, here's an often pondered question of the day. How do you define a human in the simplest of terms possible? Plato decided to tackle this question, and he came up with featherless biped. And in the ancient Greek world, they didn't have any kangaroos or gibbons or nothing, so people were the only things around that both walked on two legs and didn't have feathers. Plato thought he was real clever with that one. Diogenes, on the other hand, he wasn't having any of it. So he said, all right, you pompous prick, I'll give you a featherless biped. <laughs> so in reality, we do not learn. And what we call learning is only a process of recollection. Oh god damn it, not you again. What's up fuckers? Hey, check out this person I found. Isn't it such a human? Look at him, wow. What a guy. Anyway, love to stay in chat, but I saw some trash outside that looked delicious. Smell you later, deliberator. <sighs> yes, my student. Yeah, uh, what the fuck? Here's another anecdote. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, you can watch the rest of the video. It's on Sam O'Neill's channel. And keep in mind the visual here, okay? Plato is literally at this point, like probably the most respected person in like the entire nation. Like not only was he like considered the greatest philosopher, he was literally world wrestling champion of like, you know, the world at that point, which was not really all that much. But but even still, he was he was built like a Greek god. Meanwhile, Diogenes was just like some random like smelly homeless dude who was basically skin and bones. Oh yeah, and by the way, after that whole like you know, behold Plato's man, uh, episode, Plato literally changes definition of man, and and that's why Plato didn't make it to S tier because only if he felt like it, you know, only only on the winter solstice, Diogenes you know would use one percent of his power to logically dismantle Plato's ideas completely effortlessly. He wouldn't get up out of his barrel that he lived in for like anything unless it was to point out how foolish some like genius thought actually was that everyone loved and then he just dismantles it in two seconds. And there's actually this meme right here that I think describes it pretty well. So this is the meme, it's like, cars have windows and can move. Houses have windows and cannot move. So it's not the it's not the windows that make the car go, it's something else entirely. And this is like normal standard logical deduction. And this is like this is what ancient Greek philosophy is like. And this is the thing, like if you, you were to like go to Plato's Academy and they were talking about this, like if, if it existed today, right? All the philosophers would be in there like, Oh yes, excellent deduction, my good sir, and they'd be sucking each other's dicks, right? And then Diogenes out of nowhere would like crash into the gay wedding driving a mobile home that he just stole just to like show him up and be like behold Plato's immovable home only to like you know because he stole it he can't keep it he just like leaves and goes right back to sitting in the sun and being at peace so that's that's basically Diogenes's personality so it only makes sense that he would you know just like try to dismantle everything that Plato said just like as a joke basically just because he got a kick out of it I don't think anyone would consider Plato and Diogenes to have like a rivalry. It wasn't much of like a battle, you know? Diogenes would just crush him. He went undefeated against Plato. But but even though I don't think he would have... I think he actually... If he met Socrates, if Diogenes met Socrates, I think they probably would have been best friends. I mean, after all, Diogenes didn't like people who weren't humble. 
And so that was his whole... And he would also walk around with a lit lantern in broad daylight. I think this is actually what the, this picture is from, at where somebody asked him, like, hey, why are you walking around with like a lit lantern in broad daylight? And Diogenes replied, he's like, I'm desperately searching for an honest, genuine man. So yeah, I, I think Diogenes would have actually liked Socrates. And also I think Socrates would find a lot of enjoyment in being around Diogenes, lots of, you know, comedic material. Like for example, there was this one time where Diogenes saw, uh, you know, an archer practicing shooting arrows, but he was doing really badly and missing the target a lot. So Diogenes goes and stands directly in front of the target and says, this seems to be the safest spot. So uh, yeah, Socrates may actually find him funny enough to tolerate all his bullshit. So yeah, Diogenes of Sinope, the based philosopher, Join Socrates right up here in S tier. And that's pretty much all for S tier, actually. We might as well consider it locked down at this point. I'm actually going to lock all of these guys in here. Oh, yeah, and just like the greats who I mentioned earlier, Diogenes also never wrote anything down. And look, I'm not saying I'm one of the greats, but I try to be. There's a reason. I mean, why else would I put them up there, right? A man can dream. I can dream. I don't know. If I was alive, in ancient Greece, I'd like to think that me, Socrates, and Diogenes would all be publicly executed together for corrupting the youth or whatever, right? All three of us executed at the same time. That would be so cool. Where like, you know, Socrates would say something like, he'd be like, oh, sewing a man's mouth shut doesn't prove him a liar. It only proves that others are scared of what he might say. And then he gets his head chopped off. And then Diogenes would say something like, yeah, uh, hopefully society learns from this incident and from our deaths and they don't create technology and applications and forums that allow people to consume media fed to them by algorithms that censor ideas that the people running it disagree with and promote ideas that people running it agree with based on their own political biases and then his head gets chopped off. And then the guy comes to me who's chopping the heads off and I go like, the one piece and then my head gets chopped off i don't know it's just a fantasy i have i can dream okay so next is epicurus and i guess if you know we take the same line of thinking as the whole like you know windows don't make a car move because homes also have windows and they don't move that sort of bulletproof logic is what epicurus used to basically say sex doesn't make people happy look at all these unhappy people banging out all the time and so it's like a really, it's a reasonable conclusion to make, right? And this guy right here, Epicurus, he, he was a real one. Honestly, he was a real one. He was another one of these guys who really practiced what he preached. Um, and he lived on very little. And uh, he really got down to the heart of the matter when he was talking. And he was like a much more, I would say he's a much more pragmatic version of Diogenes, right? He didn't piss so many people off. And he actually like taught people. He had a school, I believe. And like he... He would explain his thought process, like he would use logical deduction to propose a reasonable pathway towards happiness. And the thing is, like, none of his ideas are, like, particularly, like, brilliant. I don't think, I, I don't even think he was, like, a true genius or whatever. However, I think he has one, he's one of the more important philosophers to read in the 21st century. It all depends on what you want out of life, though. Like, do you want to be, do you want to be great or do you want to be good? Because those are not the same thing. Do you want to be remembered or do you want to be happy? And look, I'm not one to judge. Um, I mean, actually I am like, but, but who cares, right? Everyone has their own uh, desires and proclivities on what they tend to in their life, right? And if you're, if you're struggling and you're going through it and you're just overall unhappy and you want to remove that, that unhappiness from your life, I would say read up on Epicurus. He, he, he wasn't like anything like crazy special, but his teachings are like really, really relevant right now, actually. I think they have been back then as well, and they still are, and they're going to continue to be. If you, you can look at Diogenes and get the full picture, like that, eat one grape for pleasure, eat two grapes for intoxication, eat three grapes for disgust. But the thing is, Diogenes never like spelled out his philosophies. He would just kind of do things and you know, expect that people would pick up on it or not even expect that people would pick up on it. He would just live his philosophy. So unless you really dive deep, he's, he's kind of confusing sometimes. And also he might be a bit much to stomach for some people because he like really did like he, he was, he was, he was obscene by today's standards. 
So if you want like a clear cut, like uh, spoken and written, you know, to the point, like straight up guide on how to be happy, which is like a crazy ask, right? It's a daunting ask, like how to be happy. I mean, this is your guy. Epicurus is your guy. However, I'm going to put him in C tier because even though I consider it incredibly important and very relevant, if you can understand Diogenes, then Epicurus really isn't needed. It's kind of redundant. Actually, nah, I'll leave him in C tier. But, you know, if I had a nickel for every time a Greek philosopher based their like views on the justification of Republic masturbation, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. But yeah, that's the thing. Epicurus is like, he's the practical version of Diogenes. Not, not really. Actually, that's completely inaccurate. He's just a really practical person. He wasn't some like, um, he wasn't some like averse to all pleasure, abandoned pleasure. He wasn't like so extreme, right? Really, he was just concerned with like, what the best way is of going about achieving those pleasures. So, uh, anyways, on to Seneca. Perfect timing. Um, I would name my eldest son Seneca. That's a sick name. Surprisingly, I resonate with his thoughts just as much as I do Epicurus, which is odd because they're kind of opposites. You see, Seneca was a Stoic. Wait, is this the right picture? This doesn't, I think this doesn't look like him. I thought he was like bald or something. I don't know. I took the first picture on Google and this is what came up. So yeah, he was a Stoic, um, AKA he was one of the boys. And the thing is like, we've, we've come a very long way, you know, in, in our understanding of things like this. And it's very clear that like Seneca had like been through a lot in his life, but he wasn't the deepest thinker. His thoughts nowadays are, are, are pretty basic. And they're understood by anyone over like 12 years old. But the thing is, knowing something and taking it to heart are two totally different things. Like everyone knows getting exercise is good, right? But most people just don't do it. And the more and more that I remind myself of like the generic, you know, bare bones advice that like Seneca taught, right? The very basic stuff. Honestly, the more I love it, the more I love like the, the simplicity of it. Because it's really all you need. Nowadays, there's so much advice everywhere. Like you go on TikTok and like a single post in like 30 seconds will give you like a perfectly crafted set of words curated by like the collective consciousness of humankind to give you like 50 of the best possible quotes all at once. And, and none of these quotes, like these beautiful quotes will have any sort of impact because the real impactful quotes come like one at a time where you can really take it to heart and, and really focus on that particular one usually during some like life event where it really comes into play. And so, and so like, really, I feel like the most effective, you know, pieces of advice or like, you know, help from others is when it's like really simple. And when they only say like one thing or maybe two, right. And that way it can really stick with you because it's all you have to focus on. And that way you, you could take it to heart and, and learn and grow from it. And now there, nowadays there's just too much out there. And, Seneca's advice works. Like simply put, it it works. Why bother spending time consuming so much more other advice from so many other people? I mean, after all, one of Seneca's core teachings was a person who lives a meaningful life desires only what is necessary, but a person who desires anything more will never be satisfied. And it's it, like this kind of thing is like, it's common sense by today's standards. I know. But sometimes even today, common sense isn't so common. And that's not like an insult to like, you know, everyone, like I'm saying, even though I know that me personally, it's hard for me to take that advice to heart and remind myself of it and actually, you know, participate in this kind of philosophy. So yeah, just to fuck with Seneca and Epicurus, I'm going to put them right next to each other, both of them in C tier. So next is Plotinus. Um, I know he was a Greek philosopher, but... I totally forgot what he did. I, if I remember correctly, actually, Plotinus, I think he was like the, he wrote about Plato and stuff like that. But I really, like, uh, I know he's actually important. I should have brushed up on him before I put him on this list. And actually, I knew there were going to be a few people on this list that like, are, what the void is for, if, you, if this is the first of my tier list that you're actually seeing, I have this tier down here. I name it different things based on what the tier list is. But 
basically if I, I don't feel like ranking someone for whatever reason, um, and in this list, I actually feel like it's probably going to happen for like a few more people just because I'm not confident. I, I don't feel confident in speaking on them. I'm just going to put them in the void. So St. Augustine, a.k.a. Augustine of Hippo. That's right. He was born in a town called Hippo. So like uh, if I remember correctly, he was one of these guys who was like very critical of modern Western culture. Like, of course, look at him. Of course, he's going to be critical of modern Western culture. I get it, right? It's not super revolutionary, even for the time. It's been a while since I've read anything about him. I think uh, last time I read him was like back in philosophy class, back in high school. But yeah, right as I started learning, if I remember correctly, right as we started learning about him was like the very day that I got expelled from school. So I'm going to take that as a sign and I'm going to put him... Uh, I'll put him in D tier. Jumping way forward in time is Sadhguru. He is a philosopher, um, public speaker. He's kind of controversial. You see, India isn't exactly what you'd call a developed nation. I was just in India like a couple of months ago, actually. And even the capital city, Mumbai, like the best living conditions for like the society's elites are like minimum wage, minimum wage living conditions in New York City. Like, that's how it is, even in the best case scenario. And the thing is, like, they're going through, like, they're actually, the whole country is actually going through a bit of a renaissance right now, um, even though, like, their whole renaissance kind of hangs by a thread. But that's neither here nor there. But there's a ton of, like, prosperity, uh, quote-unquote, popping up, right? Tons of great minds. Um, they're really popping off in chess. Uh, lots of their media is, like, expanding throughout the rest of the world. Um, in fact, they are the they have the largest English speaking population of any country in the world. So they, they're like on track to like do big, big things in the world of like social media and, and entertainment and stuff like that. In fact, from what I know personally, just my personal opinion, you don't have to take this as anything, right? I'm no political whatever, right? But I've been around and just what I think, just from what I've seen, the whole, like, the global superpower that everyone is scared that, like, China is going to become isn't actually going to be China. It's going to be India. And so naturally, you know, during this whole time, right, this is a transitional time for the country, they're going to have philosophers. And so this is, and also, uh, see, the, the philosophers of ancient times were very different um, from today's philosophers. And the reason why I'm putting Sadhguru here is because he's he resembles more of the ancient philosophers than he does all the modern philosophers. Because if you look at it, like, because of how undeveloped the nation is, India's, like, philosophy meta-narrative is going through, like, the same thing right now that, like, Greek philosophy was, like, 2,000 years ago. And also, I mean, these were all Greek philosophers that I mentioned so far, and they're all going to be concentrated near the top, as you can see. So, like, my personal opinion, Greek philosophy is, ancient Greek philosophy is unmatched. And, and India is going through a similar sort of thing, and nowhere near the same level of glory. But the same sort of, you know, position in history is where India is at right now. Actually, like, I mentioned earlier, one of the most underrated philosophers, Democritus, he literally, like, wrote about his travels where he met the gymnosophists who where I think that translates to naked Indian philosophers. Look it up. It's like a real thing. The, India has like, they, they really have like, if you really look at it, like six, 7,000 years of like really solid history. It's actually super underrated. But yeah, India and other countries like it have like a, a new wave of philosophers, basically copying a lot of what like America has to say today. If you look at like the Jay Shetty podcast right here, look at, like, it, it looks it looks oddly similar to Chris Williamson, doesn't it? Right? Right? Different color scheme. But, um, and also he, he does, he really does, like, talk to, like, a lot of, like, big names in the United States and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, it just, it's just an odd little pattern I noticed. Or if you look at, like, BK Shivani right here, like, 5.33 million subscribers, right? But, like, look at this, 28 million views, 22 million views. If you look at her total channel... She's like on her way to getting a billion total views. And the thing is like most people watching this will not know about her. 
Um, if you live in those states, there's no way you'd know about her unless you like watch one of these videos or someone tells you about her. But um, she's if you if you want to get a good idea of like who she is and what she does, she and she speaks English too, so it's like you can actually watch this kind of stuff unless it says Hindi. Um, but she's she's like the Indian version of Hamza. If you look at like Hamza right here, and and you look at like he uploads like relatively frequently, right? Like every other day, four times a week, something like that, three times a week or something. But yeah, look at this: one point seven one million subscribers. BK Shivani, 5.33 million. So she's way bigger than him. And it's it's actually really cool because like even though she's not, like nothing special, it's interesting that like she's a female who talks about self-improvement. And there really aren't many of those in the States, that's for sure. However, unlike the rest of these like, you know, Indian self-help people, Sadhguru is actually relatively popular in the States. Like he's been on Impulsive, he's talked with Mike Tyson. He's even been on the Joe Rogan podcast. So in terms of his thoughts, honestly, he, he, he's more of a messenger than like a, than, uh, you know, an original thinker. And I think he's a great communicator. Um, and I'd love to have a conversation with him in person uh, or online or whatever, right? I'd just love to have a conversation with him. And I can also see why there's a bit of controversy around him. But honestly, he really does seem like a pretty intelligent dude. I like his quotes. I like the wealth of knowledge that he's able to spread. But the thing is, like, we live in the age of the internet. Being a philosopher like that, is, there, there, it comes with a curse in the modern day. Especially, like, because if you truly do have that deep of an insight, there's much better ways to communicate than just, like, lectures, right? You can make movies and TV shows and anime and you can tell jokes and stories and create video games and all that stuff. Like, basically... The barrier to entry to create art is lowered so dramatically that pretty much everyone can do it. And, and, and to put it simply, just putting it bluntly, if your most effective method of communication for you is words, then you're not a very effective communicator in the grand scheme of great thinkers today, okay? Like, it's, it's that simple. I also have a bit of a problem with, like, the communities of people like this. It's the same problem I have with like Tony Robbins fan base and people like that. Like they're really, really hardcore and they all got a lot to say. And to them, it's like a, it's like a sports game. Like even when people like Sadhguru like tell everyone like, hey, don't cheer for me. That, that's like, uh, you know, missing the whole point. It doesn't matter what he says. They still cheer, you know, for the team that they're rooting for and they'll boo the team that they're not rooting for. Rather than like paying attention to the winning team, they'll just... And that's like, that's like, you know what, if you're doing that in sports, you want to root for a team, go for it. But when you're learning, when you're educating yourself in philosophy, you have to be a bandwagon. You have to actually pay attention to the winning team, not whatever team you want to win. Now, some have attributed this quote to uh, Zeno. I don't know why I just selected that. So I don't know why. Oh, Zeno is also locked. So yeah, Zeno. Some even say Diogeny said something like it. I, I haven't found any like solid uh, accounts of that. And also, I think most people would agree that it was it was like either Plato or Epictetus that like really said was really like the first one to say something like this. And it's it's this quote that's like, um, we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. And I think that that's something that Sadhguru's fan base can learn a thing or two about. All in all, he does deserve to be on this list, I believe. But really, nothing special. I'm going to put him in E tier. And E tier isn't bad, by the way. It's E for effort, right? And basically everyone on this list is a genius, basically, compared to the average person, right? Just being on this list puts you, at, at the minimum, in the A tier of humanity by default, okay? So none of these tiers are bad. And not even the void tier. But still, like, compared to the greatness that you find up here, like, yeah... E for effort, like good, good try, you know, good try and keep it going, you know, but at the same time, like I've watched some of Sadhguru's stuff and like, bro, I get more wisdom from Master Ugwe. And also I, I would agree that there is a difference between self-help and philosophy, but not much really. Like philosophy, like I mentioned earlier, has more overlap with other subjects than any other subject as has out there with anything uh, you know what i'm saying right it overlaps with almost everything and i know there's like philosophy elitists who would go like no he's not a philosopher he's a self-help guru or whatever a sad guru 
uh, you uh, you shouldn't put him on this list. And um, I wouldn't put people like Hamza or I Am Lucid or other people like that on this list. But I'm just going off intuition, and I don't know. Sadhguru seems like he fits in here. However, Osho, on the other hand, is... He's what I would consider to be a fake guru. Now, he said a couple things here and there that sound kind of interesting, right? But for the most part, he just seems really concerned with, like, appealing to the pretentiousness of people. And he's damn good at it, which is like, hey, <laughs> good on you, you know? That, that's that got some merit to, like, uh, if you want to claim your intellectual prowess, right? And I don't think he's as bad as people say he is. But, like, dude, like, if the most profound things that I've ever seen or heard from someone is like memes people make of them, then I don't know, man, F tier. Let's just, in all actuality, I think some of the things that he said might have some merit to them. I think they do have some merit to them, but there's like nothing exceptional that he said at all. Next we have Dante, um, brilliant writer, storyteller, influential. Everyone knows who he is. Um, and even if they don't, they know about the Divine Comedy. Uh, if you ever heard the whole, like, Paradiso, Purgatorio, that thing. Like, if you ever heard of Dante's Inferno, that's what it is. If you ever heard of Dante's Inferno, this is that Dante. That, that who, he, his writings are, like, really, they're really religious, actually, now that I think about it. They're about, like, heaven and hell. And I, I, I also thought about putting people like Jesus and stuff like that on this tier list. But I think I'm actually going to make a separate tier list for religions. So, um... Yeah, no no Buddha on this tier list. And also no Confucius. Sorry about that. Um, if, if they were on the tier list, both of them would be pretty damn close to the top. But yeah, Dante. Okay, see, I actually don't read, or I read really badly. Um, and I realize the influence that he's had on storytelling today. I realize only a little bit of it. Maybe there's so much more that I don't realize because I haven't read it. But like... Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't really been compelled to like, I really couldn't tell you anything about him or his philosophy or, or anything like that. Maybe, actually, no, I'm going to put him in the void tier because it, it sounds interesting and I want to get into it. And just like last week, um, I was talking to my friend or my brother's friend and we were talking about like whether or not hell, uh, heaven and hell even exists. And I was trying to make a case for why like hell could exist on earth, right? Um, in like a very surface level sense. But like this kind of topic does kind of interest me so i don't know i'll check it out i'll watch some youtube videos on it or something okay yeah so um i just added bruce lee in here and from this point forward i'm actually going to be going alphabetical order now that we're officially out of the philosophers who only go by a single name or who can go by a single name actually most of these guys can go by a single name but you know what i mean you google them their second name like their their last name or whatever either they don't have one or it won't even show up so first is Imam Abu Hamad Muhammad Al-Ghazali, I believe. So I learned about him when I was really little. I think I was like eight years old or something like that. And honestly, I I, I put him on here, but I like considered not putting on, him on here. Because I actually, I kind of don't really want to even say anything. Because everything I know about him is just what I learned from teachers who were under the payroll of a billionaire religious leader. So, yeah, I... Yeah, I think um, even though even though like I think most historians um, are aware of him and like they'll probably recognize him as like a great Muslim scholar. Um, yeah, Muslim scholar thinker maybe, but like definitely a Muslim scholar. Um, his thoughts, if I remember correctly, they they lean a bit more religious than philosophical. Just my intuition, and like you can make an argument that they're not so different, but uh. Yeah, that's a topic for a different day. But yeah, I'm going to go with my gut and put him in the void. Um, and I, I left out pretty much everyone else who was a, who's like a religious philosopher like this. Maybe not everyone, but um, yeah, I just don't feel like ranking him. I don't feel comfortable with that. I'm spending way too long talking about each person. I'm about to just speed run this, okay? So Thomas Aquinas, um, probably probably the most underrated philosopher of all time, plain and simple. And the fact that most people haven't heard of him is a damn shame. Ch genius, sure. Uh, a for Aquinas, actually, uh, yeah, B tier. Marcus Aurelius, the last great emperor of Rome. And he is the reason I actually didn't put Seneca any higher. I can't click him. Because although I like bow before both of these guys, right? 
Marcus Aurelius really teaches you everything you need to know about Stoicism. And like way, way, way better than, uh, well, actually everyone else that talks about Stoicism. I actually, I think I might make a video on like just Marcus Aurelius. I'm about, I'm about to go back through this video and, and see all the stuff that I said I would do and then go do that. And I'll add all, everything that I do, I'll add to the description. So yeah, A for Aurelius. I, I think I should have, maybe I should put his first name there. I think everyone, nobody calls him Aurelius. Everyone calls him Marcus Aurelius, but whatever. Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, yeah, um, science, philosophy, experimentation, um, enlightenment, blah, 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 blah. Uh, C tier. So, Simone de Beauvoir and John Paul Sartre, uh, they're actually married, and he's on the list too. But um, these guys were wild as fuck. And, and the thing is, like, okay, you can be wild. My favorite philosopher is Diogenes. But to justify such a lifestyle of, like, contradiction after contradiction, you better be, like, intellectual titans at that, you know? So, yeah, E tier for both of them. I'm going to put Sartre in E tier as well. Let me do that. Right here, Sartre. This guy. Um, I know that Berkeley University is named after him, so that's pretty cool. Uh... That's about it. Into the void. Russell Brand. Okay, so I personally, I th I feel like there's great value in thoughts that don't take the world so seriously and find the humor and everything, right? <sighs> Laughter is the gateway into something deeper, right? Some, a deeper part of yourself. And it's an indication that like something that was said and some, or something that was pointed out um, is not as, as it seems, you know, whether it's un unresolved trauma or maybe it's like, the opposite of what should be said, or maybe like a deeper understanding of human nature or something that like we don't think about with any detail, maybe. But whatever it is, it's it's not nothing, okay? And there's a lot of, like, I see a lot of value in, in just making people laugh. Because if they're really laughing, like a real laugh, that means they're learning something. Connections are being made. And to me, like, the best philosophers that are going to come out of the 21st century and beyond are probably gonna like overlap pretty well with the funniest people. Now Russell Brand is, you know, he's no comedic genius, but he's he's quick, he's creative, he's a tad unhinged, and I, I can respect that. Uh, he's shameless, and he's also a much deeper thinker than you might assume if you just look at him on the surface. It's super entertaining to watch him, and uh, although I don't consider him like a role model or anything, he's got such an interesting perspective that I, I love learning from him. And maybe this kind of thing, like this, uh, this, this philosophy, uh, ishness that he's developed is like, a is like a natural occurrence, like a commonplace thing for like reasonable people living in unreasonable places. Right. But at the same time, there's also a reason I don't live in Hollywood, even though I, I have the option to, but regardless, it's still, it's nice that somebody does who's willing to say things like this. It's nice to get a dose of, of Russell Brand's like really off guard, um, sometimes actually deep cutting thoughts. And it always puts a smile on my face. He's probably like, he's uh, one of the more humble people on this list, believe it or not. Um, a lot of these people like kind of, they thought they were gods or things like that. So he's actually surprisingly, despite the fact that he's nothing exceptional, he's actually one of the more humble people, I'd say. So, um, you know, what? I'm going to put him in, I'm going to put him in D tier. Actually, mm, E tier. Like, in terms of thought process, he's basically eclipsed everyone else in Hollywood, right? But he also makes, like, really crazy leaps sometimes into, like, not, like, outlandish conclusions, but, like, really pretentious and, like, know-it-all conclusions. And ever since this whole, like, uh, new version of him, right? Really since that whole Big Time Rush episode, the, the, the Christmas special, I feel like he really hasn't been tested like that. Like, he's got, he's got to do more with his life. And, and experience more to like really go up the ranks. It's a 21st century, you know, like the world is your oyster. You're rich. Why not like, you know, become Batman or something and just see how it is and figure out what you learn from that experience. And, you know, like the standards, people. So, uh, Karnup, um, yeah, Into the Void. I don't know anything about him. And same with Noam Chomsky. Uh, he's one of the new guys, but, uh, yeah, never really looked into him. Descartes. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna say it. He is the most overrated philosopher of all time. And the thing is like, he he was in the right place at the right time to have the right thought process that he did. Like there, at, at, at this point in time, there was like a real turning point in like the way of thinking that people had. 
and and Descartes because everyone is sort of keeping each other in check and like the population was really growing and stuff like that, and and Descartes is kind of like <clears throat> he he existed on this like bridge between like the old and like the new wave thinkers because like the, the way like okay philosophers from way back in the day were like they were like fucking giga chad giga brain dudes who were like muscular shit and um it's like the, it's like the equivalent today would be like some you know like sea bum dude or someone like that you know having some like shower thought and then coming on joe rogan's podcast to just talk about their shower thought and they assert it as like the absolute truth of like the nature of reality like they were really out here like that you know they didn't they didn't compartmentalize speculation and discovery to them it was the same thing and they also didn't spend much time doubting things rather they they chose to believe in things because there wasn't actually like they were like okay what is this new thing that i could think of forget about doubting it let me just see how far i can take it right and and really i find that same sort of mentality in the great storytellers who instead of saying, okay, this is unrealistic for this character to do, they push the boundaries of what is realistic to its absolute limit. And, and I really appreciate that. And of course, with this kind of attitude, you're gonna be wrong about most things. But nowadays today, everyone is so concerned about not being wrong that they don't ever pursue being right. Because in order to be right about something, you have to be wrong about a million things first. So, so people back then were not afraid to be wrong or right or afraid. To, they were not afraid to think. That's the thing. They were not afraid to think. And nowadays, people are just too afraid to like have actual thoughts. There's like culturally, I would say culturally, there's no freedom in thought, like ultimate freedom, I'd say. There's a lot of, a lot of like societal pressure preventing people from, from thinking with zero bounds. And back then people had that and all the new wave philosophers pretty much don't. So that's like, and of course you have to doubt things, right? But nowadays philosophers take previous philosophies that were, you know, thought up like 2000 years ago and they just spend all their time doubting them rather than coming up with anything new. Honestly, I don't like it. I, 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 everyone's such a pussy dude. Everyone's such a fucking simp. Like all these like cucks that go like watch Hassan Abi on Twitch and all this stuff. And they're like, oh, I spent 20 years every single day researching like a tiny part of a subsection of like a really niche topic that nobody even you know studies anything about here is my like double blind peer-reviewed paper that i made for like the past five years i hope i got at least one percent of it right and it's like okay I, I know i'm shitting on it um and it's not like there's actually any way for me to to prove like one is good or bad it just it's it we just we live in a different world okay this is how things are now um, and I still like, I'm, I'm, I, I love watching Andrew Huberman, Huberman, okay? And like, yeah, it gets annoying how like every five seconds he has to go like, oh, by the way, I'm not endorsing anything. I'm not saying you should do anything, all this stuff. He says all that, right? He gives like a disclaimer, like a thousand times a video, probably for liability reasons, but still like, this is what the world is today. And I think honestly, like everyone looks at like a uh, Descartes as like the start of like the... A whole and this is a byproduct of, of the way that people think now it's just a byproduct of like the the way people uh interact socially and the way that they judge other people's thoughts and descartes whether if he did start it all um i would i would rank him really low because i hate this way of thinking and i hate how everyone's trapped in it but i don't think he started it i think he just existed within it i don't think he really had that much influence i think there was a lot of people that influenced that way of thinking and also just because like someone thinks like you doesn't make them a good philosopher, okay? Um, except for when it comes to me. If someone thinks like me, they're a good philosopher and I'm putting them close to the top of uh, S tier or A tier. So yeah, uh, you're wrong, I'm right, uh, fuck you. Um, and, but like on the real note, it's Descartes is recency bias. He's like the definition of recency bias. Like his ideas aren't actually all that like brilliant. They're not all that they, they're chalked up to be, you know? Even, even like his most brilliant ideas are like, they're good, right? But they're not all they're chalked up to be. And, and what I find most weird about him is that like, even though he supposedly doubted everything, right? He was there who just doubted everything. He never doubted the existence of God. So honestly, overrated, overrated. You're limiting yourself in thought. He's a, he's a, he's a product of his time. And everyone sees him as some like great scientist or whatever. Bro, he was a straight dualist, okay? Way after the time where, you know, it made any kind of sense to even subscribe to any kind of dualism. You, you could say that, oh, he, he had the example of dreams, right? He thought about dreams and he said, okay, uh, if 
you think your dreams are real while you're in your dreams, then that means that we could all be living in basically the same thing. We could all be living in a like a trip and uh, our senses can deceive us. But like, bro, why are you using dreams as an example? Everyone already knows this. People have been doing psychedelics for like thousands of years. Like even even the ancient Greek philosophers that I mentioned earlier, like they were all like doing psychedelics. They were all smoking weed, by the way, if you didn't know. Like all these Greek guys smoked hella weed. Um, but yeah, everyone knew for a long time like how malleable your senses were. That's the whole reason why that's literally like the basis of the idea of forms. It's that you're in your mind things exist that literally do not exist in reality. Plato talked about this. He's the originator of this. Like, I, I, I don't understand why everyone thinks Descartes is some like brilliant thinker. And, and the worst part of it all, the worst part of it, and this is the, this is the part that really, really gets me. And look, I'm not saying um, that Descartes having a wrong thought makes him a bad philosopher. For all these guys, the way I've been judging them is not by their worst thoughts, it's by their best thoughts. Because usually if you're going to have, you know, the best thoughts, you're also going to have some pretty terrible thoughts along with it. Totally understandable. I can accept that. Um, and and I'm, I'm a lot more open-minded to people. So it's not like I'm criticizing him for having a, a thought that's just blatantly wrong, right? But it's it's the stories that I really resonate with. And it's the way things transpire that gets me, you know? And... The, the fact that, like, he spent years, literally years, coming up with, like, the most... And, and writing, like, his great his greatest theory that he considered, like, you know, the spiritual mind. And he put, like, all of his effort into, like, his great thesis about uh, dualism, right? And then that whole, like, that... The thing happened where there was that one chick... That one uh, Princess Elizabeth, one of them. I'm not, I'm not sure which one. Not any, like, you know, one... Like, the recent one, but, like... Um, and she wasn't even all that involved with anything. Like, she didn't really do much with her life. She's not like, really, like, all that well-remembered, if I remember correctly. But, like, she's just some random... Like, she wrote, but, like, just, like, randomly, right? You know, she was just reading. And she ended up reading his works on dualism. And then she wrote a letter to him, which in that letter was a complete, like, logical proof. It, like, a single paragraph with, like, six sentences or whatever... It, it was a complete logical proof on why his entire theory was wrong. And I don't think she was even intending to make a logical proof. She was just asking a question. She was just questioning it like a normal line of like conversation. But it ended up basically like proving like just purely mathematically that like Descartes idea is illogical and can't be possible. And it's like, bro, that's, I don't care that like you have some th like things that are wrong, but it's like, the story here, look at what happened. Imagine working for like years and years and years on like the thoughts that you've had your entire life and they culminate and you're considered like one of the greatest thinkers of the of a generation. And then out of nowhere, like when you're finally done, you're like, ah, oh, yes, my bulletproof airtight masterpiece, right? The next day, some like random chick, you know, who spends her time doing like royal duties, who doesn't even like think about this kind of stuff, happens to like skim through your work in passing and then just completely dismantles everything you worked for in a fucking letter. That's like, that's, that's, that's worse than having your heart broken over a text. That's like having your heart broken through a tweet. Like, I would just quit at that point. I would just never do it again. But like, okay, look, I feel like this goes without saying, okay? Descartes was a super smart person. I'm criticizing him because he's super overrated. But like, I think therefore I am is fucking amazing and that one does seem pretty bulletproof i love it but um he's not a fucking god like everyone talks about him i don't know why everyone acts like he's like top three overrated as fuck but still really smart but overrated as fuck i'm gonna put him in c tier dostoevsky this fucking guy man i feel like pretty soon he's uh he's gonna start being another one of these semi-controversial ones he was uh he was well, okay, you guys know, like, how all the best classical composers came from, like, starving families in the Soviet Union or shit like that? You know, like, people who had, like, really been through some shit. Um, people who had to miss a few meals or had their family separated from them or whatever, right? Those are usually the guys who, like, make the best music ever. And Dostoevsky, he was that guy. But instead of music, he got into literature. It would be putting it lightly to say he missed a few meals. He was literally like taken and like put into forced labor camps and, and stuff like that. So uh, 
there's that. Um, it's not like that weird. I'm not like just pointing something out just for Dostoevsky. Like I, I, I'm kind of going through each person kind of vaguely. This is like a lot of philosophers have like shit like this in their lives. This is kind of par for the course actually for most of these guys. It's basically, I mean, at this point, it's basically a prerequisite to have like, you know, been a slave or something like that for like guys at this level. Um, and it's weird because he he was really like a, a literature kind of guy, but like nobody in the literature community, as far as I can tell, like nobody in literature like talks about him. But in the academic community, everyone considers him like at, at least like 50-50 writer and philosopher. And if anything, more writer than philosopher. And the stuff, oh my God, and dude, the stuff he would write. If I was around him, like if I was alive during the same time and I was around him, I'd probably just be crying all the time because of the ideas he'd be coming up with and saying. It's a real emotional roller coaster. And I respect that. I respect the emotional roller coasters. And the thing is, like, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too deep. Because uh, he does, he goes, he cuts deep. Deeper than any blade, you know. But uh, for real. Like, uh, I, I might talk about him in a different video. A much longer one. But the one thing I'll say is, like, uh, for all these other philosophers, like, they were kind of unsure, but they were trying to figure out, like, what is good or bad, right? They were trying to figure out what, what is right and wrong. Throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what's stuck. But reading Dostoevsky, like, that'll teach you. Like, and, and even though it may it may seem like it's kind of out of nowhere when you read it, um, and that there isn't, like, much of a logical basis behind it, it, there really is, indeed, I believe there is a right and wrong. At least when you step away from the blurred line, right? I think there really is like a, a, a true right and wrong. Um, and it's like a, it's one of those, you know, it when you see it and I see it with Dostoevsky, I, I like, I read his works and I'm like, damn, he's, he's a good guy. He's like a genuinely like a good person at heart. That's just how I feel though. Yeah. A tier. I haven't read the brothers Karamazov, uh, or crime and punishment. Um, and like crime and punishment is like, it's whatever it's on the list, but I do plan on reading the brothers Karamazov. But um, it's a bit much for me right now. I'm not like in the best mind state, but I really, really do want to read it. It's like, it's not just on my list. It's on my bucket list to read that book. Um, I hope I don't die before I get to read it. That would suck. So yep, got something to look forward to. Um, and Emerson. I found Waldo, by the way. Haha, <laughs> get it? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, yeah, I bet there's like a million people who already said that joke, but... He, I don't know anything about him. I'll put him in the void. This uh, this is not a great picture, but yeah. Um, Michel Foucault, I believe, is how you pronounce his name. Uh, yeah, same. Void. He's also one of the new guys. Okay, so Frega. Um, actually, yeah, he's not going in the void. Um, and I'm going to be real with you. Like, I've only ever, you know, just been told about him, like, in passing a couple of times. I never actually, like, read anything about him. But I'm going to put him in F tier, just for funsies. Okay, Donald Glover. I I would hardly consider him a philosopher, but he acts so pretentious, he might as well be, like, clamoring to the world to call him a philosopher. Uh, but, I mean, okay, I, I shouldn't go... I'm not going to go too hard on him, because uh, I met his dad back when I was 18, and I have a lot of respect for him. But, like, I don't know, man. It's disappointing to see. Like, actually, like, you guys know that dude that was, like, um... The way a man can truly, not uh, the way a man can truly know himself is not by thinking, but by doing. Try to do your duty, and you'll instantly know how much you're worth, or something like that, right? I forgot who said it, um, but it's like you take that quote, right? What has Donald Glover done? He's Childish Gambino, by the way. If you didn't know, I mean, you could see by looking at him. But um, if you know Childish Gambino, you've heard his music before, and he's like said a lot, right? Like with that song, like "This Is America," you know, like he, he's, you know, got stuff to say. But like, really, what has he done? He's just, I mean, showed everyone that he has great potential for artistic expression, only to never do anything ever again, reaching anywhere close to that potential, and just like, waste away doing nothing. I just, I can't respect that. F tier. Sam Harris. Um, I actually made a video talking about my disagreements with him. Uh, it's SOC, but it's gone now. Um, it might be private on one of my channels, I'll have to check, but to put it bluntly, I, like, he doesn't think all that deep, and like, yeah, okay, he's super, he's a really creative guy, right, his thoughts are really novel, I mean, ish, right, they're not like all that original, but they're, they're novel, they're, they're interesting perspectives, 
and they're, and they're usually perspectives. I mean, maybe he's not all that smart and other people can see through it, but the perspectives he brings up are things that like I'd never thought of before. Um, and I guess that's like the price you pay for specking all of your evolution points into divergent thinking rather than deep thinking. Although it's not like that's not, those are not two separate things. It gets much more complicated. But the thing is, even when he introduces like a new idea that I never thought of, I think about it for a couple minutes and I'm able to see the flaws with it. I'm able to see the flaws in, in what he's saying. And then I'm able to see the flaws in what I'm thinking about those flaws. And then I'm able to see the flaws in that way of thinking. And I'm able to play devil's advocate like and on with myself back and forth on a much deeper level than he is. But I have to I have to make it abundantly clear. Like I'm by no means capable of running across the thoughts and ideas that he has. I, I can only I can only think that deep um when someone else tells me the idea. The main issue I find with him is like how shallow his thoughts on like morality are just like it's 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 really a shame dude because like nowadays it's it's so ripe to talk about philosophy it's such a great time not philosophy morality particularly it's such a great time for that and it's like come on think a little deeper maybe it says more about him as like a i know i don't know i don't i shouldn't cast judgment but for someone who's like so driven by science right he's always science 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 he tends to assert a lot of like axiomatic truths about the nature of right and wrong and i have this quote and it's actually pretty relevant not really it's kind of relevant it's more relevant to like situations in the real life than it is like some random like neuroscientist right but the quote is the definition of evil is someone who studies science without studying philosophy that's my quote i came up with it maybe someone said it first but i came up with it on my own and for someone who does both right studies science and philosophy and makes really strong attempts to connect them. Like that's like, that's the place to be, you know, that's where you can really get things done and, and really come up with new creative ideas and thoughts and really go deep on them. And for someone who like found the winning formula and found the key to like great heights uh, cognitively, he really doesn't have all that much to impress, you know? I, don't, I mean, uh, I don't even know, actually. I, I shouldn't even, I'm going to judge these people, but like, the thing is, like, all these new guys have, like, way too much content for just one person to consume. Like, all those, you know, the like, I talk about the, like, eureka moment, the, like, aha moments that I have when, like, reading stuff from the Greek philosophers, like Pythagoras. I have none of that listening to Sam Harris. And, and that's crazy, because I've even had a couple of those eureka moments while listening to Jordan Peterson. But he was mainly, actually, Jordan Peterson was literally just talking about, like, other stories that, like, other people had said before him. Or things like that, right? He was just analyzing those or just saying some quote that like some other previous philosopher said. He was just educating. He was being a messenger, basically. But like Sam Harris hasn't given me like even a single one of those eureka moments. I don't know. Maybe originality is running out these days. Who knows? But um, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, I'll put him in E tier, actually. Because I think, I think he through and through deserves to be above... Donald Glover, obviously. Um, yeah, this is a messed up tier area of the list right here. This is way, way messed up. I put the Beauvoir below Russell Brand. Uh, okay, whatever. Okay, uh, Hegel. Um, so, yeah, uh, I really don't know. Um, look, I don't even read, okay? Like, I just talk to people. I just, I'm all about that Socratic method, okay? So, um... It's pretty well known, actually. Like, Hegel's kind of, he's kind of confusing. Yet at the same time, yet at the same time, he's also not confusing, which is really weird. He's confusing and not confusing at the same time. And that's what's really confusing, actually. But it's like, like, okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here, okay? Um, the, the meaning of life is, drumroll please, da -da 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 -da, reproduction. See? Like, was that so hard? Like, I mean, okay, maybe, you know, it's a little more than that, right? But it's like, I don't know. If he's one of those guys who tries to sound smarter than he actually is, then maybe he might actually be a genius. No clue. I should probably watch some more videos on him. But even though I do know a bit about him, for now, at least, uh, into the void. People are going to be mad at that one because, um... People, I think a lot of people see as him as like a truly like brilliant philosopher. So, but I just don't know enough about him. Yeah, uh, Heidegger. So I haven't really read much about him. 
Uh, same with Husserl, actually. I'm putting them both in the void. I have to extend this tier list. So, uh, Hobbes, um, yeah, once again, actually, for the lulls, I'm gonna put him in F tier. Uh, F is for friends who do st actually, no, nah, I'm putting him in F tier because the way he looks. But, um, and also, actually, <laughs> he looks okay compared to David Hume. Hume looks like, he reminds me of, like, um, Dudley's dad from Harry Potter, doesn't he? So, yeah, he also goes in F tier. And also Hume's like, I think he's a pretty fucking stupid philosopher. Like rel relatively compared to other philosophers. I don't want to get into it right now, but maybe in a different day. So Carl Jung, um, I think he's a cool dude. Uh, but the thing is, I've only ever heard about Jung's teachings through like, like YouTube video. You know, those YouTube videos of like, you know, someone drawing on like a whiteboard, uh, those videos. And also like stuff that people have told me like in conversation and I don't even know if everyone would agree that he's a philosopher. I think he's probably more of a philosopher than Freud. So um, even though I don't really know anything about him like directly that I like look directly from the sources, I'm going to put him in B tier anyways. Immanuel Kant. Uh, damn. Spread a bit too thin, honestly. I think he's also kind of overrated. Nothing I've seen from him like really stands out as like having any like glimpses of brilliance, right? But I mean, then again, he, he also wrote about a lot of stuff. Um, but then again, people with the least life experience usually have the most to say. So honestly, I, he's just another footnote to Plato. I'd put him in D tier. So Ted Kaczynski. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have put him on this list. Honestly, I already have a strike on my channel. I don't want to like. I'm. I'm. I'm not trying to do this all over again, but um, I'll this. I'll. I'll just say this. I'll just say this. If you learn about a new idea, right, and it starts making sense to you, okay, cool, but then it starts making a lot of sense to you, like a like a lot like way too much sense, like all of a sudden it makes a lot of sense, and at the same time the idea has never occurred to you up until that point. That might be your cue to like, um, to like stop and um, proceed with caution. So yeah, I'm gonna put him, I'm, I can't put him in the void because I know enough about his philosophy to like be able to judge him. So I'll, I'll, uh, 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 Kierkegaard is what I like to call the hashtag relatable philosopher. I don't know if anyone ever thought of him that way, but um, if, if that's not a term at this point, I'd like to coin that for Kierkegaard. And uh, he also has the coolest name of any philosopher ever, in my opinion. And that's why I decided to put his full name on here, Soren Kierkegaard. Yeah, it sounds like the name of a dragon in a movie or something like that. Sauron. Uh, nah, that's that's cringe. That's nerdy. But but it's like, bro, like even um, you know, like the Ronin O, like with the like the slash in there. The guy, you know, the guy who's like who made that song, like all girls are the same, like that song. That this O is not like some. That's actually part of his name. That's like literally part of his name. He's also he's also fairly relevant in my opinion. The whole like um, people people settle for a level of pleasure that like they can tolerate but that i don't know i, I forgot how the quote goes but it's basically like basically like the, the whole idea of it is like people live in this hell where it's like it's terrible it's like so bad that like people can't be anything but miserable but it's not bad enough where people are like damn i gotta change something i gotta get out of here you know um so i feel like his philosophy is also really relevant to like things that go on today but keeping in theme with that like whole hashtag relatable right his thoughts resonate with me, not in like the same way that like other ones do where it's like, oh damn, that cuts deep, but more in the way where it's like, that's like real in like a, in like a odd, like it's, it's not like, I'm not coming to his thoughts, but he's like edging me, you know? I feel like, um, one day if like the, one of these K-pop artists, like BTS guys, whatever, they finally break free from their contract. They're going to go on all these like podcasts. They're going to go around everywhere and like be all like depressed and talk about how like life has no meaning and people suck and all that shit. And I'm like, that that's Kierkegaard right there. Bro, he even looks like a K-pop artist. Look at him. Look at him. I feel like you can totally see the dude, like the blue the blue eyes, bro. Even though you can't see it, he's totally got blue eyes. I'm pretty positive he does. But yeah, this this 
K-pop artist looking motherfucker with his hair and everything. Like he's definitely an anime watcher. But for real though, like this dude, this dude is actually crazy smart. But um but he's also he's also kind of like the whole uh like his philosophy resembles you know when you're with your homies at like 3 a.m. and you're having those deep talks and by the end of it you're left with like more questions and answers. Like that's kind of what it what his philosophy sort of resembles. I was actually the thing is like previously like even until recently um his philosophy didn't even resonate with me all that much. But now that I'm like a tad older and I know a bit more about human behavior like the shit that he said is like crazy insightful. I see it too. I see the things he was saying like with my own eyes. Um but yeah, even outside of like human behavior stuff, like he goes deep and he doesn't discriminate between like humans who choose one lifestyle over another. He's just, he's just a deep thinker and just an analyzer of all of it. He's like, he's, I guess that's the one thing about Kierkegaard that's not so hashtag relatable, but, um, you know, I'm not like that. I, 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 I pick and choose. I'm a human being, you know, he's better than me in that way. So, um, I'm going to put him in B tier. For better than me. Kripke. Um, man. I didn't even realize this. It turns out he literally just died like a few months ago. I just found out actually when I was just looking for his picture on Google Images. No one ever tells me anything. This is the problem, dude. And the thing is like modern philosophers are kind of pathetic. So it's, it's nice to see someone who is like a real fucking philosopher in the modern era. And um, I don't think he was anything exceptional. But um, you know. Compared to today's philosophers, he definitely was exceptional. So, and I really hope there there's more minds like him. This might be recency bias, but yeah, I, I feel like more minds like him come through. So, uh, yeah, rest in peace, Saul Goodman. D tier. Krishnamurti. So, uh, that whole, like, content renaissance happening in India right now, and not just in India, but, like, a lot of other oriental places, right? Like... The whole academic side of it, at least, was really started by this guy, Jiddu Krishnamurti. Um, he's kind of the originator of the whole thing, really. The, um, the, I guess the American equivalent would be like, um, I don't know, who, who's the guy that like really popularized like the YouTube, like the inter intellectual dark web, you know? Not even popularized, like started it. I guess it was like the first person to like really, um, you know, inspire all the rest of them. Uh... I, Keemstar? I don't know. Look, I honestly don't even know much about this guy. He was a bit before my time. But, and like, and like, mad respect to him, right? For like doing all this stuff. But at the same time, I never really, I would never really see my uncles and aunts talking about him, like debating his videos the way they did for Osho. So, uh, yeah, I would have, tell him to have fun in the void, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put him up here in D tier actually. Just to fill it out, I don't want to put too many people in the void. If this becomes a bit fuller, I might actually take Hegel or like Chomsky or, or Dante out of here and, and actually rank them. Kendrick Lamar. Uh, okay, let's let's get this clear, okay? People have known this for a long ass time now. Pride is a sin for a reason, okay? It doesn't matter if it's pride for your country or pride for the fact that you like taking it in the ass, okay? It doesn't really matter. I always thought about Kendrick Lamar as like a musical genius until I realized that like it never it never occurred to me like he, he just established himself as like a great musician way back when like 2013 14 whatever and then I never really thought about it since then um <clears throat> and, and his songs I would just like I would just eat him up and never really think about him and, and I, I, I thought this way until uh, I was listening to a song called Pride uh, which was in Damn and I I was listening to it and I was thinking, like, this is literally the best song in this entire album. It is. And I could make it better. I could make it at least twice as good. Like, Kendrick isn't actually all that great. The, the thing is, the reason why he eclipses all these other artists is because everyone else just sucks. I think To Pimp a Butterfly is overrated as fuck because, like, all these pretentious people, they just want to copy the opinion of Anthony Fantano. And, like, if Anthony Fantano loves it, cool, good for him. But all these people who like, they think they're so smart when literally they have like no taste of their own, right? I, and, and they boost this album when it's really not even that great, I think. Um, his lyrics age really, really poorly, like consistently. Um, and I still love Good Kid Mad City despite the fact that it's probably aged the most, but that's only because like nostalgia is so bright 
it's blinding. You might be like, oh, why are you not addressing the philosophy that he speaks in his songs, right? Why are you only addressing like the quality of his music and things I am? Because he, the way he makes music, he's a, he's a high risk, high reward artist. Um, and I respect that for sure. But his musical quality is directly tied to the philosophy he preaches in it. And, and okay, look, he's a better musician than I'll ever be. Okay, better than most people will ever be. Um, and he's one of the best to ever do it in this generation, right? Of, of hip-hop, at least. Um, and if someone considered him their favorite artist, I, I wouldn't even be phased. Wouldn't be surprised. Like, sure, go for it. Totally, totally reasonable. But I swear to God, most of y'all are lying. Like, most of these people who say they love Kendrick Lamar only say that because everyone else also says it. And, and, and Kendrick, even outside of, like, the fact that he doesn't get criticism for this kind of thing, you would think that by now he would have like learned to not make lyrics that like time and time again age extremely poorly like literally worse than like almost anybody else in the industry which is surprising i'm not even joking i swear to god i think like low pumps lyrics have aged better than kendrick lamar's lyrics i don't know maybe his early works were just were lightning in a bottle but i mean even outside of music he's not really the sharpest bulb in the shed and also inside music same. I, I don't think he's as great as everyone says he is. I see glimpses of greatness, but that's all they are, just glimpses. I'm going to put him in F tier. Should I put logic on this tier list? Because, like, he's obviously not a, like, philosopher, right? But he's so pretentious. He literally calls himself logic, okay? Like, so... And, and there might have been a time where I, I would put, you know, Kendrick, like, leagues above logic. Leagues above him. Like, like uh, there was a time where it didn't even make sense to compare them. But honestly, now I'm really starting to see the similarities. But um, yeah, if I were to add logic, I would need to make a tier below F tier. And uh, that's too much work. Bruce Lee. Um, so just to clarify, most people consider Bruce Lee a fighter, right? But that's just the surface. Really, he's a philosopher. He didn't even fight all that much. And his philosophy was really that, like, everyone can be a fighter. And if everyone's a fighter, there's no like, oh, this person's a fighter because they fought like five people. Bro, I fought five people, you know? When it comes to his philosophy, in my opinion, I, I think the, the stuff that Bruce Lee preaches is actually the antidote to like so much of the suffering happening today. Especially, especially, actually, almost exclusively by people who want more out of life and who are uh, living like, who, who, who personally feel themselves that they're not reaching their potential. We're humans, right? And human beings at our best do what humans have evolved to do over millions of years, which is like, you know, long distance running uh, and also long distance walking and climbing and swimming and throwing and fighting and all that stuff, right? Wrestling and all that. Um, and our body and mind are both connected. Fighting is the oldest sport. It's, it's, it's the oldest game. It's the oldest art form and it's baked deep, deep within our existence. To fight is simply a part of the human condition. It's just as mental as, as it is physical. And actually, mental health isn't just interlinked with physical health. They are the same. Mental health is physical health. They're both caused by the same issues. They're both treated by the same treatments. They're both, you know, they, they result in the same effects if you have bad mental health and physical health and if you have good mental health and physical, mental, physical health. They result in the same things. And, um, like... I'm going to skip like a thousand steps in this conversation and just get straight to the point. Like an example of, of like the way the world is today is like in the sexual marketplace, your appearance matters, right? That's evolution. Okay. Because your appearance says a lot about you in a perfect world. Nobody would lie about their appearance. Everybody, you know, whether it be wearing makeup or going to the gym for men, like the modern solution to this kind of thing is like bolstering yourself to make it look like you're doing things in life that your body would indicate but that you're not actually doing you're just like you know even the one hour gym session you really think about it it's simply just a cheap alternative to living a truly non-sedentary lifestyle like if everyone stopped going to the gym and simply lived the lifestyles that they wanted to live right where they were competitive with other men and things like that all of our bodies would naturally reflect the lives that we lived and women would be able to see that and they would have like a real true like accurate measure for sexual selection because they would really know what people have been through by looking at their bodies so it's honest and authentic 
and it really like the people who who I see a lot of people that are like very low testosterone who are like really pathetic people who spend like every day going to the gym for like three hours they don't do anything with their lives and they look way better than me when in reality they're like much less of a man than I am and in like a natural world where we're living our lifestyles and not doing this like shortcut to like trick women into thinking that we're a certain way based on our bodies I would look much bigger than those guys and also now looking big which is something that um the process of looking big is usually a game that men have to play that that gives them a lot of meaning in life is often considered something a, like a negative in society because of the fact that like so many people it's such a low barrier to entry and it's such a it's such a like a refined science at this point that you don't need to actually live a impressive life to have an impressive body which you should maybe you should maybe you shouldn't that's the world we live in today um and that kind of screws things up for everyone because now there's not an accurate measure that now you can't judge a book by its cover we judge a book by its cover naturally everyone does and we should be able to uh because that's how our minds work but now it's not even possible to do that and, and also like you know if you live a truly authentic life and you want to have a good body you want to play the games that will give you a good body that'll also avoid all the headache of having to like dive super deep into the literature of like training and you know injury prevention and creating aesthetic strengthening tendons and ligaments so you don't tear them isometrics and you know training the muscles that like normal resistance training doesn't hit um and joint pain prevention and all these like they, all these problems go away they're, they're completely non-existent if people simply exercised authentically and they spent their time playing athletic games and the people who enjoyed playing games more ended up building stronger and better looking bodies and thus like females can judge oh this person enjoys playing games more they're more competitive it makes sense all like the games that we used to play hunting and wrestling and stuff like as a society you're literally you know it's literally illegal to fight like if two consenting adults say to themselves say to each other okay we're gonna fight each other and uh you know just just to like just to fight you know just to see how it is you need a license you need a boxing license you need to be in the mma um you need to have like a a, a governing body sanction that sort of thing it's pathetic and um it's resulted in like people just sitting on their asses all day and now we need to have like a really deliberate like one hour session to like compensate for the fact that we live like pathetic lives and and you you could find a, a much stronger balance with like a natural human way of going about living where you instead of working out to look good you work out to feel good and i i know i'm rambling here uh, this is like really out of nowhere. I just added Bruce Lee, actually. I wasn't really thinking about him until uh, uh, I just got reminded Bruce Lee, like he had that quote. I was talking to my friends on stream and it was, um, uh, what's it called? Pray not for an easy life, pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. So I, I was like, who said that quote? I forgot who it was and I looked it up and it was Bruce Lee and I'm like, damn, I gotta add Bruce Lee in here. I forgot about that. So I wasn't even thinking about him and now I'm just, I'm just going off. But um, the thing is like all this advice really only works if like the rest of the world also learns to become authentic because the bar has been raised like so far beyond what is naturally human that like your only choices now if you want to be if you want to decide the le your level of authenticity is you either be truly authentic and you don't fit into the world uh, and you know uh at that point you might as well be an incel because about you know because about authentic you are with like your your humanity right no girl is going to like you if you smell like a human being because everyone is so sanitized and sterile and they completely got rid of their body odor like things like that I, I can i i can describe all these things and i can literally tell you why body odor is actually a great thing and how if everybody had body odor and people didn't have such, have such a high standard um nobody would even notice body odor and it would actually be a much uh better society where people don't spend so much time worrying about their body odor because it, nobody notices it and also body odor plays a huge role i don't know if you guys knew this Literally, uh, if somebody if feels happy and they have body odor, they sweat, the chemicals that evaporate from their sweat when inhaled by people around them literally makes them happy too. Like, you, literally, happiness is contagious if you allow people to have body odor. Think about that. Think about, like, all of the incredible human experiences and the emotions and the things we can feel that we're missing out on because we're not living like true human beings and the way we've evolved to live. That's that's one example. That's one example. I can go on and on and on. 
And literally, the way I see it, we're, human beings today, you know, with all the technology and everything, we're only like 1% human at this point. And we only get like 1% of the true experience of being human. And if you're truly authentic, right, you truly want to live the, the incredible lifestyle of that, that we were evolved to live, that you, you, you become an incel for sure, no doubt. Because at that point, um, you can't compete because, you know, naturally a woman would judge uh, based on body odor who to, who to mate with, right? But the thing is, everyone is artificially changing their body odor using all this deodorant and all like showering every single day and all this shit, right? And like, even if you tell a girl, I don't shower every day, which literally I don't, I shower every other day. But even if I tell a girl that, she'll be like, that's so gross. Like we've reached that standard. Like showers have only existed for like not even that long of a time. And these women act like it's, it's like an absolutely essential thing for human beings. They're like, you have to, you have to shower every day. You have to? Dude, your ancestors literally didn't even have that option. They clearly didn't have to. You adapt. It's called hedonic adaptation. You adapt your situation. And at a certain point, you have to stop and go like, wait, maybe I should stop raising the bar over and over and over again. And I should just live an authentic life and be satisfied with who I am and who others are as well. Um, but like culturally, that's it's it's more and more men are becoming too feminine to, to prescribe themselves to that because they're becoming weak little pussies who don't want to live authentic lives because they're such a slave to female, to, to, to pussy, and they're such a slave to getting their nut that they don't actually care about like themselves as a person. All they want to do is just do whatever appeals to females. And also, uh, the culture of females is so completely warped and delusional right now in the modern world that uh, it's not happening on their end anytime soon. So you either be authentic, uh, like truly authentic, and you become an incel, or you be inauthentic and, uh, you know, you get to procreate. Um, but, you know, you're living in a game of lies and you have to convince yourself that you're actually healthy mentally and physically. And that's how you can see, you know, mental health isn't such a complicated problem in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, it's really just people lying to themselves because, you know, you go to the gym. I don't know. It doesn't matter. You take steroids or whatever. I mean, they literally, they talked about this in SpongeBob. This is literally a philosophy that was taught in SpongeBob where the uh, SpongeBob got those fake arms and he went to Muscle Beach and showed off and... In the end, he wasn't actually able to do those things and he was completely humiliated because he knew he was living a lie that whole time. You can't live a lie like that. And the same th sort of thing applies uh, mentally as well. People think that mental health is like a new thing and it's so complicated. No, dude, it's the same thing as physical health. Don't live a lie and you'll have good mental health for the most part, right? I would say it solves 90% mm, of all the mental health issues, but you know, there's also a 10% that it doesn't. But yeah, um, you have those two options or you could strike a balance in between both uh, because both options suck and you'll be miserable with one and uh, potentially miserable with the other. I mean, I guess depending on who you are, you can consider one of them the like absolutely 100% miserable one, but it, it depends on the person. But there is a possibility to strike somewhat of a balance and be a little bit less miserable uh, because we live in a new time and things are different. So we must change with the times, you know, we must be like water and water is the element of change. Dude, I swear if I could put Uncle Iroh on this list, I would put him on B tier. Um, so I'll put Bruce Lee in B tier in place of him. B is for Bruce Lee. So Leibniz, uh, yeah, yeah. Look, if I had a nickel for every person who was able to call themselves a genius by piggybacking off of Isaac Newton's work, I'd have like uh, six nickels or something like that. But yeah, um, Leibniz, he, he may have been a high IQ person, right? He was, he definitely was. But like, he wasn't really out here like that. Uh, and, and you might be like, oh my God, one of the inventors of calculus, how could you? Okay, first of all, who actually enjoys calculus? Second of all, Need I remind you of the levels of greatness we're dealing with here, okay? Here, here, I'll remind you. I'll give you, I'll give you another story about Diogenes, okay? Because he's really, he's really the only guy I have this many stories about. So, so this, the, the story, it's, it's told in the, it's actually more of a quote. Um, and it's told in a bunch of different ways. But basically, this guy who was like some like real, you know, kiss ass, 
to some political figure, right? Or maybe he was just kiss out, he was kissing up to like their god or something. I'm not sure, but he was real kiss ass. He landed a position in government uh, with like a real nice paycheck and everything. And he saw Diogenes eating lentils or lettuce or one of the two, right? I'm telling it's like a weird story is told in a bunch of different ways. Basically, he was eating some cheap food, okay? And the guy goes up to Diogenes and he's like, if you would just, you know, be a bit of a kiss ass, like that's all you got, like just kiss up to this person a little bit and you know, you won't have to eat so such cheap food, right? And Diogenes replies, you know, if you learn to enjoy cheap food, you won't have to be such a kiss ass. So, uh, it's so, I don't know, dude, it's so simple, right? It's such a simple thing. It's not like some brilliant philosophy, but it's so, it's so quick and efficient and it gives you the full perspective. It just, it, all he did was rearrange the sentence and it gives you the full perspective is like, oh, wait, it's very clear. The communication here is like, <laughs> try reevaluate what truly matters here. You know, although what you're saying sounds totally reasonable, really think about what truly matters here. And it's, it's, I don't know. It just. Every time I hear uh, things that Arjuni said, it just sounds perfect. It's per it's not on the nose at all, and it's just it's 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 efficient and brief, no no bullshit, no fluff, nothing like that. So yeah, don't forget the kind of people we're dealing with here. Okay, this guy, oh, uh, ooh, he can do math. Big fucking whoop. Okay, all these guys can do math. Easier. John Locke. Um. I think he's a political philosopher, if I'm not mistaken. But honestly, I, I don't really even know anything about him. I know more about the John Locke from the TV show Lost than the philosopher. Uh, not to say that the TV show Lost one wasn't also a philosopher. But uh, yeah, I gotta, gotta study up a bit more. He can enjoy his new home in the void for now. Machiavelli. I hate that. His picture makes him look so evil, dude. But yeah, people have this like misconception about Machiavelli. They think he was an evil person. Um, I disagree. I, I I think like I think he wrote a really effective handbook on how to be evil, but he himself wasn't an evil person. Like when you really look at him from that perspective, like a like a as like an educator, it becomes like a it, you you notice that there's a lot of compelling stuff that he said. Um, and and it makes a bit more sense like that because, like okay, for example. I wholeheartedly agree on the idea that, like, there really is no rules to this shit, okay? When it comes to government and politics, it's a it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The only rule is win. Like, let's say I break a law, right? Oh, you broke a law. And I, let's say I don't pay my taxes. And people are going to start coming after me. Um, eventually, you know, after enough people come after me, someone is going to come after me who will wield the threat of violence. And then if I eliminate that person, right, I kill them, disarm them, defend myself against them, whatever it may be, if I do that, I'm in real trouble. Um, even if it's like human nature, what I did to defend myself or whatever, for example, breaking out of prison, um, that's like a search for freedom. And that's totally natural. That's like a normal human thing to do. Yet it'll land you even more prison time to break out. They'll extend your sentence. So um, it's, it's inhumane, if, in my opinion. So yeah, uh, if I if I break the law and I stop the people, they'd eventually send more people after me and more people. And let's say I'm able to stop all of their attacks. Eventually, they'll send out a final wave of violent forces and they will be stopped, right? Hypothetically, in a hypothetical situation, right? And then after that point, like they'll need something else to get rid of me, right? Because at that point, like they'll be like, oh, this guy's insane. We got have to get rid of him, right? So what... Uh, they might use they might use facts and logic, or they might use an atomic. And let's say I survived that too, right? Let's say I'm just unstoppable. Then there, that's it. I win. I never actually committed any crime because crime is just a word assigned to an act, right? It's not entirely on what's right or wrong, but it's just what the powers that be don't want other people doing. In reality, nothing is like set in stone, right? We're human beings. There is no rules to this kind of thing. The president of the United States could literally die right now from a brain aneurysm and nobody would, people would be helpless to stop it. Nobody could do anything about it. Like we're human beings. We're subject to nature. We are birth from mother nature, okay? We're not like, it's like these things are supposed to be set in stone and all this stuff. 
And as much as we might like to pretend like it, even still to this day, to the world, like, like, like even the, the borders between countries like India and Pakistan and China and Russia and all these countries, like, they're not actually completely solid borders. Like, they're, they're still argued over, right? If I go over there, if I go and conquer it, right? If I conquer some country and I go like, this is mine now. You know, if the United Nations doesn't recognize my new country, right? I could just take over the United Nations. Or tear them apart so it doesn't even matter, right? Who cares if people recognize my country or not? What are you going to do about it? I have my country. You can't even do anything about it. And um, if no no other country recognizes my country, even after I you know take down the United Nations, I could just wipe out all other countries. So that way there aren't any, even any people left to not recognize my country. So in reality, when you get down to it, the only thing actually holding all this order together that people have, all these these categorizations for everything, oh, these are continents and countries and states and cities. And all the only thing really holding all this stuff together is deep down at its core, violence. It's militaries, it's armies. That's literally what it is. When you, when you really get down to it, there aren't actually any rules to this. Everything is actually up for grabs if you're, if you're willing and clever enough. The thing is, Machiavelli, the thing is, Machiavelli is really one of those standout philosophers because most philosophers would agree that like you know having an insatiable hunger for power is not a good way to live yet people still do it and, and Machiavelli instead of just like saying what you should or should not do he just straight up dive in dove into it and wrote about how they could go about doing it and in the process he revealed like a ton of like really tough pills to swallow for people but also he revealed like for people who are willing to like learn and be open minded, he revealed like a lot of great wisdom, not on how to go about living this lifestyle, but on how to spot this kind of pathological behavior, right? And how to avoid it, um, you know, when you go in with that intention. And if you're a real smart cookie, how to shut it down. I personally think he's one of the most mischaracterized people in all of philosophy, maybe even all of history. Again, I can never be sure, right? But just from what I read, he actually does seem like a good guy, you know? Like, you know those uh, people on YouTube who uh, make those videos like, oh, how to be absolutely miserable, right? They make videos that are like titled like that, right? And they make it some like super obvious, like, oh, 12 steps on how to ruin your life or whatever. And basically what the video is like telling you, it, everything that it tells you to do, it's kind of implied that you should not do them if you're trying to not live a miserable life or, or ruin your life or whatever, right? And it's, it's, this is sort of kind of like the precursor of that. It's like teaching you the same things, but from a new perspective. And if Machiavelli really wanted power, why the hell would he give out all the secrets on how to attain power for the masses to read, you know? Like, if he was, if he was so good at manipulating people, then why would he lay out all the steps in the book for everyone else to do it and see how it works? Why wouldn't he spend any effort doing it himself? If anything, if he was so good at manipulating people, why would why wouldn't he go through any of that effort to make sure that history would remember him fondly because most people don't like machiavelli most people think he was like an evil manipulative person but think about it if he was so evil and manipulative wouldn't your thought of him be that he's a good person because he manipulated history in his favor to make people think that and if that's the case that he he, he tried to do that and he wasn't successful then his philosophy isn't all that successful so people shouldn't be worried about his book like getting into the wrong hands and people going like, wow, it's a terrible book. You shouldn't read it. It's so bad because it'll, it's like a handbook on how to make people, people evil and how people can grab power and screw people over. And it's like, no, it's not. If it's so ineffective, it didn't work for him, then it's clearly not. So it seems logically clear to me by my own deduction that like he, he, he does seem like a good guy, honestly. I don't think he was a bad guy. And like... I don't know. And like, it's, I think it's a reasonable deduction to make. It's, nevertheless, the public hates him still. Like, they consider him like the poster child for like, the evil, you know, political power hungry fiend, right? But really, I don't know. I think he was a genuinely good guy. Or at the very least, he was neutral. At the very least. And his, his ideas to, to like his philosophy was... Man, I putting it lightly 
it, it, it's eye-opening. And I absolutely plan on uh, studying more about it. And um, one of these days I'll get around to reading The Prince. But uh, for now, Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, Italian, obviously. I mean, where the fuck else would a guy named Niccolo Machiavelli be from? So, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put him in B tier, actually. I don't usually... I'm not usually a big fan of philosophers that get that deep into politics, but uh, yeah, B tier. Okay, next is uh, Karl Marx. I'm gonna have to drink some water for this one. Okay, so let's say you're, you're looking at my timestamps, right? And you just skip to this part of the video because it's Karl Marx and um, you just wanna hear what I have to say about this. You have to go through and watch what I said about previously with other philosophers because I made a lot of prefaces that are that are important to know when judging people like this, okay? And, and, okay. Uh, I often see this, like, take pop up a lot on social media about these kinds of guys. Like, for example, Jordan Peterson, right? Like, people on social media will go like, yeah, Jordan Peterson is not a good philosopher because here's a laundry list of his ideas that I don't agree with. But it's like I said earlier, if you judge philosophers on the percentage of ideas that you agree with versus disagree with, then every philosopher goes in F tier, except for maybe Socrates. Like, like for example, um, people might go like, oh, I don't like Greek philosophers. I mean, Aristotle was blatantly racist. And then they'll go on to like drool over Karl Marx, who, surprise, surprise, was also blatantly racist, by the way. But they'll just ignore that. And um, I mean, that's human nature. It's the labels. It's the labels. And we we apply the label onto someone like good or bad or whatever, right? And then all of a sudden, the things that they do will be judged with that in mind. Like I literally, I, I literally did this experiment when I was young. Um, in high school, there was this guy named Saul, right? And uh, he was friends with one of my friends. He was, he was a mute, like I had a mutual friend between me and him. But this guy hated me, dude. Like I would literally do things like you know, show YouTube videos I'd make versus YouTube videos that my friend, that our mutual friend would make. And it didn't matter which one of us, like which one of me or my friend was showing in the videos or which videos we were showing. It, it didn't matter even if it was made by like either of us or even if both of us collaborated on it. If I was showing it, he always didn't like the video. And if my friend showed it, he always liked the video. He would, he would criticize the games that I play and my sense of humor and like the words and phrases that I would use. I even told people in my class one day, um, I, I knew he was going to like shit on my jacket because it was like a leather-ish jacket. It was, I think it was like fake leather, but um, it was actually funny enough. It was my friend's, like our mutual friend. It was actually his jacket. It was actually his favorite one. He wore it all the time. Um, and so I decided to wear it and I told the people around me like, oh, wait till Sal gets in here. He's going to shit on my jacket. Literally five minutes into class. He goes like, wow, look at that jacket. You're so edgy, huh? You're so edgy. Why? Like, it's so cringe, bro. Like, he was literally saying all that stuff. I, I actually have witnesses who can vouch for me on the fact that I was doing experiments on him just to show how, like, when someone thinks surface level and they're not addressing their own biases, the moment they apply a label to someone, they will also apply that same label to everything else they do. And this is like a, this is, this is human nature. I'm like, I've done this for everyone on this list. I apply a label up here to Diogenes and all of a sudden all of his stories seem amazing to me, you know? And the same thing, like I was talking about with like Kendrick Lamar, for example, I loved his early music. And for some reason, because of that, I loved his later music. But now that I see his later music as not that great, I go back and I listen and his early music is also not that great. It's just human nature. I'm not going to act like I'm above it. But, but even though, even though it's human nature, it's also important to, I feel like in, in the modern era, like address the fact that like, this is a thing that people do, you know, like th this is why for, for more important things, like when people talk about like presidential candidates and stuff like that, this is also the reason why they're either amazing or they're terrible. Nobody has any like reasonable takes on presidents. And the thing is like this way of thinking cannot be used to judge a philosopher or really anyone, but I would say, especially a philosopher. Like, uh, an example is like, um, that dude on YouTube, Sisyphus 55, he made a video on Jordan Peterson and he spent the entire video talking about things he didn't agree with. But this kind of way of like, this shows like a real lack of humility on Sisyphus 55's part, because if he really wanted to make videos like that on everyone, unbiased, he could, he could just point out literally what every single one of these philosophers said, including Diogenes and including Socrates, by the way. 
where they all said a bunch of dumb shit. Because the thing is, like, most, not just most, like, of an individual person's thoughts are wrong. Most thoughts in general are wrong. Most novel, you can't have novel thoughts. It's like branching off in the, in the direction of a tree, right? Let's say a tree expands every which way rather than expanding directly upwards where there's more sunlight, right? Where they can capture the sunlight and the rain. Let's say a tree would just expand all across in every which way and it was just like a circle of branches, right? Most branches, would they not be redundant, useless branches? They, they would be. And trees have evolved in the shape that they have for that very reason. And just in the same way, novel thoughts, in order to even branch out in the first place, you have to at least first think in like that full circle and go like, oh, okay, this is a thought worth pursuing. Let me continue go down, going down this line and branch out from here. And then, oh, let me think about these thoughts. Oh, let me branch down, let me go down this train of thought, right? In order to even think a new thought, you have to be willing to think wrong thoughts. Most thoughts ever thought of will be wrong. And that, that's literally what it means to be creative. What a creative person will be wrong about most things. And, and they're going to end up in places that like, you could say that they shouldn't be at. But in order to even branch out to begin with, you have to be willing to step into those areas. In order to find any truth at all, you have to be willing to stumble around like an idiot a little bit on your path to get there. Not a little bit, a lot. And, and if you're so concerned with being right all the time, then you never bother pursuing any truth. Because on the journey, you're going to be wrong. Not even by, my, by your own standards, you will be wrong because you're going to end up proving yourself wrong down the line. And that's what it means to learn. That's what it means to be open-minded. Being open-minded is not the ability to take in new information that you don't know. Being open-minded is the ability to accept that maybe, just maybe, everything you know might be wrong. And the learning process, at least up until you're 25 years old, like on a chemical level, is literally just disconnecting connections that already exist in your brain, aka, in a way, like proving your past self wrong. That's what it is. And it's very clear that like these like philosophy YouTubers like Sisyphus55 clearly don't understand Socrates' teachings very well. Because if they did, they would realize that like everyone, including Socrates and everyone else on this tier list and them and me and everyone else I know and they know, we, are, we will be wrong about almost everything we say and think. And so I don't take any philosopher's word as gospel, right? I don't think anything as gospel. I don't judge a philosopher like, oh, well, they said a couple of profound things, but they said ten, 10 times as many, you know, incorrect things. Like, bro, that's every philosopher ever. That's every person ever. If you're going to discount, like, it, you, you need to learn to separate not the art from the artist. You need to se learn to separate different thoughts from different thoughts. In fact, if this was a tier list and I was judging people based on their worst takes, the tier list would look almost exactly the same. And that, that's why, that's why like, part of the way that I'm judging them is like, it's not necessarily, because even by their own standards, even by a philosopher's own standards, they can be wrong. I literally just, I said a story in the beginning about how Plato himself was like, yeah, never mind, I was wrong. And he learned from that. That's why Plato's an A tier. Because even by their own standards, they can be wrong. So how the hell would someone judging them be like, yeah, I know this person was right or wrong or whatever. How could they ever say, because you know what? Time, time is the, is the one crusher of every single thought. Time will prove that the vast majority of every single thing that every person has ever said is wrong. And so I'm like, when I go through this list and I'm not even taking this list all that seriously, but when I go through this list and I'm, I'm cherry picking and I'm being biased and I'm putting people in F tier for funsies and stuff like that. Like, despite all of this, really, I am like, I'm taking these people's philosophies. I'm, I'm taking the best out of it that I can and just applying it to my own life. I'm just taking the best, sleeping on it and seeing how that wisdom will affect me in the future. Right. And, and I'm using that to like find patterns for my own personal journey. And this whole, like, like, you know, dismissal of an entire person's body of work. Oh, this person's a bad philosopher. Just because, well, really because they don't like that person. When you really get down to it, they don't like that person. And it's pretty foolish in my opinion. And nowadays I see it used more and more on the right because they realize how effective it is. But for a while it was basically exclusively, you know, left-leaning like propaganda straight up. And um, 
also like just personally i'd like to keep politics out of philosophy i know that's not possible because like politics it there's a there's a deep overlap there and politics is driven by a person's philosophy but i i try to actually i'm talking about karl marx i can't hear i can't t separate them but um yeah i uh, so karl marx right he's everyone knows him he's one of the most popular and I would say by far the most controversial philosopher of all time. And and look, I'm going to I'm going to get a bit political here, okay? It's it's about to get political up in here. I'm about to make some gamer moves. But um I I I don't think it's fair for the political right, you know, the conservatives or whatever, right? Uh, whatever you want to call them. I don't think it's fair for them to do the exact same thing that they criticize the left for doing to people like Jordan Peterson. Because Karl Marx clearly knew something, okay? His works aren't nothing. If, if, they, if they were nothing, then he wouldn't have so many supporters. So many people wouldn't resonate with him. I don't think he has all that many supporters, honestly. Like, people talk about, oh, all these Marxists, Marxists. I don't see that. Um, like, in my own life, maybe they're out there. I, I, I live in a fairly blue city. I would think I would see a lot of it. I, I actually don't even see that many people who, like, even know much about what Karl Marx wrote about, um... But, but there are, mm, I, I wouldn't say supporters, but there are people who, who resonate very deeply with a lot of the ideas that he put forth, right? Whether they even know they're his ideas or not. But I, I like to make these prefaces because I'm not on any side. I'm on no one side, okay? But my problem is even after I give Karl Marx the credit where he's due, right? Clearly, someone doesn't become that influential by having all stupid views. I look at his writings, and um, I don't know. Just from my personal opinion, they they do seem pretty stupid, pretty shallow. I think I I like this. This really is an opportunity, actually, for me to talk about like to show why Karl Marx and Jordan Peterson and all these other people who argue about all this stuff is like they're actually wasting their time. And I'm I'm gonna be really brief about it. Again, it's very political. It's it's. It's complicated, right? Um, but the, the reason why I'm not doing a tier list on what's the best political system is because none of it really matters in the end. I'm about to tear into all the political systems and I'm, I'll tear all the arguments to shreds on like which one's the best one, okay? First of all, to determine what political system is best, you need some kind of a measure um, or multiple measures of it, right? That would be a bit more robust, I think. But nobody really breaks those down. Like, 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 uh, when, when people talk about this sort of thing, um, they, they never ask, like, how do you measure that kind of thing, right? Whatever measure people bring up to the table. Um, and sometimes there is, like, sometimes people use quantifiable, uh, and I, questionable stats. I'd say questionable a lot of times. Um, like, for example, after the free market started to be introduced, to a bunch of African countries, it literally only took one generation for the infant mortality rate to drop. In, rape, infant mortality rate to drop. Oh my god, I shouldn't have laughed at rape just now. I'm gonna get demonetized. Um, I was laughing at my own little Freudian slip there. <laughs> um, and dude, that's a that's a double joke. That's a double joke because if if I'm like implying with that joke that Freudian slips are like a real thing, then like damn, that's. But uh, I, what the hell was I saying? Okay, yeah, the infant mortality rates, um, in one generation, it dropped from literally where it had been from thousands of years to the same infant mortality rate as uh, Europe in the 1950s. So, um, and which is not that long ago, by the way. It's the, and this, this change in infant mortality literally happened in just a single generation. So you might look at that and you might go, ah, the free market is good, right? But hold on, who's to say that it actually makes people happier? Because like really... I mean, I, I hate the, like, dwelling so much on the natural argument. And look, I am biased. I am biased. I said earlier I don't have, like, a side in this race. I am biased. I'm a, generally, when something is natural, I bias. I, I have a tendency towards that. But, um, and, and I, I, I'm not going to, like, shy away from that. I'll, I'll make that known. Literally, for millions of years, families would have, like, four, six, eight kids, right? And maybe half of them would die before becoming adults. That's been the human experience for, well, for really as long as the human experience has existed. So if you're going to, you know, take that and remove it from 
the human experience, and you're going to claim that it's a good thing, as crazy as this sounds, right? You're going to have to prove it. You can't just take it as self-evident. You're going you're gonna to have to prove it because there is at least one person in the world who's going to disagree with you. And if everyone in the whole world agrees with you, and I see that, and even I agree with you, guess what? I'm all of a sudden just going to disagree just so that there's at least one person that disagrees with you. And also with that fact, right? It's not self-evident that it makes you happier. You have to, if you really want to justify that, you have to first quantify happiness. And the problem with that is that the best quantifiers for happiness that people have today is, is uh, rather just a measure of the amount of lack of misery in a person's life, right? Or self, uh, 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 self said, whatever the word is, I'm this, it's blanking out of my mind, but, um, yeah, it's not self-evident that like running away from misery is the same thing as chasing happiness. In fact, I, I would say many of these philosophers would actually argue that it's quite different. And I would argue that too. It, I would argue it's not even quite different. It's actually close to opposites. Not being miserable is the same thing as just surviving. Happiness is living. They're not the same thing. And, and in most situations, they're so far apart that you either have to pick one or the other. Like a, like the captain of the Axiom in Wally, -E, remember? Um, he was like, I don't want to survive. I want to live. If you if you don't want to be miserable, right? If you if you're fine with survival, you're fine with the hell of a world where you don't where it's not so bad that you feel like changing your situation and you're okay with the like uh not being happy, but you just don't want to be utterly miserable, I'll tell you what to do. Um abandon society, right? Stay inside all day, isolate yourself and just play video games, right? You can do that. Um and you'll you'll never really be all that miserable if you're playing the right video games, but you'll never be all that happy either. I mean, I guess it depends on the person. I would say for people who are really out here like that, people who, who really want more out of life, like the non-normies, right? People who are artists and who actually do things with their lives. Happiness is just one side of the same coin that misery is on, right? And it's the coin that you flip when you attempt to chase something meaningful. Like there is no soccer game without a goalie or an opposing team trying to make you lose, right? If if there if you were playing a game and there was no opposing team, it would be a pretty boring game. And like there are some people that are fine with these like boring games. They just care about winning. But there are some people that truly care about greatness, right? There's no there's no greatness in boxing without the risk of humiliation from a loss, right? To run away from misery is to say I'm not even going to bother being in those fights anyways. And in a way, it's actually running away from misery could be described as running away from the potential for anything that might make you happy. But that's only if you can quantify happiness, which we really can't right now. At least I haven't seen any good quantifiers for it. Maybe there are good quantifiers. I haven't seen any quantifiers that I'm satisfied with yet. But but after that, after that, let's give it all the credit. Let's give this whole argument as much credit as possible, right? All these arguments that these people like Karl Marx and Jordan Peterson make, let's give all of them as much credit as possible. Even if you could quantify happiness, right? It still wouldn't matter because everyone will find happiness in different things in life. Some people do find more happiness in a life of risk and some people do find more happiness in a life of safety and everyone has their own balance to strike. And the whole like, you know, the, the, the bragging results of a political system, you know, in their like reduction of poverty or crime stats and stuff like that, none of that matters as much as the means of which the citizens must act to reach that goal. Like, yeah, um, America releases great art, but at what cost? Grueling 100-hour work weeks for slave wages? Stuff that hardly exists in other developing countries or uh, developed countries? My, and, and the thing is, I actually have, like, my, my own thoughts on this. My whole solution, I'm not going to act like I'm some unbiased. My solution to this whole thing is speak what you live and live what you speak. If, like, you know, they, votes are kept uh, private, right? Not for me. I tell, like... I'm going to tell you who I voted for every time I vote. And also, I'm going to live what I speak. If I say something, I'm going to do it. You know, all those people that were like, oh, if Trump gets elected, I'm leaving America. <laughs> leave. Like, you said you would. So go. Get out of here. Leave. If anything, like, that's a good thing. You get to go to these countries that you love so much. And people who stay are all people who love Trump. So they get the country that they want. Everyone's happy. Win-win. So, like, stop complaining so much. People always say, oh, America should be more like uh, Norway or whatever. Bro, 
if you like Norway so much, go live in Norway if you truly consider it a better place to live. And so, so my solution is this. My solution is have the world consist of a bunch of different political systems and allow anyone to live anywhere. The problem is people are like, oh, Norway is so good. Oh, but it doesn't have this thing, you know, that America has. <laughs> Bro, how do you think America ended up with that? It's the, the very things that you don't like. That are, There is no perfect like system. There is no perfect place. I mean, it can be perfect in your mind if you allow to, if you allow yourself to learn to love these things. But it's so many people are so hateful and so critical, and and so have such a like a complaining mindset. And that's really the the core of this entire debate about what the best political system is. It's just complaining at the end of the day. And people look at like the the results of a place. They're like. Oh my God, I hate how America system of capitalism and all this stuff is. Oh, but I love the results it produces, right? And so, so if you allow the world to have different kinds of political systems, different kinds of economic systems, right? People go to that place because they love the results. They don't think about like the, the means of which those results are achieved. And then they go there and they try to change it. Don't come to America hoping to be treated fairly in the market, right? All the attributes, good and bad, are all factors in the output that the country has that you see that made you want to move to the country in the first place, right? Including including whatever it is you're trying to change. If you change it, then you destroy the very thing that you wanted to come to the country in the first place for. And also, if you say, oh, I don't like it in general. I didn't choose to live in the country. I was born in the country. It should be more like this country. Don't ruin the country for the people who love it. Go to that country that you love so much. Go to where you see is best for you personally, and then go change that place as much as possible. Don't, uh, that's one part of complaining, right? You, at, at least like, I don't even like that kind of complaining, but don't complain about like, don't, uh, it's, it's another thing entirely. It's even stupider to complain about the political system of a place that you don't even consider the best political system for yourself. And, and even after all that, even after all that, even after all that, you need to realize that the pursuit of happiness is an indirect pursuit. Um, and this was actually talked about it with by like Zizek and Peterson. Um, I saw some clips from that whole debate. I thought it was an annoying debate. I didn't really like it. But um, the pursuit of happiness, happiness may be the goal for people, but chasing happiness directly will leave you lost. Okay, happiness is a byproduct of chasing something that's meaningful to you. So, so my solution to this is to create a bunch of territories that are all on the political like. Uh, uh, like spectrum, right? With all different political systems. You know that like graph, like the, the four charts or whatever, uh, not the, the chart with like the four quadrants um, and it's like authoritarian, libertarian, uh, left and right or whatever, something like that. My, my solution is, okay, well, you can argue about like how um, simple, basic and like rudimentary that, that chart is, but I don't think that chart's so bad actually. But uh, the, figure out the details and then create a bunch of different territories all around the world um, that all have different political systems like that, right? They all have every kind of political system that everybody can dream of. And then, and then let everybody move to those countries. Have a strict immigration system, sure. But, you know, at least have an immigration system so people can come in and be like, this is where I want to settle, this is where I want to make my life and I want to play the games that I particularly enjoy and that I resonate with, right? And don't change the system for the immigrants that come in and go like, oh, I want this change. My brother in Christ, you chose to move here. If you didn't want to, if you don't like the system, don't immigrate. Go somewhere else. But, but even with that, even that doesn't work because it's not possible. If it was possible, it would have been done. Because when you really break it down, um, the people who stayed in the United States through their actions have shown that they actually do consider it the best political system. They don't think Norway's better. If they thought Norway was better, they would have left. Uh, they might say that they think Norway's better or whatever but they really don't. Deep down, there's other parts of their decision-making that are not speaking, but that are making it very clear through their decisions that they don't consider it the best. And so even if this was to happen, people would still go to a country that they consider to be the best, and they would still complain because that's literally what's already happened. And, and you know what? Even after all that, even after all that, this discussion, this whole debate still doesn't work because you can break it down even further. And I'm about to do that. And this is this is about to get a, a bit a bit much, okay? So stick with me. In reality, none of these political systems are actually any different. They just appear different in their form, right? 
Hold up, I need some more water. But they appear different in their form, right? But just as, you know, a lot of these guys hate Plato, they would discount the idea of forms. So if we get rid of that, um, all political systems are actually the same. They, they literally all are. It's, 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 when you really break it down, I can, I can Occam's razor, I can Occam's razor it down even further, but I'm not going to right now. Um, I don't want to get too complicated. I can talk about that in a different video, but in reality, all these polit political systems are just the collective female consciousness's regulation of the culture of male competition backed by the male male collective consciousness is threat of violence against each other either by uh you know specific males and females uh, reaching the tops of the hierarchies being able to wield the highest amount of violence or um indoctrination or both right that's usually how it goes but that's every single political system in its entirety and you might be like what the what, what the hell are you talking about okay a dictatorship is not the same as a democracy right well actually um, you can look at how a democracy works in real life. You know, you take human um, um, behavior into account, human nature into account, right? The leadership becomes corrupt when the population becomes too big because they can't hold any infant, uh, infancy, intimacy, and it fragments. It, I was saying, yeah, but I mean, t take a look at the United States government, right? It's like, oh, the most free, freedom, freedom, oh, democracy, everyone gets to say, everyone gets a vote, power to the people, right? By the people, other people, for the people, eagle. Yeah, cool. Freedom of speech. Um, unless the Supreme Court decides that something you said was obscene. Um, how, like, would a small group of people, how, how would they know what's freedom of speech? How would they know what's obscene uh, based on, like, your standards? Um, well, as they say, I know it when I see it, which is literally, you know, what they said in the Supreme Court. The First Amendment, you know, expression standards are determined by a very small group of people who are determined by one person. And what happens if you disobey? <laughs> you get locked in a cage like an animal. You don't get to vote anymore, by the way. Felons don't get to vote. You know, and, and by the way, voting, I, I, talk, I briefly touched on this. Voting is legit actually useless unless you can prove that it's useful. Um, and that's not something that's self-evident. It's, it's a, an illusion that makes people feel good. But the only way to actually make sure that uh, voting is legitimate is to make all voters public. Because in that way, I mean, you don't need to make all voters public. You can do it with a, with a you know, blockchain sort of way where people are anonymous, like a Monero kind of system. Um, but uh, like people have to be able to see a public ledger of everyone's votes and everyone can see who everyone else voted for. And that's really the only way to do it. So people can hold each other accountable. And that's why I, also, I didn't say live what you speak. I said, speak what you live and live what you speak, because I speak about it. Everybody who I voted for, I will tell you. And by the way, I haven't actually voted for anyone. I've never signed up to vote or voted. Um, if I do in the future, I'll probably like vote for like Harambe or D's Nuts or something like that. But um, and speaking of votes, the very core of American democracy, no taxation without representation, right? Oh, yeah, except for those criminals. Oh, yeah, you got caught smoking weed. You got caught, you know, exercising the whole philosophy of my body, my choice. Yeah, uh, we're going to send the ultimate monopoly of violence to stop you from doing what you want with your body. And we're also going to strip your ability to vote. Oh, but you still have to pay taxes. Um, and also, you can work a job when you're 16 and you have to pay taxes to us, but you still can't vote. Yeah, no taxation without representation, my ass. And even taxation. Okay, fine. Uh, I've heard people go like, wow, you really think taxation is theft? Taxation, theft is a strong word. You can describe it as theft if you want it to. I don't have a problem with that. Um, and, and theft kind of also implies intention, a certain kind of intention. But if you really were to define it, taxation isn't theft. Taxation is racketeering. Except instead of being done by the little gangs, it's done by the biggest gang. The government, if you really think about it, is no more than the the gang that won the gang wars and is in control it's nothing more than the biggest bully on the playground making rules for how everyone else should play their games it's the same as a dictatorship it's just a dictatorship backed by the people there's that quote by diogenes and it's um great thieves lead away the little thief uh 
or there's that quote by T.I., uh, big shit popping and little shit stopping. So that that's like the same sort of dynamics that affect how, you know, bullies on the playground will make their own rules and enforce those rules onto everyone else and how they'll, you know, basically round up the kids so that way they can essentially take the lunch money from everyone. That's literally the same sort of um, behavior that you see on the top level of, uh, of human politics. People think that like, oh, it, uh, you know, a d dictatorship is, you know, when um, the people are complacent and so somebody ends up in power because, you know, the people are scared of, for their lives. Buddy, if that's the case, then the United States is not a democracy. People, oh, you know, uh, dictatorship is when they have control over the population. They spread propaganda. Dude, advertising and propaganda are literally the same thing. Like, look at the definition of advertising and look at the definition of propaganda. I'm not even going to say what they are. Go look them up yourself. Seriously, look them up. Like, pause the video. Look them up for yourself. They're actually the same thing. And, and you might say, like, oh, a dictatorship is not actually determined by the people. Yes, it is. If the people don't overthrow their government, they're allowing them to exist. I, okay, fine. Trolley problem. Whatever. But this is a tad different, I think. You see, if you really think about it, the people in a dictatorship actually want that dictatorship. Maybe not actively, but they passively want that dictatorship. Because if they didn't, then there wouldn't be a dictatorship. Like, for example, for example, um, I didn't want to get a blood test for my life insurance thing, right? But I wanted life insurance more. So I considered all the things, right? And after I considered it all, I wanted the blood test. Because in the grand scheme of things, that is what I wanted. I wanted the result. I, like, so, so people may not want a dictatorship, but that's only if they're thinking surface level. If they want everything that comes along with not revolting against the government, so like peace and protection for their family and not being enslaved and killed and all that stuff, and to have like basic human needs, they want all those things, right? All things considered, they want the system that they're in. If your only option is in its entirety, you can have it or you can't have it, then they want it. They may want parts of it to be removed, but if those are your only two options, this system or something else, then they want it. And also, like, there is no democracy that doesn't have corrupt leaders who break the laws that they themselves set. It's literally impossible because there is a such thing as lawmakers. And, and, and even, if, um, even if somehow everything gets reformed, right, and all the corruption goes away and somehow people become perfect in government, guess what's going to happen? The things that those people do that are considered perfect by today's standards, people of those standards are going to look at that and be like, oh, they shouldn't do that. They shouldn't do that. Because morality is a changing thing. Uh, 200, uh, 200, 300 years from now, people are going to look at us and consider us monsters for owning pets the same way we look at slave owners in the past. So, so to have a, a democracy that doesn't have corrupt leaders is literally impossible. But hey, that's anarchy. That's people who make the laws, who sometimes break their own laws, um, and maybe they don't even make the laws. Maybe they just enforce their own rules on the people the same way people tell like, hey, we're going to play this game. And these are the rules of this, you know, hockey game or whatever. They're just enforcing the rules of much larger, much grander scale games over many more people, over things that matter a lot more. Um, and they're just going to call it something else, not a rule. They're going to apply it as the label of law because it's the one that they made and the one that they're going to send their threat of violence after you if you break and go against. And, and all of this stuff is literally determined, like who makes the laws is literally determined by the clashing of violent forces. If another violent force comes and takes over, then they make the laws. It's that simple. And, and, and the, the only reason why our democracy can even stand, the only reason why it even exists is because the government does have a monopoly on violence and they do use it to make and enforce rules on others. So yeah, in anarchy, you know, there might be a time being where there's a power vacuum, but eventually someone always comes to fill that hole and take over, right? And it happens through the clashes of different uh, groups of violence. So when you really look at it, at their core, anarchy, democracy, and dictatorship are actually all the same thing. It's just, it's just children on the playground pretending to be adults, taking shit too seriously. When the majority 
of people are too scared to overthrow the biggest, baddest bully on the sandbox going around, you know, with their crew taking everyone's lunch money. And I can, I can, you know, uh, hop on the same line of logic to show you why a monarchy and an oligarchy and uh, a communist society and a socialist society and all this stuff, all political systems and economic systems, I can show you why they're actually, actually all the same deep down. Um, and it is much more complicated than I'm making it out to be. I'm trying to be brief. I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm trying to be brief. But <sighs> when you learn this information, when you really take it to heart deep down, you can go about, you know, acting on this information in two ways that I know of, at least. You can take the route of trying to change the world, right? Like me with my strategy of creating different territories with all different political systems and just letting people go into them. Uh, even though I don't really care all that much, that would just be my best solution other than option two, which is just me personally, the 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 route of acceptance. Honestly, it's it's a bit complicated because it's not like two options. It is kind of a spectrum of options and the spectrum of options does kind of lay in those like uh, picking the political system that you want. And I think people who, who side more with like the laissez-faire free market thing, when they go past laissez-faire free market, that's when they finally, like when they go like full anarchy, those are will be the majority of people that'll go full like Amor Fati type thing, you know? Like truly just accepting the world for what it is and just living in it. And not only that, because I mean, don't forget the whole purpose of philosophy, right? Don't just live in the world, learn to love the world, learn to be happy in the world that you live in. And um, I think the truly intelligent philosophers have figured out that to, to, to truly be happy in the world that you live in, it doesn't come down to choosing to being like, oh, the world should be like this. It comes down to being in a world that's not so great, but deciding to love it anyways, even though that's like a that's a tall order. I, I'm not saying that's easy, but that's what it's going to come down to. And, and the thing is, the people like Karl Marx and, uh, you know, the people that, that talk about this kind of thing today, that talk about, like, oh, what, what system should people have? Oh, this system is the worst system, but all the other systems are worse and things like that. You know, like in that debate, uh, Jordan Peterson and Zizek, they, they go about this, like this first option of like trying to change the world in their own image, basically, of what they want it to be rather than accepting the world for what it is. And I think that this is not a difficult conclusion to come to. This is not like such a such a stretch. I'm actually only scratching the surface here. I'm really trying to be brief, believe it or not. But that's what's crazy about like, the, it baffles me about like why Karl Marx is so popular if he was such a surface level thinker. Because really, he, he Karl Marx just comes across as a guy who, who was really smart in the way he worded things, but he was just the type of guy to like, if he was alive today, he would be the type of guy to never put his shopping cart in the right spot um, but when the carton arcs show up, he always does it when they show up because, um, you know, unlike someone like Diogenes, who would just shit on the carton arcs, like um, literally shit on them, uh, Karl Marx doesn't have the processing power in his brain to even like, you know, get that far and, and rationalize that kind of thing. He just like goes, like, oh, I was actually I was going to take this thing from my car and check it for a second. And then I was going to put my cart in there. That's the kind of guy Karl Marx seems like. So, yeah, I'm uh, yeah. His ideas are also not that original. Um, like he wasn't really all that creative. And in my opinion, he really wasn't even all that intelligent. On the, like he was intelligent, but he wasn't all that intelligent on the scale of like philosophers, you know? Don't forget the level of greatness we're dealing with here. But yeah, I mean like, okay, I try to give him credit, but he's also one of the only people on this tier list, um, other than the rappers and stuff, that I would consider myself personally to be more intelligent than them. So, but at the same time, at the same time, I'm not out here writing books, you know? He wasn't nothing. And the proof of his, you know, the proof that his ideas are not nothing is in his influence. Like his ideas are, in my opinion, they're not super, they're, they're thought out, they're thought out, but they're not well thought out, but they're not trivial either. And it's just a shame that like, everyone talks about him with such like extreme, like, oh, he's so whatever, like, but nobody ever has like a reasonable take on him. And in my opinion, my take on him, I don't know if this is reasonable or not. I mean, it's not for me to decide what my takes are, right? But in my opinion, there actually isn't all that much to unpack with Karl Marx. Like it's not, there isn't much depth there. And to be fair, I haven't actually 
fully read the Communist Manifesto. I know, maybe if you want me to read it, I can go ahead and do that, by the way. I can go ahead and read it and then, um, you know, see if it changes my mind. But from the bits and pieces that I have read that people cite as like, oh, these are, these are, you know, this is it right here. It, I don't know, dude, it just seems really surface level thinking to me. So I don't know. I kind of don't even want to rank him because if I rank him, then do I also rank all the people today who just like complain about nothing and, and do nothing about it? Actually, I, I shouldn't say there's not a lot to unpack. I, I There is stuff to talk about, but it's like, it's stuff that's like way beyond stuff that uh, uh, Marx like was ever able to think deeply enough into. Like the whole idea of Kali Yuga um, and Nietzsche talked about this kind of thing too. Um, that like society has these like periodic cycles um, and it's not like communism that's inevitable or capitalism that's inevitable, but there's these certain cycles that will inevitably, re inevitably repeat. And it's not even just one cycle. It's like several different kinds of cycles depending on the society. And like, I mean, in certain cases, depending on like, um, their evolution, but that's not a, I mean, society is so fucking soft and they like cancel anyone who wants to talk about anything like that. So, um, like, like Brett Weinstein, Weinstein or Weinstein or whatever. So yeah, there's not going to be any progress made on that front. So I can't make any, um, judgments about that. And, and the thing is like, you know, although right now living in the perspective that we do, it may seem to us like the cycle has been broken, right? We're only in one generation. Don't forget, we're all fools. Don't forget just how small we actually are. It's sight back over and over and over again. Always remember, Socrates of philosophy. That's why I said in the beginning, I'm judging all these philosophers based on Socrates' philosophy. Don't forget how foolish and how simple-minded we all actually are. How our philosophy is almost entirely determined, not even by our thoughts, but by what we see right in front of our faces. So like there's, there is, I feel like there is a lot to, to talk about in this sort of like, you know, like even Batman in Batman, the dark Knight they were like, the night is dark is just before the dawn, you know, that, so, so there is stuff to dive into when talking about like, um, like, like political philosophy, right. From a grand scale based on human nature. And Marx had some ideas, but even his best ideas, it's not like they're like, you know, terrible and can be shot down and all that stuff his best ideas just are surface level and they don't account for some like very, very important things like, uh, like an understanding on how the social mob behaves as an emergent property when they become brainwashed or like basic things like how classes aren't purely distinct levels. You know, there's a ton of overlap in classes and, and, and you know, they can't, e they can't even be judged by the same metrics. Like in some cultures, there's a lower, um, a lower class, middle class, and an upper class. And in some cultures, there's only two classes. In some, there's five. And, and they all have like uh, different meanings based on the culture. In India, the, the philosophers um, and like the um, people who are like spiritually enlightened are considered above the kings. So are considered above like the, the I mean, it used to be royalty. I mean, I guess you could say it still is now in a, in a sense but like above the presidents and above like the highest ranking officials in society, the richest in society, the philosophers who are like the broke people on the street, just thinking they're considered above them. And also this, uh, this whole thing is like kind of based on culture. So it doesn't even have everything to do with your, your level of wealth in this sort of hierarchy, right? Like, I don't know, Karl Marx, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy to have like been around and done all these things to ever explore all these different you know, the vastness of political philosophy, he, he, it's like, uh, he never, he never accounted for like, you know, how overthrowing one political system in favor of another won't actually lead to a utopia. It, it was still a political system formed by overthrowing it. This is back to Uncle Iroh's advice. He simply can't be the one to go and, you know, kill, uh, uh, his father to, to, um, bring a new era of peace into the world, it would be the wrong way to end the war, even if it would be a generally good thing. He still can't do it. It has to be this sort of symbolic force of nature that does it. And that's what the Avatar is. Like, even if you read the books, I've, I've dived really deep into that. The Avatar is the, the, the spirit of the planet, is what, like, he's supposed to represent. And that's really the only way to uh, solve these problems. It has to kind of come from nature. And you can see how, like, even I'm biased because of my own uh, understandings and my own stories that I resonate with, like Avatar Last Airbender. But it's like, at least, like, 
at least there's things that I think of uh, that, I, that I make sure I take into account, um, you know, like the fact that overthrowing one person to install a new system, like in papers, please, right? It's not going to lead to like, oh, now is the real good solution. Now is the, you like, I don't even believe in a utopia. I don't believe a utopia is possible, especially when, you know, this cycle that, that uh, people talk about, that the Kali Yuga and even Marx talk about, has literally happened over and over again, all throughout history, and none of them ever stopped on a utopia. And we're like, oh, we're here, we're good, we found the right political system. That's never happened. And it just, it, it, it reeks of like a lack of understanding of human nature and a lack of being able to think outside of his own little bubble of time where he thinks that like the culture that, that he exists in at that very moment that considers things right and wrong is absolutely grandiosely right about that. It's like, have a little humility, dude. Like, you're a human too, and you're not a very good one at that. And so you really expect humans to somehow one day create a, like, a, a victim-run, forever-lasting utopia? Like, come on, dude. Where is, where is this depth of thoughts? I don't, I just don't see it. Where is the factoring in of human nature? Like, I feel like he had a good understanding of politics. I feel like he had a really good understanding of politics. And to be fair... I feel like he had a good understanding of the failings of capitalism, okay? In fact, I think it's turning out to be way worse than even he could have imagined, I think. But at the same time, if you're going to assert such strong predictions, at least learn a thing or two about human nature or psychology, right? At least learn a thing or two about nature nature or the geology of the planet or the, how, the scarily strong link with the financial prosperity of places and their climate or their biodiversity or the foods people eat, or, or better yet, propose a good measure of happiness outside of the lack of a desire to revolt against a government. Because that, I mean, maybe to some people that might be satisfactory, but to me, I don't think that's a good measure of happiness. So yeah, there's holes in his foundation and not much depth in his thought. And I know I'm going hard on him, but that's only because of how controversial he is. I had to say all this. Truth be told, though, I mentioned the, in the beginning, people are so quick to be like, oh, this person's bad. Everything they say is bad. Dude, he's just an average like thinker, an average philosopher. I, I don't, I just don't think there's anything to really write home about. And um, I honestly don't even think he's really even worth talking about all that much in modern discourse. But I also, I don't think he's an idiot, Okay. I think, I think he's at least smart enough to be on this list. If he was so stupid, so many people wouldn't resonate so deeply with what he said. So he gets to be on the list. I'll, I'll, mm, I'll put him in E tier. I would put him in F, but F tier is kind of filling up, and I feel like I'm gonna be putting more people in there, so I'll leave him there. Uh, Merlot Ponty. I have no idea anything about him. I'm putting him in the void. Okay, this is kind of filling up. Actually, I'm just gonna resize people on this list. All right, into the void he goes. Okay, um, Mill or Stuart, uh, should I call him Mill or Stuart Mill? Oh well, here we are. Okay, uh, look, utilitarianism, like yeah, sure, it's got merit and stuff, right? But it's just so fucking boring, dude. It's the most generic, bland, like dry way of looking at philosophy. It's the shit that like, like Tesla autopilot uh, autonomous driving engineers, like they got to think about it, right? But like for people like us, right? People who who have the uh, privilege to not deal with these kinds of problems, like who fucking cares? Why not just think about things and just enjoy your thoughts and just have fun, you know? Actually, utilitarian utilitarianism is actually kind of fucked because like part of the whole idea is like if something generally causes more instance of instances of pleasure than pain to the overall system of people, then it's okay, right? In that case, torturing and murdering people and eating their children can be justified morally if they create like a stupidly high amount of pleasure to override that pain. And then you might say like, oh, that's, you know, that's not even, that's extremely unlikely. Bro, philosophy is not about what's unlikely. Philosophy is uh, like, just because in a universe where there is a gram, where every single grandma in existence just so happens to be old ladies walking with canes, going around giving candies to little kids, 
doesn't mean that, that the definition of being a grandma is to be an old lady walking with a cane, going around giving candies to little kids. So that's simply put, that's not how you do philosophy, okay? You have to take these things into account. And, and to say that it's impossible would be stupid um, because there are people who do get pleasure from that kind of thing, believe it or not. And now you, and not believe it or not, like if you're into philosophy, if you're watching this video this far in and you're this into philosophy, then you already know that. And now you can say like, oh, it is unlikely. And, and okay, fine. And look, I will, I'll concede this. It is unlikely. And uh, you know, you could say something like, oh, it's not fair to dismiss an entire moral principle because there's some weird, like worst case scenario thing that can happen if you apply it to, but like that would never happen. That would probably never happen, right? Probably. But the thing is, utilitarian arguments in for in favor of utilitarianism are always these same weird scenarios that would probably never happen to begin with. It's all like that. They're all there is no situation where it's all like a perfectly balanced, or like everyone's the same age and they all hold the same value to you. Like really, if you think about it, like that's the most unlikely scenario. Like for the whole the whole entire trolley problem, think about it for a second. The entire the whole trolley problem is the definition of that weird, unlikely scenario that your philosophy also has to account for. So, yeah, no, I don't care if utilitarianism has some utility as an ism, okay? Don't care, hoes mad, shit on the street, F tier. Um, Montesquieu, I would say some French joke, but I would, I don't want another strike on my channel, dude. But, um, I don't know, void. It's like, these are the kinds of philosophers that, like, people learn about just to like bring up in conversation, just to sound smart. Like, if you really think about it, there's really only like five to 10 really solid philosophers that are actually worth diving deep into. Like min max, bro, don't don't waste your time on this stuff. Miyamoto Musashi, ah uh, man, this guy was fucking cool. He is, he's a real life anime character and uh, he's the only Bushido on this list and he deserves it. Truly original, truly incredible story. Um, his teachings have really held up well with time. And you want to talk about a guy who's seen some shit, who's been through some shit, right? You know, all that shit that you see in like movies where like, you know, the Japanese samurai will have like a duel of honor and shit like that, right? This is that, this dude lived it. He was the guy, he set out when he was a little kid and lived that life. He had like 60 sword duels when he was like a teenager and stuff like that, you know? And he never lost a single one, apparently. It's all, uh, oh man, like... Apparently he would literally kill these guys and there is history behind it. But yeah, he's, you know, his, his character, I would say, has really seen shit and done shit, you know? And I say character with like no disrespect. The thing is like ancient Japanese history is really like, uh, people tend to get really territorial and like easily offended, even when sometimes things don't seem all that realistic. And, but I guess that's the power of great storytelling, right? I'm, I love stories. I get more of my philosophy from stories than I do from like actual philosophers. I think, I think I made that clear. Like my, my, all of like the real philosophies that I really base my life around that I participate in, I get them from like SpongeBob and South Park and things like that. So yeah, I like anime. Um, katanas are fucking cool. Uh, they're some of the coolest swords, I think. Um, and watch Berserk. Not the new one. Don't watch the new one. That one is trash. Watch the old one. And fuck Sony for, like, the anime shit. I'm gonna... You know what? I'm, I'm putting him in A tier. I like him. I think he's cool. He looks badass. This is not actually, um, Miyamoto Musashi. It is, uh, the Miyamoto Musashi, um, character in the Vagabond, um, manga, I believe. But yeah, no, this is... Is there a Vagabond anime? I don't think they made an anime, did they? They made a Vinland Saga anime, but not a Vagabond. It says a wild guess would be something like 2024. Yeah, no, I don't think there's going to be a release date ever. I don't think they're going to adapt it at all. I don't know how they adapted Vinland Saga. I don't know how they, uh, you know, managed to adapt shows like that or of that kind of, uh, you know, Claymore and Gantz and Monster and shows that have that same sort of vibe that are a part of that same sort of community of readers. I don't know how the hell they managed to do that, but um, I think Vagabond is just a, it's just a bit out of reach for anime adaptations. And that's why it's uh, A for anime. Nietzsche, of course he's right next to Jordan Peterson. 
But um, yeah, Nietzsche is one of the most important philosophers in today's modern discourse. Um, if you don't know much about philosophy and you're looking for like one philosopher to like read their teachings of and um, like just one, right? You don't want to waste your time. You want one to like dive into. Nietzsche is the one I'd recommend. Um, his teachings really strike at like the very core of like pretty much all modern issues. Like literally any modern issue that people talk about today, I don't even like need to say any specific ones because there's there's so many. You can use them for all of them. And and even though Nietzsche's teaches Nietzsche's teachings are not like, you know, God's here level of like teachings, they still give you like a really clear, solid, like um at the very least like a new perspective to like look at these kinds of issues, right? And like make your decisions uh with like much more information and not be ignorant as to like um what a what a really like truly deep thinking person has to say about those issues. And, and it's not even actually I would say it it doesn't make decisions deeper it makes decisions in today's modern landscape much easier to make it gives you a much stronger intuition and the crazy part is he doesn't even really like preach all that much about what people should or shouldn't do um i mean he does but his whole thing was actually like a a more fati um which is like you know the it is what it is it is what it is and uh you can you can hate it and resent it and uh you know you can always want things to change or you can choose to love it for what it is. And that is a choice you can make. But the whole, like, again, only a Sith deals in absolutes. So I shouldn't go that far as to say, like, the, you should look at it as like true Amor Fati and don't even bother trying to teach Amor Fati because that goes against it. But I'm not so uh, hell bent on you know, making philosophy so uh, categorical, you know, so distinct from each other. But, I mean, despite that, it still doesn't stop, you know, philosophers, like, you know, saying like, oh, I love Amor Fati, only to go on to contradict that, like, one sentence later. Um, but still, like, he also said one of the coolest quotes I've ever heard in my life. God is dead, and we have killed him. He has been long dead since before I was born. Still, I am an accomplice to this great murder. And he didn't say that last part, but I, I said that. I threw that in there. I threw like a little little DLC. I threw a little expansion pack in there. But uh, for real, I think his, like, his most relevant teachings today was like, a, a, you know, how people will abuse morality and language to control others, you know, making them think that they're doing something morally right when really it's just you know, people trying to control other people and they know that it's not by their own standard. And this is everywhere. This is like the the driving factor in why Jordan Peterson is so like vehemently opposed to the whole like Canadian government doing that whole uh, restriction on freedom of speech and like compelling speech, right? He was listening to Nietzsche's warnings about how people will try to control and manipulate people by using like the, the morally correct, like the virtue signaling cultural side of, of doing it, right? They'll like, they'll take one side of the culture, they'll, they'll first divide the culture into two, and then they'll make one side the culturally right one and one side the culturally not right one. So the people on that side become like basically closeted, silent majority, right? But not really majority, but just silent in their views uh, because they're too scared to speak out about it because they might get banned from whatever. They make one side basically just the culture except, oh yeah, we are the totally the right side. And they make the other side, they don't really care. So the other side is always thinking. Am I on the right side? Am I on the wrong side? And and one side is like, oh, we are totally the moral superior side. And then they take that because all they need is half the population. They take that half the population and they say, oh, if you're really a part of this moral side, then you'll support this thing. If you're really a part of this moral side, then you're, you'll support this LGBT thing that clearly contradicts this other LGBT thing that clearly contradicts the other LGBT thing. And it kind of ruins all three of them, but you know what? You'll support it because you're a part of the correct moral side. And Nietzsche was like really the, he was really the guy to show like uh, how people in control will use these like really, really intense manipulation tactics um, that like rely on, uh, that rely on like cultural stupidity and cultural ignorance on like, uh, and also, not even that. It also relies on narcissism, like deep, deep narcissism on a mass scale. The, the, like when people go like, 
people are like, oh, this person, this president shouldn't have done this thing. Like, motherfucker, you're not him. You wouldn't know. How Are you there? Are you him? Do you know him personally? So, yeah. Uh, and, it, it, I mean, it, that kind of thing is basically what's happened today. One political side has basically, uh, and I would say both actually to a certain extent, because the other political side sees this, that they themselves go like, oh, I'm countering this. And they consider their side to be the moral superior side. And I think people, I think anyone with any sense can see which side really started it and which side really dominates uh, the culture and won the culture war and is just going around shooting the survivors at this point. Um, I, I think I think everyone watching, I think everyone watching knows like what's happened so far, who's, who's really in control here, right? Who... If you really want to know who you're not allowed to, who, who controls society, just look at who you're not allowed to criticize. Or, or rather, I mean, I don't think, you know, disabled people with cancer are really in control of society. I think look at the people who control the conversation on who you're not allowed to criticize. I think that'll, that'll tell you, and that's not a small ask either, but I mean, I think that's a pretty solid way of knowing who really controls society is who controls the speech, who controls what's culturally acceptable to talk about and criticize and do all that stuff. And, and, and what's crazy is like, I see this, I see this in my own life. You know, I see the community guideline strikes that I got, that got my previous channels terminated. And, uh, you know, the group of people that, um, that advocate for censorship more than the other group, because in their minds, it's clearly going to help their cause because all they see is censorship that uh, the people in control of their minds tell them that this is the kind of thing that needs to be censored and that you should agree with it. And so they agree that like more censorship will clearly help them when they don't realize that censorship will hurt them too. And so essentially, essentially, I see which political side is deeper into the matrix. I see which side has more people in the matrix. Um, and there needs to be people on both sides. There needs to be. And there will always be people that have tendencies on saying that, no, nah, the world is better like this or the world is better not like this or whatever, right? There will always be people on both sides um, and totally reasonable people. But I, I see for my, with my own eyes which one of those two sides has the people that are more deeply embedded in the matrix that are more manipulated by the people in control of cultural discourse. So yeah, and if, if you... if somehow, somehow you're not aware of what I'm talking about, just read what Nietzsche said and you'll, you'll figure it out. You'll see, you know, which group of people stands to benefit by silencing, like, you know, by, by, by actively pr pushing for censorship uh, on topics like these, because, you know, they want to be in control of what the public thinks. They don't want people discussing it and, and coming to their own conclusions, you know, because they're scared of like the, the opposing force. So, so they don't even let people, you know, have an attempt of like a fight, uh, you know, of going against what they're saying. Um, and nobody does attempt it. Nobody once stood up for me when my old channel got terminated. Nobody went at YouTube like, hey, uh, why would you take this down? Or, or no, when my, uh, I made a joke, I made a race tier list as a joke. Nobody went to YouTube and was like, hey, he's clearly making a joke. He's clearly just doing this to have fun. Nobody stood up for me when I said any of this stuff. And you might assume that what I said in there was racist, right? In, in the race tier list. But I guess we'll never know. Since, you know, talking about these issues, you know, the issues, the same issues that people go like, oh, we as a society need to talk about these issues. We don't talk about them enough. We need to talk about them. I guess actually talking about them is not really allowed. But um, what was I saying? I'm, I don't want to get so like worked up, you know, that's, that's against my philosophy. I'm still working on it, dude. I'm still, I'm human. I'm still working on it. But um, yeah, Nietzsche warned against this kind of stuff. And his warnings turned out to be deathly precise, it, it, like spot on perfectly. And the thing is also a lot of his teachings were also about like not being resentful despite this. And, um, I do hold a lot of resentment towards YouTube for like the bias that they show and their unwillingness to create a platform for the people, but to create a platform that controls people. Right. I feel a lot of resentment to a lot of things. So yeah, Nietzsche's teachings, Nietzsche's teachings aren't just for like the other side of people who, who don't realize who the people are that are in control, who will screw them, right? It's for people like me, because I'm, I'm part of that group of people as well. I'm just on the other side. And it's also for people like me, 
you know, who see these things, who have studied what Nietzsche said, it's also for people like me to, to learn to not be resentful despite all of this. And to think that like someone who went through so much in their life and thought about all these thoughts so deeply that and and like despite all of this chose not to i wouldn't say he chose not to but preached not being resentful because he knew that's what the right move was that like damn dude th thinking about that now like that's that's hard bro that's hard but um i can't he's better he's a better man than me that's for sure but um yeah my favorite thing about nietzsche however is his like his perspective on the whole like uh he talked a lot about morality but it was it, i really really like the whole um morality is aesthetic stuff you know like diogenes even has a quote that's like um blushing is the color of virtue i love that quote i'm gonna put that quote on my wall actually but yeah i'm writing that down but um but yeah uh essentially it was like morality is simply just the human reaction to a narrative right to a story and as digibro said aesthetic is narrative and um, also Nietzsche based a ton of his ideas on uh, Dostoevsky's. But uh, I think Nietzsche is even more relevant. Um, more relevant, but not as creative as Dostoevsky. Not as creative, not as... I would say he's not as smart as Dostoevsky, but way, way more relevant. So I'm gonna... Yeah, I'll put him in B tier. I wouldn't put him on the level of Dostoevsky. Damn, I've been talking hella... I'm probably gonna say... A lot with Jordan Peterson too. This is probably the last guy I'll really, really go in on. And uh, yeah, this one's going to offend people. But as Diogenes once said, of what use is a philosopher who doesn't hurt anyone's feelings? So Jordan Peterson is probably the most popular gateway philosopher today. And people are going to get offended at what I have to say about him. I know they will. But uh, look, even if you love Jordan Peterson... Like, understand this, okay? There's godlike minds on, on, in, in human history, actually, not even just on this tier list, like th all throughout human history, there have been people who think so far beyond the comprehension of normal people, we would be nowhere as a culture without them. The thing is like, okay, maybe, maybe I really shouldn't people, put people like Russell Brand and Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson on this list and like Donald Glover on this list. Um, you know, with minds like Socrates on here, right? Because it's not really fair to compare them. I get that. But at the same time, if I, if I you know, take this leap, right? Because I know people are going to want to hear what I have to say. If I take this leap and I, I just say like, okay, Jordan Peterson compared to Socrates, right? Just so that we can, just Socrates is who I'm using to compare everyone. So let's compare them, right? Socrates was so forward thinking and so intelligent, so far above everyone else around him intellectually. And most people already know this fact. Um, it's an like, interesting little fact. Um, but in case you don't, Socrates had a school of students. And one of his students, his main student actually, was Plato. And Plato had a school as well. And I already mentioned this. And Plato's, like, Plato was really the mentor for another philosopher who can go by just one name, Aristotle. And you know what else? Aristotle also had his own school, and I, I talked about that. He he was like he had, his school basically was like the school of the whole world essentially, and like pretty much every every like modern uh, philosophical like school of thought like basically comes basically uh, derives from Aristotle's school, you know. But Aristotle also did have a few um, you know major students. You know who Aristotle was the teacher of? Alexander the fucking Great. I already, I already mentioned him. Alexander the Great was out here linking up with Diogenes. You want to talk about successful people? All these dudes out here on social media, like, oh, I became a millionaire at 21 and shit like that, right? All these people who do all this drop shipping, they, they always say like, and the thing is, I'm nowhere, as, I'm nowhere near as successful as these people, but I still tell people like, hey, don't treat your 20s like it's the end game, right? Celebrate in your 30s everything you've accomplished in your 20s. Okay, your 20s are never the time to say you've accomplished your potential unless you're Alexander the Great. Because, dude, it does not matter how great these influencers are today. Alexander puts them to fucking shame. He literally conquered like 50% of the entire known world 
by the time he was like what 19 fucking uh where's Machia fucking Machiavelli right here like was out here trying to like take notes on like a fraction of the shit that Alexander the Great did not just said but he did when he was a kid he was a little kid when he did all that but yeah Alexander didn't have a school obviously why the hell would but the, it's crazy how that story continues where the most powerful man on earth then goes on to be jealous of the most like low down to earth most humble like basically the obscene version of buddha that's who the most powerful person on earth was jealous of like for real when you look at it and you look at like the beauty of all this stuff there's like deep lore to this kind of shit right human history lore goes deep people have there have been people who have who have ascended all the normal shit that like us normal people deal with in our normal lives okay so even if you agree 100% with everything Jordan Peterson has ever said ever he still would not hold a candle to these guys at the top it's just like a it's it's like a a fisher right or like a paul morphy like you don't have to be the highest rated player in your game you just have to be the highest rated player for your time and being levels above everyone else is proof of your brilliance. Like, yeah, Magnus Carlsen is considered by many to be the greatest player of all time. But without all these games in the database, without, you know, engines to help him learn the best moves and the best play styles, um, without all of his opening prep and his whole team strategizing like 30 moves in advance, right, for him to memorize rather than actually using his own brain to comprehend on the board right there, would he really have been able to reach this extremely high rating? Like, if his brain was, you know, in the time of Bobby Fischer, if his brain existed then, where none of these resources existed, none of these puzzles or any of this stuff, none of this existed, would he have been able to eclipse him? Honestly, honestly, I'm no chess genius, but I don't think so, personally. Like, yeah, Jordan Peterson may have more raw knowledge than these old guys because of all the stuff that he's read, but his contributions don't even come close. Oh, and some people... Most of them are actually NPCs who just listen to whatever Gotham Chess says. Uh, they all think that Magnus Carlsen was the greatest chess player of all time. Yeah, no. Um, that's like saying Jordan Peterson is the best philosopher of all time. Honestly, it was probably Paul Morphy, okay? Because Morphy is to chess as what Socrates is to philosophy. And in that case, um, my favorite chess player is Tal. Because he's like the Diogenes of chess. Really, like, fuck Queen's Gambit, bro. Someone needs to make a TV show about Tal. But yeah, despite the fact that I'm saying this, I'm, I'm about to offend the other side of people now, okay? I'll also say he's no idiot, okay? Once again, he's under the curse of, like, you know, having a philosopher's brain in the modern era. And because of that, there's also too much information to go through. Like, even if I give you a thousand examples of him you know, not being a good philosopher or whatever, there's going to be someone who's like, oh, but there's like 10,000 examples that you didn't cover in there. He said some brilliant points, you know, and it's like, I would never know because I can't check everything he's ever put out there, you know. However, despite all that, personally, in my own life, which is where I get my philosophy from, which is where everyone else also gets their philosophy from, and they should stop trying to act like they get it from anywhere else. Personally, in my own life, the people who I see who hate Jordan Peterson are usually the stupidest, yet the most pretentious people ever. Well, actually, I mean, people who I find that really just, like, hate anyone um, are really just, like, the stupidest people I know. And once again, people are really soft nowadays, and they'll say that Jordan Peterson is a bad person, and they'll dismiss him completely because, like, uh, because he's an asshole and he yells at people or whatever. But, like, dude, these people, th these guys don't even know how much of an asshole people in history would have been. Like, people they respect so much. Like, Diogenes was, he was such an asshole. He was literally an asshole. He would actually shit on people who disagreed with him. Literally no leafy. And everyone, everyone loves uh, Aristotle, right? Such a great philosopher. Everyone considers, bro, go look up what Aristotle's thoughts are on owning slaves. Or, uh, you know, all the, <laughs> there's literally, like, several multiple philosophers on this list that were like nazis you know go look up like uh you know go look at what karl marx's view on uh, was on jewish people you know 
that all of them get a pass. All these YouTubers be like, oh, Karl Marx, you know, he thought that, but apparently Jordan Peterson doesn't for some reason. I've, I've, I've heard people call Jordan Peterson dangerous, right? Like not just him as, not just his views, but him as a person, he's dangerous. That's what I've heard people say. And I look at the situation and here's what I see. There's one entity speaking their views, right? Mainly about preaching individual responsibility and telling people to pick up their lives and become a competent enough person to help those around you, right? And then I see the other side of the people, another entity, they're not really saying much of their own views, but they're just trying to censor the other side by calling them dangerous, by using language, by using language and words as a means of uh, 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 playing a game of morality. And I'm not even going to give my opinion on that because any person with any common sense will realize who's in the wrong in that situation. I'm not going to say that, you know, one of those sides is trapped in Plato's allegorical cave, blind to the real world. But I will say that Socrates, despite being the most peaceful and humble guy, probably on this entire list, was sentenced to death by his government for, quote, corrupting the minds of the youth. Hmm. Where have I heard that one before? Hmm. Hmm. Teachers are now having to develop their own resources to re-educate boys who are being brainwashed online by his deeply toxic messaging. The Prime Minister has been too slow. Hmm. Calling for, for change on a grand scale. Oh, but that's not the same. That's not the same. Yeah, no. Andrew Tate is spreading toxic messaging. Yeah. Socrates was only spreading corrupt messaging. Yeah, no. That's not, they're not the same. They're not the same. Oh, and uh, teachers have to re-educate their students. Yeah. Uh, re-educate. Not brainwash. They're not brainwashing them. They're not, uh, you know, um, pushing propaganda. No, no, no. They're re-educating them. That's what it is. That's what it is. They're using words. See how people use words? The word educate clearly isn't enough because, you know, of course, Andrew Tate could be considered an educator of these toxic ideas. So we have to re we have to make these new words and, uh, you know, re-educate. Bro, re-education basically justify like it's basically people trying to signify that they have a better alternative to the education that people are already getting. Like as, as if it's not possible to re-educate people on toxic ideas. Right. As if that. No, no, no. It's re-education. And then, you know, the moment one word people realize the bullshit and they go, wait a second, you can't keep using this word and assuming that it has a positive connotation. It's not going to have the same thing because you've been abusing it all this time. And then they go, oh, what about these new words? What about this? What about, uh, you know, we're going to add new, new things. And that's why you look at one political side and they come up with almost all of the words. And that's 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 really what does it. That's why you should read Friedrich Nietzsche or Dostoevsky if you want to. But um, I w if you were to only pick one, read Nietzsche, because you, you look at the way people people will manipulate words and the, the, the like complacent masses will not like pick up the pieces and go like, wait a second, this has happened like a thousand times now where you keep making up these words, you keep pushing them into culture, uh, assigning the fact that they have a positive connotation to them and then uh, assigning them on whatever you want to put the label on and then taking words that are that may be positive, maybe negative, maybe neutral, saying that they have a negative connotation, applying them to whoever you don't, whoever you disagree with just to get rid of them and people just accept it. And, and instead of the masses picking up the pieces and going like, okay, yeah, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to call you out and not let you do this ever again. They just, they, they just go along with it because, you know, uh, the, our war is justified this time. So, I mean, look, I mean, I don't even need to say all this stuff. I mean, unless you live under a rock, you know that there's a substantially large number of people who, like, hate the people who, like, I guess, I guess want to push for greater masculinity in society. And I feel like, you know, that's something that we should discuss, you know, if... Let's decide as to whether or not that's even a good idea to push for more masculinity, right? Forget what the takes are right now. Forget what my take is, your take is. Let's at least first discuss it, right? Rather than, rather than being so hateful that we dismiss what anyone says on one side of the conversation and just label them and try to censor them, right? And I saw the same thing that was happening to Freud when I was little, and I see it happening now. And, and not just with Jordan Peterson, but with really like all the men's mental health guys. 
I was literally, I, I swear to you, I was literally talking to a self-proclaimed philosopher, self-proclaimed, literally my age, actually. Um, actually, I think he was younger than me. And I don't even think, even my age, I don't think you really can be 23 years old and call yourself a philosopher. But he literally called himself a philosopher. But yeah, I'm, I'm uh, like, I'm talking to this dude and he's like, yeah, I was watching this philosophy video and this guy starts mentioning Jordan Peterson and he's like, and then uh, if someone does that, if someone mentions Jordan Peterson in the video, I just leave the video. And he's saying that as like a joke, you know, he's like, ah, I just leave the video. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. You clearly know so much about philosophy, don't you? You, you clearly understand Socrates' philosophy. You clearly understand that, you know, the hallmark of an idiot is someone who thinks they know everything. You clearly know how people, you know, time and time again, you know, people who thought they were always right about everything were always proven wrong. So smart. You, you, you're so smart. Such a smart brain you have in there. Let me pat you on the head because you have such a smart brain. It always, it, it, it blows my mind how deluded some people are, you know? And, and like one day they'll say they're open-minded and the next day they'll literally dismiss the entirety of what someone says just because they don't like some things that they said. And the only reason these people don't even like it is because somebody convinced them that they shouldn't like it. And I, I, can, I can go deeper on a different stream and I'll actually do it. Like, I, I swear to God, I'll actually do all these things that I, I'm, I say I'll do. But yeah, uh, with Jordan Peterson, all the criticism I've heard of like, you know, people about him is like the labels they put on them. Oh, he's sexist. He's misogynistic. He's toxic masculinity. He's conservative. He's whatever it is. And I'll go way more in depth on how people control the culture of language and, you know, will take words that aren't in public discourse, commonly used, and then apply a negative connotation to them. And then they'll do it very slowly. And then all at once they'll use that negative connotation that is like near universally accepted by like the normie masses who don't think about these things. And they'll just like finagle that label onto everyone that they want to be shut down. So the public dislikes them. It's, it's brainwashing 101. It's manipulation 101. And rather than actually addressing the essence of what they're saying, people will just try to apply labels on these people. Like, a, oh, this person has a, has a cult, even if they have a fan base, even if the person saying it has the same thing. They'd be like, you have a cult. And, uh, you know, they'll just be done with it after they finally manage to successfully finagle a label onto them without ever really thinking about the essence of what they're saying. And I don't usually talk about philosophy with a lot of people, um, but I was actually recently talking about Andrew Tate, um, who was like the subject of that whole like cult discussion, right? It's pretty recent. And, and I wanted to do uh, like the, the experiment that's like on the same sort of lines as this. It was a bad idea. I shouldn't have done it to my own cousin, dude. I'm not going to say who it was or anything, but like it's, it's, I'm still learning. I, I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and she's like, Andrew Tate is misogynistic. And the thing is, this has already been done, um, but I tried it myself. So I asked her, I'm like, what is misogyny? Define it for me. And uh, that was the end of the conversation because like she, she didn't know how she, she didn't have a definition for it. People take these words that are kind of used in common discourse. They're not really though. And they go, ah, we're going to make this word a negative word. And then we're just going to go, yeah, you're misogynist, you're misogynist, you're misogynist without actually thinking about like, if someone says, oh, uh, you know, women shouldn't do this thing. Uh, this is more suited for men than for women. Is that misogynistic? It depends on what it is. Let's talk about it. Because if I say men should not be working at a daycare, if I see a bunch of men working at a daycare and not women, I'm not sending my kid there. Is that misogynistic? That's against men. But that's the, basically the same thing. If it works one way, it should work the other way as well. But nobody complains about that. So, so these people, these masses who are like, you know, basically just brain dead NPCs, They'll, they'll, they'll hold opinions fed to them by the people that are in control of, of like cultural morality, like collective morality that people have without actually really thinking about like what people are actually trying to say. And if they can somehow apply the label of, oh yeah, that's misogynistic, even if it's like totally fine, even if it might be misogynistic, but it's still morally okay, they won't think about it. They'll go, anything misogynistic is bad. This is misogynistic. Therefore, this is bad. It's such a blatantly stupid and like, like simple minded way of thinking. And this is really like uh, why everyone is so divided on issues that are like very simple 
to solve solutions, right? Not solutions, but simple things to get people on board and thinking the same thing about, right? Because people want, people want the pleasure of holding opinion without experiencing the pain of actually thinking. And there is some group out there that will give people this pleasure. They'll say, here, you can hold this opinion. I'm, I'm not going to let, uh, you know, make you go through the hardship of actually thinking about the situation. I'm just going to give you the news. Hey, look at what Israel is doing to Palestine. Hey, look at what this person, look at the trees and the deforestation and the, and the carbon emissions. And look at these people who are so messed up and look at this guy and this toxic person, masculine person. And you know what? I see it happening on the other side now. Oh, look at Greta, you know, this like little kid who's clearly just like being controlled by adults, right? Look at Greta. She's such a piece of shit. Like, bro, shut up. She's a little kid. Leave her alone. It, it, like you're literally, these people who are on the right now are also part of the problem. Don't indulge the pleasure of holding opinion without experiencing the pain of actually thinking it through. And look, I'll say this straight up. I don't agree with what a lot of Jordan Peterson says. Okay. In fact, I think my oldest surviving stream of consciousness that's still up on my channel is my disagreements with Jordan Peterson. I made that years ago, like before COVID. So like, don't think I'm some fanboy like the rest of these guys. Okay. I think he's pretty out of his depth on most of the stuff that he talks about, but he's no fucking idiots. Okay. And, and, and also I, I do agree with some of the stuff he says, like the book 12 rules for life. I think that book is phenomenal. Like that's real shit. And it's really growing on me like the more and more I grow myself as a person. Like the more competent I make myself, the more I see those rules starting to actually apply to me, not actually needing to like follow those rules. The more I see them just like working kind of like as an afterthought. Like, oh, this is a nice observation of what happened. Like just recently, uh, there was an emergency situation that I had to deal with and I was the only one there to deal with it in that moment. And um, the way I handled the situation made me so proud of myself, more proud of, than I could have ever been from something that someone could say to me. No words could have ever made me as proud as I was of myself by my own actions in the moment. I was like on overdrive, dude. My brain was overclocked. Like I thought of every possible scenario. I was going lightning speed. I was so quick. Yet at the same time, I was so careful. I'm kind of shocked at my own efficiency in that moment, looking back. And the crazy thing is like, the stress of that situation, that wasn't just like a, a thing that was like, oh, this is just what happens. The stress of that situation got to other people and they were literally in the same position as me. Like, like my brother, I, I have to, I'm not going to tell you any details, but like my brother was in the same position as me because the emergency had to do with my mom and my brother was angry and upset. And he was like yelling, um, like on the phone with me. And when we got there, he was like yelling at me and stuff, you know? Not like at me. He was like yelling out of frustration. People take out the frustration. He apologized later and stuff. But um, I knew he was going to apologize because I knew he did something stupid. And and literally, I was thinking so fucking fast that I knew, oh, this is something I could yell about. This is something I complain about. But I'm not going to because there's no point in it. Let me just focus on what the best thing to do is, is in that situation. I was locked in, bro. Flow state. Flow state straight up the whole time for like hours. And the way I was talking to the doctors and the EMTs, like gathering information and telling them I want information off the books, like, oh, personal opinion, trust me, I won't tell anyone. I was being real charismatic with it. I was straight up Machiavellian getting what we needed out of the hospital, bro. Outside of like whatever obligations they have to their hospital, like they can't say certain things, but I was still getting it out of them anyways. So the point where like literally, um, like uh, officials who were like in suits came up to me, like while I was with my family and they're like, Hey, uh, what did this person say to you? Did this person say this thing? And I'm like, oh, I don't really know. I'm, I'm, and I'm like trying to make the, I'm, I'm not trying to get these guys fired. They really did me a good solid, you know? Um, I don't know what would have happened. Like it was, it was a bad situation. I don't know what would have happened if, uh, if I didn't get that information, but I, I thought about it like a couple of days later and, um, man, I, shit, I shouldn't even thought about that. Cause I, I'm proud of myself for like saving my mom, like a lot, a lot of suffering, like a lot. Um, but God damn, it's, it's still a painful thing to think about. And I guess that's, that's part of the whole thing. Like you have to be willing to accept the pain in, in, in you know, taking the, taking on this kind of responsibility, right? That's like all Jordan Peterson talks about in the book is responsibility. And that's like the meaning of life that he's like adopt responsibility. That's where you'll find meaning. I thought about it and it was like this rule. I don't know what rule it was. But it, the rule was like, and all the rules are metaphorical, right? Clean your room doesn't just mean clean your room. It means a bunch of other things as well. It means 
like pick up your act and get your life together before you start telling other people how to get their lives together. And, and it means a lot more than that too. But the rule was be the most useful man at your father's funeral. And it wasn't my father's funeral, but the analogy is there. And up until that point, I didn't, I didn't particularly resonate with that rule. Like, I, like my thought process, is like if it's my father's funeral, then isn't that my time to grieve? Right. Shouldn't people like, shouldn't people let me like be, but no, no, I get it now. It's not something I can explain to someone. It's not something I could tell you to do. I'm not going to preach it like how Jordan Peterson does. But through my own life experiences, like I, I know what I have to do when that time comes. I know what I have to be. And this like keeps happening. Not like this example, but like many examples like keeps happening over and over and over again. The more life experiences I get, things that I cannot explain to people, what, it, what it's like to be in the situation, the more I think to myself like, Oh, damn, he was right about this rule. So, like, at least the book. I really, really like that book. Um, but, yeah, like, fuck everything else Jordan Peterson said, if you want, right? I mean, if you like what he said, you like what he said. But that book, 12 Rules for Life, is damn fucking good. I stand by it. But, um, like, I'm not going to give Jordan Peterson fanboys what they want either, all right? Y'all are just as stupid as the Jordan Peterson haters. 12 Rules for Life is really great. I really think so. But at the same time, none of those ideas are actually really original. In re actually, Jordan Peterson really isn't a philosopher. He's just a messenger. He's a, he's, a, he's a really great communicator. And I really appreciate his communication. And, and really a gateway, actually. He's been one of my gateway philosophers into this like journey of self-help and good life decisions for myself. Good habits, you know. But let's be clear here, okay? I'm not ranking him in like self-help people today, okay? This is a philosopher's tier list and he's he's no intellectual spire, okay? I think even he would recognize that. I think even he would recognize the difference in the level of greatness that these philosophers have over him. Like, okay, his first rule is by far his best rule. Clean your room. But dude, my favorite philosopher is Diogenes. How am I supposed to clean my room? I don't have one. So, like, he's smart, no doubt. And he's incredibly well-read. But there's a difference between being smart in helping people achieve a set of goals and being brilliant enough to evaluate whether those goals are even worth achieving, you know? Sudguru, uh, Russell Brand, Sam Harris, I'd say E for effort, E tier for effort. Dude, yeah, I'm putting him next to Marx. He's next. That's hilarious, dude. Jordan Peterson right next to Marx. Oh man, that's good. Let me lock these guys in. I'd say he's. I'd say he's better than Sadguru by a lot, actually. But um, I don't know. I still feel like he belongs on this tier. And besides, like if you read Nietzsche and uh, Dostoevsky, um, and Jung too, and Jung too. I throw Jung in there. Then if you just read all what those guys said, then. You basically read everything that Jordan Peterson says, plus way, way more. So Jordan Peterson, like, I like what he said, but he's kind of redundant also. Despite the fact that I love a lot of what he said, um, a lot of the times he'll pull out stats and, you know, facts about, like, you know, psychology or whatever that are, like, that are that are questionable at best. So, so I think he definitely deserves to be on this list. And I think he... I think he's above, he's the top of E tier. He's above all of these guys, actually, even Marx. And the reason why I put him above the rest, actually, I'm putting him in D tier. Nah, nah, nah. It's, it's, it's too funny to put him next to Marx. He gets to go right next to him. The thing is, like, he's, he's a different kind of person. He's not necessarily, like, that much of a philosopher. He's more like a, uh, an excellent communicator, right? A really popular communicator. So, although I, I really... I, I, he's redundant in that I think you should just read Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, and Jung, and maybe a couple others, uh, like uh, Solzhenitsyn and uh, Kierkegaard and people like that, that would really cover everything that Jordan Peterson says. I think, you know, there, there's great value in him. It's like, a, it's like having a popular influencer retweet you, you know? That's what it would feel like if uh, Jordan Peterson talks about your philosophy. And, and I know there's a lot of other people in this space, and I'm just including Jordan Peterson in here, um, he has a lot of overlap with like, uh, well, a lot of like intellectual dark web and like the self-help community and like the manosphere and like the mental health community and the politics side of YouTube and things. I don't really feel like adding any of these other guys to the list. Um, I could do like a, a mini little tier list, like in my head, just off the top, you know, 
like uh, with with their own ratings, right? So I'm not I'm not talking about any of the philosophers in here. I'm just talking about just like the people who are like in the same sort of overlapped space as Jordan Peterson, just their tier list, right? So if in that tier list, I'd say Jordan Peterson goes into B tier, um, Ben Shapiro goes into D tier, uh, Simon Sinek or Sinek or whatever goes into C tier, um, Matthew Fusi goes into E tier. Andrew Tate goes in B tier. Actually, I'd put Andrew Tate in A tier for Andrew. Um, even though he'd be the, right at the bottom of A tier. I would put... Uh, fuck it. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger goes in C tier. I'd put Ziz in S tier. Bro, Ziz for life, bro. Ziz goes in S tier. I'd put Ziz on, this, on the uh, philosopher tier list, bro. Um, I'd put Joe Rogan at A tier as well. Top of A tier. Um... Oh, and also, I know about Destiny, the streamer, um, and I've seen some clips. I think he's got potential, but I don't think he really pushes himself to reach his potential. Like, once again, philosophy is is participatory. So, like, really go out there and, and talk to, like, really crazy people. Don't just go for, like, the low-hanging fruit of, like, the dumbest people to debate with, you know? Like... It's 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 weird. It's weird watching someone debate with college students and they actually kind of in a in a little bit give him like a run for his money or they're able to do little psychological tactics like shift the goalpost and he doesn't catch it. You know, it's like really really push yourself. But um, but but he's definitely got potential. I put him in B tier. Um, I put guys like all the guys like you know who are the older guys, Chris Reagan, Sargon of Akkad, uh, that whole community. You know. Lacey Green and that sort of thing. ContraPoints even, I'd put uh, them all together. And TJ Kirk too. I'd put everyone in that whole, like, uh, that whole community. Uh, I'd put them in E tier actually, except for maybe TJ Kirk. But that was really, uh, TJ Kirk really hasn't done anything noteworthy since like he was called the Amazing Atheist. And not that he had any option in getting the name back or anything. That's neither here nor there. Um, I also think Sisyphus 55 is uh, cool at educating and he's got cool visuals, but um, like he's not, like nothing he said in any way even has any sort of glimpses of even like any intelligence. He's just good at reading off the Wikipedia page. So uh, I'll, I, he goes in D tier. Actually, you know what? I'll put him in C tier because he's also, he's pretty popular and that's that's cool because He's proof that like there's a market for this that exists. So it's kind of like motivational to other people. Like, hey, I can make philosophical content too and maybe get good numbers out of it. And I really, I appreciate that he did that, you know, whether intentionally or not. But he's also bad because he's like, you know, he's hardly, I would hardly even consider him a thinker. I would put YouTubers who don't even fit in this category above him. Like I'd put guys like Mikasas or like Vsauce or um, even like Iman Gadi. Or over uh, Sisyphus 55. I would put, bro, I would put Masahiro Sakurai over Sisyphus 55. So, um, yeah. And I would put, to top it off, I would put Exerbia in S tier. And that's that whole tier list. Uh, so, yeah. I've been spending way too long on these people. Uh, Quine, he's one of the modern philosophers. Um, that's all I really know. Uh, did I skip Chomsky as well? Yeah, oh uh, man. Damn, I really don't know shit about the newer philosophers. I really fell off, huh? At this point in, in time, you know, with this many resources, if you're not going to make your philosophy interesting enough to spread, because things can spread easily, I think that's not only a failure of your communication, I think that's also proof of your failure to understand the world and humans and how they work. So this is stuff that like marketers can do, psychologists, even trolls, internet trolls, like, if they can figure this out, then you can clearly figure out how to make a clickbait title and thumbnail. It's, come on, man. Not to be disrespectful. I really don't know anything about his philosophy. He might be, you know, absolutely brilliant. Who knows? Um, ah, yes. Jacques Gusteau from The Pink Panther. Into the void of nothingness you go. So this isn't Russell Brand. This is Brand Russell. Brand, Brand Flakes. Bold new taste. Brand flakes. I'm putting him in the void, obviously. Oh, wait. I, yeah, I guess I did put another Muslim philosopher on here. I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not rating him. 
the void is calling his name for sure. If I was to rate him, I would actually put him pretty high up. But the thing is, I don't feel like it's my place to rank him in here. Someone else who grew up like indoctrinated with different education from from different religious leaders, they can totally feel free to rank him. They can do that for me. But um, yeah, it's not it's not my place. He was probably a I'd say he's probably a genius in my in my opinion. I think I think so. I think that's pretty obvious. But you know, it's neither here nor there. Uh, Sartre. I already ranked Sartre with the uh, Beauvoir. So Arthur Schopenhauer taught me that no matter how much of a crazy like creative streak I'm on, like and and no matter how much I feel like I'm really out here like milking ideas for all they have, creativity is truly truly limitless. Just like this video that's gone on for way too long. But yeah. It's crazy, and I think that's beautiful, and I really thank him for that, because I, I was kind of starting to become pessimistic about it, and uh, I'm grateful to him for that, but, like, the, his whole philosophy is, I guess I'll just, I'll be quick with everyone. Okay, so, Schopenhauer's cool. There, he has this one quote that's, like, directly after copulation, the devil's laughter can be heard. Like, bro, that's real shit. Like, I've heard how people talk about they'll say some sort of philosophy on how like post not clarity will tell you what's right and wrong, but I've never heard it said like that. Well said, my man. Well said. You are clearly more than just a footnote of Plato. I'll put you in C tier. Oh boy, Jaden Smith. You see, pretty much everyone on this list gets their philosophy from uh, facts and logic, but Jaden Smith gets his philosophy from crack and chronic. Don't steal that line, by the way. I made up that line, and I'm going to use it in a song. Um, I didn't do it just yet, but uh, so don't steal. Don't use it before me. Say packs of chronic or something like that, right? I want the crack. I want to use the crack. I, but yeah, th this guy, this guy, man, he's he's uh, he's pretty fucking stupid. And um, like, I feel confident in saying that. Like, I don't I don't care about like, oh, I might meet him one day because I'm in the industry or whatever. I don't care. He's stupid. And I'll say that to his face. You know what? I'm gonna make a new tier for him. There we go. Jaden Smith can have his own tier all the way below the void into the J tier. Down here where he can talk all he wants about the socioeconomic state of the world. Solzhenitsyn. Uh, I talked about him when I was talking about Jordan Peterson. I mentioned him. And he's actually an important one because, you know, I like, I see, I put Thales right here in A, even though he's like not like the most brilliant, I wouldn't say he's even on the level of like Pythagoras, who I put below him, right? Um, but he was the first, right? And I, it matters being the first. And, you know, there's, I think there's great value in that. And see, back in the day, brilliant people like this, they would just make religions. Like, that's just what they would do. They would just straight up make religions. There wasn't like a such thing as a philosopher, because there wasn't that much of a need for a distinction. There's always been overlap between philosophy and religion. And nowadays, a new term has popped up of a new kind of person or a new kind of, you know, community member. Um, and it's only, it's only now because there's enough of a distinction. And it's self-help. And the thing is, like, both of these things, philosophy, self-help, both of these things were happening way before, like, way before even any religion, modern religion existed. They, there, was never, there was never a need to coin these terms, right? And if you look at it, if you look at Solzhenitsyn's writings... I personally think he was the first self-help guru before self-help was even a thing. I'm calling it right now. He was the first, okay? And if I can make that a thing, if I can make people realize that, that'll be really cool. If, like, I can get that this, like, ter this coin termed, like, if I can get that on his Wikipedia page, whatever, people recognize him as the first self-help guru. I would say he isn't for the faint of heart, though. He's someone that you read... If you're already kind of like at least like 2% strong, right? But you're not where you want to be. Where, because like, okay, truly weak people who can't control themselves, they, there's a, they'll never like be able to cross the barrier to entry uh, for his self-help advice. There's other people with like a lower barrier to entry, right? Like Hamza and them who just tell you like very basic things like, hey, stop jerking off, stop smoking weed, you know, all the time, doing all this stuff, right? Like very easy things to do. Um... But like people who are really going through it in life um, and people who actually need to help themselves and, and, and who have the strength to, to, and the desire to do so, I would say, if you hear the devil's laugh after copulation, then 
that's when you're ready to, to read uh, Solzhenitsyn. If you don't feel that post nut clarity, if you don't be like, damn, I'm wasting my life, I'm wasting my time, I'm doing something wrong, if you don't feel that sense, then it's not going to resonate with you. But um, like, there's a lot of people out there who like, they don't go a day without like thinking about where they went wrong. And uh, basically, it's a post nut clarity. Next time you have post nut clarity, read Solzhenitsyn. Normally, normally, he would be, I'd say a C tier guy. But during post nut clarity, I swear to God, I swear to God, literally, um, if you if you read his works, in the middle of post nut clarity, right? He gets a buff. All of his writings get a buff where you resonate with it. You understand it so much deeper. And just for that few minutes, right? He becomes an S tier philosopher. He has a little power up. So, it's, you know, this is a tier list. So, you know, it's, you have to take these things into account. You know, if you, it's like, it's like a, in Smash Bros, like when someone gets Arsene, it's like if you use the nut ability, then he gets an attack bonus. He gets a defense bonus, attack speed bonus, all that, right? Uh, his hitbox uh, a decrease his hitboxes for other people increases hurt box decreases all of that so for that I gotta bump him to B tier B is for bump Spinoza damn his hair take up the whole damn picture but um this man was an intellectual powerhouse okay someone asked Einstein if he believes in God and Einstein said not a traditional God but I believe in the God of Spinoza and if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know I don't know what will. No, seriously, I don't. I don't know. I, I I don't know anything about Spinoza. I never actually looked into his philosophy. I'm not even gonna cap. And yeah, I should know though. I think I should. Um, from the bits and pieces I've seen, I think he might have been even on par with Einstein actually. But I'm just I'm I'm gonna take a guess here and put him in F tier. No, I'm playing. I only said that because it rhymed. Guess here and F tier. Um, uh, D tier is looking kind of empty. So. Oh, I did add him. Uh, yeah, Into the Void. Sun Tzu. Everyone knows Sun Tzu. Um, the Art of War. Actually, let me show you a small little video of a guy, of a very wise man, explaining Sun Tzu. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight. Sun Tzu said that, and I'd say he knows a little more about fighting than you do, pal, because he invented it. And then he perfected it so that no living man could best him in the ring of honor. Then he used his fight money to buy two of every animal on earth. And then he herded them onto a boat. And then he beat the crap out of every single one. <laughs> and from that day forward, any time a bunch of animals are together in one place, it's called a zoo. Oh, I just got that. The first time I watched it, I didn't actually get like a zoo, like, you know, T-Z-U, like Sun Zoo. It's called a zoo when animals are, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I'm playing. I'm not putting him in S tier. Um, yeah, look, he he's one of these guys who was like really out here like that. But still, The Art of War is pretty basic stuff. It's just a cool name for a book in all honesty. And the, the people cite it the same way they should be citing something like Machiavelli, right? Like the, the point that people try to make when they cite Sun Tzu about something, the point is better made with Machiavelli. Like he's your guy, use him instead. I'm, I'm assuming that you would cite The Prince, but I'm not sure. I, I, I think he's got other books. I'm not sure about that actually either. Never got around to reading it. I don't read. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's make that a, even. I don't think I'm suited to make tier lists, bro. I get annoyed by like this this thing is not satisfying when it like a tier is not like well put together you know okay lao tzu um yeah i'm gonna make a religion tier list so uh yeah stay tuned for that i guess so look there's a lot of writers that i'd love to put on this tier list um george orwell uh ayn rand obviously um huxley victor frankel um Maybe I should put Joseph Campbell on the list. Nah, I won't, put, I won't put Joseph Campbell on the list. A lot of these guys, like anybody that I consider, like, anybody, I'd say anybody, maybe Voltaire, ah, maybe Voltaire doesn't even, nah, I think he belongs on the list. But like anybody that's like, that's like 80% writer and 20% philosopher, like, um, like Ernest Hemingway or, uh, or John Milton, I think, no, nah, that's like a 30, 70 or, uh, or Huxley. Did I already say Huxley? Who else? Camus. 
He's like a, he's like a, what is he, like 60-40, 70-30, 70% writer, 30% um, philosopher, people like that, you know, or or even like Homer, you know, people like that, you know, who, you know, people, quote unquote, you know, or even like, you know, all these Jewish and Muslim poets, whether they were real or not, it doesn't even, actually, you know what, hold up, I'm adding Albert Camus down here under fraud so there we go Camus and uh uh I gotta get better at reading I'll, I'll I'll work on that but um for now it's V for V for Vendetta Alan Watts uh seems like a really grand thinker who somehow escaped the problems that like pretty much all the philosophers of the past like 100 years or so have had to deal with and uh See, for some reason, most, like, modern philosophers, especially after Descartes, like, they, they can't seem to fathom the idea that, like, what works for one person won't work for everyone else. It seems like common sense, right? Like, okay, I go to the gym, right? One person tells me to drink protein shakes when I get home, and the other person tells me not to. And they're both jacked. Um, so if I had only heard one, I would take their word for it. But since I heard both, should I just, like, flip a coin and do what they say? No, I shouldn't just do that, I should start by accepting that what works for one person is not going to work for everyone. And then maybe I should flip a coin and just see what strategy works for me. And if that doesn't work, then move on to the next. But um, how does this relate to Alan Watts? Um, I don't know. I'm just rambling. I'm just doing the Alan Watts. He's, he's considered, I think he's considered, is he considered a philosopher? I would consider him one. In fact, I think he's one of the better ones. Alan Watts is the Bob Ross of philosophy. Okay. Uh, look, man. Look, I don't even know if he holds any of his ideas to actually be true, okay? I guess I guess I should dive in here a, a bit, right? Because people want to hear, like, an independent take on him. Honestly, I, I just want to talk to him. Because, like, man, he seems lost like, in life, you know? Like, who's helping him? Who's there to help him? What family does he have to, to like, you know, guide him through whatever he's, whatever he's got going on in life, you know? Like, academics used to talk about um, the Kardashian curse and how, like, Kanye was, like, the only person who was, like, immune to it, right? But everybody else is affected by it. But uh, it's, it's starting to seem real now. The thing is, I just, I just wish I had a way to explain his actions, you know? Like, I'm never going to say that someone is a bad person um, or that this or they're that. I'm never going to cast judgment unless I can really, really back it up unless I know them personally and all this stuff, right? Like, and, and like, like, look at, like, Karl Marx and Osho and, you know, Kendrick Lamar. Like, bro, I'm putting rappers in this list. Like, even the people that I, like, rank really low on the list. First of all, I'm not even taking this list, like, super seriously. Second of all, everyone on this list I have respect for. Every single person... I, except, I'm just kidding, even Jaden Smith, even Jaden Smith, I have respect for all of them. And the thing is, I can see where things went wrong for him. I see it. I get it. And honestly, like, I love his first project. Like, I really liked it. Like, the, the whole, uh, you know, the song Blue, like, B-L-U-E, it's four songs, but you can listen to them all together. Like, that, I, I love that song. Um, I gotta go back and listen to it. It's been a long time, but um, I really liked to. Uh, the the Jimmy Hendrix with the shits that part and um I love the 808s go back and listen to that part it's in a it's in you I believe and um it's like halfway through but listen to the 808s of it the way that it slides I love that I love that so it's like I'll have positive things to say about like everyone that I could find positive things about you know and I I would like to see the best in people there's my personal philosophy that might not be you know, entirely accurate, maybe the right way to go about looking at life is pessimistically, which we'll get to. But like, the thing is, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, just me personally. And that's just my own life experience that has led me to that conclusion. Um, and and when I when I see someone for the vast majority of people, like I, I know what they I know how it led to that, right? Like with Jaden Smith, I see, you know, the complete mess that is his dad, and I get it, okay? And I just want to know what's going on in Kanye's life that leads him to do what he does, you know? 
I want to know like if he, he's even doing the things people claim he is because I'm not even looking at the stuff people are just telling me and when I do try to look at it I, I try to look at independent voices like reactors and stuff this kind of thing all the independent voices like I, I go I save their videos and then I go check in on it later and it's the videos always get removed every time and see like I'm able to give Kanye a few points over Jaden Smith because with Kanye again I'm judging people by their best right with Kanye, I've seen glimpses of brilliance. Actually, more than just glimpses. If this was 2016, obviously, I think I'd put him in like beats here or something. Like the stuff he was saying about like learning to love others as a way of life and about how like people in the music industry benefit the more divided people are and how like the more, uh, the more that like one side sees the other side as not human, as like lesser human, the, the more money the music industry makes and he like formed the connection there and it was like really solid. Like these are things that I'm like, damn, this is like really good information, really insightful stuff. And the philosophy in his music is beyond anything I've ever heard from anybody in the rap game, like ever. He's the only person I know who has thoroughly rapped, like thoroughly about every layer on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And again, it's another one of those things, like say what you want about the hierarchy of needs and how much like, there's actually a lot of overlap between every layer and things like that. It's a simple, it's oversimplified. I get that. Yet, even still, even though that's simplified, 99% of everyone else in the rap game only raps about the first two layers. Like you have, you have food down. Okay, cool. Let me move on to bigger and better things like esteem. No, nah, let me rap about more food, more money, more money. Oh, I have uh, food and air and water and transportation. No, I got all the cars, bro. Oh, I have reproduction down. And another one thing in the first two layers, physiological needs. I got shelters. I got, I got so many girls. I got more girls, bro. I fuck hella bitches, bro. I fuck all your bitches. Like, bro, enough. Ra like, move on. That's why all these rappers are so miserable because they, they achieve the first two layers. That's all the struggle they know growing up in the places that they grew up in, in the communities that they do. All they know was the struggle of the first two layers, physiological needs and safety needs because they grow up missing meals probably. And then they get all that. They get all the money to satisfy the first two layers and they don't realize the next three layers or four, depending on what you look at, or five, I don't, it depends. But the ne every layer past the first two cannot be achieved with money. You simply can't get that with money. And and these guys, they don't realize that. And so they, they, in, like, they go, oh, this made me happy in the past, achieving the first two layers. How about I achieve more of them? Like, no, after a certain point, it gives you nothing. And they don't realize this. And sometimes people rap about the higher layers and they don't rap about the lower layers and they come across as really pretentious, you know, people like Kendrick. But Kanye is the only rapper that I've seen be able to reconcile in his art all layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in like a in like a really really beautiful way and he his lyrics are proof that Maslow's hierarchy of needs are, are simple and you have to expand beyond that you learn that and then you realize this overlap and then you think deeper and deeper about it for your own personal journey like his lyrics are proof of that not only do they include everything in the hierarchy of needs it eclipses that so yeah like he's I've seen some real brilliance from him and one of these days, I will make a video analyzing Kanye West. And uh, damn, I gotta, now that I've set up all these things, I gotta drive real safe now to make sure I don't like die in a car crash before I do these things. And actually, if anyone knows anyone, you know, who knows anyone, who knows anyone, who knows Kanye West, like anybody who might be able to get connected to him, um, look, I never ask for anything. Go through my entire catalog of YouTube videos, I've never once asked for, for likes and subs even once. And believe me, I've made three hour videos where I really felt like asking for it, but I didn't. But I'm, I'm asking for this, okay? If anyone can get me connected to Kanye, just for a call, like not even, it, like it could be like a Zoom call, bro. Just wanna have a discussion. And, and like you could show him this video and show like, I, I really am unbiased, I just wanna talk, you know? And I'm not going to like, I'm not here to like, you know, antagonize him or anything. I love his music. I grew up on his music. And um, I, I, I like to see the best in people. So, you know what? I'll go out on a limb here. For now, I'm not going to put him in the void. I'm not going to. I'm going to put him in seats here. Once again, I already explained it. I'm not judging these guys by their worst takes. I'm judging them by their best takes. Okay? And I'll go more in depth on it. Trust me, I will. But consistently, time and time again... I see Kanye saying things that are crazy and then I realize 
they're crazy ahead of their time is what they are. And okay, look, I haven't heard anything profound just that resonates with me personally. It might be profound, but anything that resonates with me personally in the past like five years or so. But still, I'm 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 going out on a limb here. I'm about to take this risk, okay? I'm making a prediction for the future. C tier. Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um if you asked me when I was 16, I probably would have read up on every single one of his works and put him at the top. But I'm 23 now. I'm an old man. And uh, all I see is like the most boring ass philosopher ever. I mean, just look at his face, bro. Boring. F tier. Zizek. Oh, man. I almost forgot to put this guy on the list. But uh, yeah, the first video you'll ever watch of him, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. He's got like a really annoying way of speaking at first. But you'll get over it quick. And if you don't watch him for a while, you have to go through that again. It, it'll get annoying again if you don't have a tolerance to it, you know? Zizek is the reason why I would put someone like Jordan Peterson in E tier, why he feels like he's at home over here. Because there are thinkers that are alive today that are in the English-speaking side of the internet who far surpass people like Jordan Peterson, but don't reach, you know, this kind of... They, they, they don't even come close to, like, the Alan Watts, Schopenhauer, you know, that's... This is a crazy, crazy tier right here. This is a tier of geniuses. So, um, yeah. If you really think about it, Zizek is is a pretty creative guy. In fact, I would say he's he's probably the most creative philosopher alive today. I feel confident in saying that. And actually, it's crazy. Because, like, I think about it, and it's like, if you know what you're doing, today, like, right now, is actually a really super good time, like, a really ripe time to be a philosopher, surprisingly. Because there's a lot to like, a lot to dive into. I mean, it, contingent that you don't get banned off social media. If you if you look at the shit that's happening today, like there's full on replacement sex robots. There's like Chat GPT. There's people entering the simulation. There's companies that make DMT dab pens, so you can have a once in a lifetime psych psychedelic experience five times a day. There's an algorithm with no moral compass controlling the thoughts and opinions of the masses. There's technology with like super low barrier to entry that can allow you to immortalize your words. There's, and this is technology that I'm using right now. And it gets, you know, pushed and, and connected to the, to at this point, the real like tangible collective unconscious of humanity just like Freud talked about, but it's real now. No, not just real. It was real when Freud talked about it, but it's tangible now. There's, you know, comfort levels have risen exponentially. Um, global superpowers have nuclear warheads pointed at each other. Uh, there are singular human beings with like the buying power of nations trying to take humans to space. College education, which has been, you know, on the, on the cutting edge, like university has been the peak of like academia and scholar the information and, and the place it's been the place to go for for scholars for like 500 years is now on the verge of collapse almost every nation on earth has teams of hackers hacking into each other's countries blowing up pipelines and stuff like that and killing people yet none of them are officially considered at war with each other because they're too afraid to like say to the population like oh we're at war with these people because back in the day, it was a different world. It was a different world, you know, 200 years ago. It was only 200 years ago where the population was 1 billion. Today, it's 8 billion. People are more divided than ever. The internet has made everyone two-faced, given everyone two personalities. People can't even decide whether or not we're in a global pandemic, as if it's such a difficult decision to make. People with controversial views are institutionalized and labeled as mentally ill, we use our organic body parts to stare at a glowing rectangle like you're staring at right now every single day, spending hours at a time coming up with witty responses to strangers online. Like in my comment section, you're probably like coming up with some cool little quip to like show how wrong I am for some like meaningless internet points. And we all pretend like this is normal. Like, honestly... If freedom of speech was allowed on social media, bro, it would be like a new renaissance of thoughts and ideas. And you know what? For being like one of the only guys, like standout guys in the modern landscape, Zizek, I'm going to put him in D tier. For real, he's, he's 
pretty damn good. And uh, there's really not really anybody else like him that I could think of. Nobody else has the balls nowadays to like speak their mind this freely on the internet. I think he belongs in, in mm, yeah, D tier. D tier is good. Even though I disagree with what a lot of what he says. Okay. Damn, he looks angry. Sigmund Freud. So, um, sometimes people call him fraud because you only need to change one letter. But uh, that's fucked up. That, I'm the fraud. That's my name. Don't steal my shit. But yeah, everyone hates him. Um, you know, nowadays, nobody really takes what he says seriously. But I come from storytelling. And my means of understanding stories has always been through psychology, not philosophy. Philosophy, I've only been getting into, you know, like roughly here and there since I was like 10 or so. But I've been in stories basically my entire life. I've wanted to be a YouTuber. I've wanted to make YouTube videos, tell skits and things like that for literally as long as I can remember. Actually, not for as long as I can remember. Since I was like five. Sigmund Freud is actually, he's really actually like maybe the only guy on this act, this entire list that I actually know a thing or two about. I remember uh, like seeing, I didn't actually watch the video. I don't really, I'm not, SciShow's not really, I'm not their target demographic. But um, I saw a thumbnail of their video and the title that was like, why do we still teach Freud if he was so wrong? And it's like, I said it, I, I, met, I gave the lecture like four times in this video. And it's like, bro, I can go through this list. I'm gonna give it one more time. I can go through this list, this whole list one by one and tell you, why did we teach this person if they were so wrong? And I can say that about all these people. And not just all these people, all people, all people are like that. Like you wanna, there's this Exerbia video. Um, I'm not about to play it, it's a long video. And I, I want you to watch the whole thing actually. It's um, how to be right about everything. Yeah, look, see this right here. How to be correct about everything all the time. Yeah, at the end of the video, kindness. Yeah, that was his conclusion that he came to about like, you know, human beings or whatever. It, he didn't really give an answer. Actually, he did. Basically, his conclusion, his like really good logical conclusion was it's impossible. You can't be right about everything all the time. You just have to kind of do your best and understand that, that knowledge and academia is not a destination about being right. It's a journey and accept that you will be wrong, but hey, the process of being wrong about things that are still really intelligent, you know, really, really impressive that future generations can look back on and be like, damn, they at least thought the universe was made of water. That's really impressive for his time, right? That's really the journey. That's really what's, uh, what's, what matters here. And that's what's fun. But it's the same sort of, it's, it's weird. I noticed the pattern. The only winning move is not to play. That's a machine's way of thinking. That's what machines do. You, you, I need water. Damn, my throat hurts after talking this much. Um, yeah, if you, if you make a machine play Tetris and it's about to lose, it'll just not play. Human beings will go, they'll lose, they'll play again. And if you don't, if you don't see the value of playing, if there's no possibility of winning, then you're just a machine. It's no coincidence that the less humanity someone has, the more that they act like a machine, the more they censor themselves, the more they censor others, and the more they value censorship, right? The less and less they value playing the game if the win is not possible. Because, you know, if you censor people, that means you're censoring the losses in the, in the game of public discourse. And if you don't care about the losses as much as you care about the wins, then you're less of a human. It's no coincidence that like these people who, you know, get their thoughts and opinions from machine learning algorithms are always the people who value being right rather than being authentic. They don't value the journey to find truth that will result in failures along the way. To them, nobody gets the benefit of the doubt for being ignorant. Nobody gets like, it doesn't matter if someone is the, like some 15 year old kid posts uh, like themselves in a shirt that's like has a bunch of dragons on it on Twitter They'll be like, oh, that's offensive to Chinese people. Nobody gets the benefit of the, of, of the doubt to these people. And that's why these people who get offended at everything, who want to censor everything, are so easy to manipulate. Because they don't realize that like everyone who has ever said anything ever will be wrong about almost everything. And, and the people who want to control culture, they can get into the minds of these like stupid people in the masses. And they can like pick and choose uh, oh, we don't like Jordan Peterson. Oh, we don't like Sigmund Freud. We don't like this. And they can single those people out as being wrong by pointing out all the wrong things that they said. 
Meanwhile, the masses who doesn't actually dig deep into their opinions about who they're right about, who, who they think is right, they don't dig deep enough to realize that even those people who they think are right are also wrong about just as many things. So you should listen to what these other people have to say as well. Just because, you know, people have been labeled as, oh, this person's labeled as this thing or this thing or this thing, you should still listen to what they have to say. And this is what I see happening to Freud. Let me tell you this, okay? Freud was more of a psychologist than a philosopher. He, he was more concerned with figuring out how the mind works and why it does what it does rather than telling people truths about, you know, how they should live their lives. Oh, you should do this. You know, he didn't care about that. He did, but not, not nearly to like the same degree as a philosopher. He did it with the intention of telling people, this is how you live your lives. If you want a healthy mind, if you want what you want, you want a, a good mental health, you want to be happy. Here's how you can do that. He wasn't telling people you should be happy or you should. No, he was he was a psychotherapist. He was a therapist, really. And he writes about his experiences, like dealing with extremely troubled people and uh, trying to understand them. And he dealt with like all kinds of people. Freud himself was more open minded to seeing all kinds of people. He's more open minded and understanding to others than most people today, let alone the people who hate him. And a lot of people in academia and the thing is, a lot of people in academia call him a hack. So, uh, you know, I guess he must be. It's not like academia has had any problems with it. It's not like the college board, you know, has had like a series of scandals of corruption trying to manipulate people into a specific political ideology. No, 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 of course not. That's, that's not happened. The, the academic community is above that kind of thing, you know. Actually, uh, I only did a year of college. And um, it was really weird because... The time I was there, everyone was always talking about how like women were oppressed and stuff. And that was like a very common thing that people would talk about. And it's like, that's not weird if you can back it up. But it's weird when I look around and the percentage of students uh, that are women in this college were 72%. And by the time I left it, it changed a bit. It was actually 70%. And like, it was like 2% or something like that. 2 or 3% like a uh, non-binary or something like that. So, uh, yeah, academia in general, especially the school I went to, is extremely skewed. And so people might be like, oh, where are all these people that are so unreasonably labeling everyone? Where are these people? Bro, I saw them with my own eyes. I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't see them. But this has nothing to do with Sigmund Freud. I mean, it does have everything to do with the way people perceive him. But, like, you know, anyone with any sense can see that academia is going to manipulate people into, like, hating thinkers like Freud. But... Aside from that, I also want to make the case that he's a great thinker. So first of all, he is the inventor of psychoanalysis. Um, he saw people who were extremely happy and extremely unhappy and extremely this and that and that. And he tried to like piece together, you know, underlying factors between this and this and this and pinpoint all of it. And there was no literature back then. There was no internet back then. There's none of this stuff, right? And th the thing is, when when a brilliant mind tries to like find these underlying factors and they point it out and it's not things that people want to hear, it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. The people will hate you for it. And like, even back then, like everyone thought he was so weird for the statements that he made. He'd make one weird statement after another, after another, and it would get progressively weirder. Right. So like he would say something like, uh, you know, when people are given ultimate comfort, when they're given luxuries, you know, the things that people strive for, like I was talking about, literally I was talking about Africa actually with uh, this person and he's like, you know what they should do? We should like build a, like a factory in Africa, a factory. And then we should use that to stimulate the prosperity to build this and this and this and this. And I'm like, hey, uh, did it ever occur to you that maybe the reason why everyone loves Africa so much, why, why people consider it like a very innocent place is because they're not doing this. They're not building all these factories. They're living like true human lifestyles. Did it ever occur to you that maybe the moment you do that, they stop being people that you want to defend? And so um, people don't like, even today, it's, even though it's generally more accepted today, especially back then, they were averse to the idea of like pursuing ultimate comfort for everyone and that sort of thing. Like nowadays, more people die of obesity than starvation. So nowadays, there's actually a case to be made, uh, like a strong case, and, and you can convince people. But back then, if you were to tell people like, hey, the thing that you're all working towards on giving everyone like ultimate prosperity and ultimate comfort and homes to live in and isolate uh, opportunities to isolate themselves and do all this stuff and no need for discipline, no consequences for lack of discipline, uh, no consequences for lack of self-control, things go wrong, right? When you don't exercise self-control. When he said that, people were people were offended even back then. Like when he said like, 
people will become overweight if they don't have self-control. Instead of people like taking what he said and, and going like, hmm, maybe there's some merit to it. Everyone instead was like, oh, we should uh, make the food pyramid. We should teach this in schools. Oh, we should uh, not even allow people to make these kinds of foods. Uh, put the labels on this. Oh, avoid fats. Uh, uh, eat more vegetables or carbs and less meats and uh, drink less coffee and uh, less salt and less cholesterol. And th they make rules on rules on rules on rules. And it keeps going because people spend all their time thinking about things that they really have no business thinking about. For all of human history, there was none of this information, yet people did fine because they followed the basic philosophies. One of them was self-control. Everyone wants to attribute these problems to an outside source, and they know when you talk to them that it's both outside sources and inside sources. But in practice, in their behavior, all they want to focus on is the outside sources. They always want an easy way out. You know, they, they want to let themselves live with minimal effort and minimal self-control. So they get offended at Freud. Subconsciously, they get offended at Freud when Freud gave them that analysis. It's, it's, it's all cope, bro. It's literally all cope. And you have to address your lack of self-control. Otherwise, after you overeat, it's only going to get worse. You're only going to have less self-control after the words. And it's going to be even harder to develop more self-control. Uh, like, for example, he said, after that, you're never going to want to work. Bro, look at people today. They consider work optional. They consider universal basic income a potential thing that can happen in the economy like they think that work is like not a part of life that everyone has to do like bro work is a part of being human now you disagree with me but through all of human history if people did not work together if you did not work with your fe fellow man to pelt a bunch of rocks at the cat that's trying to eat you you would all die everyone had to do their part nowadays Females are in a state of conflict on whether or not they should, you know, go do like a job because society tells them that they should leave their kids alone. You know, you give them give them a sugar coated pacifier, get them addicted to sugar with that pacifier, and get and uh, give them some mid lawsuit baby formula instead of chewing the food yourself and and feeding it to their their mouths, uh, the way they do in these other countries. Don't worry about the fact that like uh you know these, uh baby foods have like lead in them and stuff like that. Don't worry about that. And uh, don't worry about the hard work of teaching them and, and raising them and doing that stuff, you know, doing what a mother would do. The government can raise your kid for you. Fuck being dependent on a husband who loves you. Go be dependent on an employer who hates you. That'll give you meaning in life. Empowerment. You go, girl. Once again, using words like empowerment to, uh, uh, like, stimulate in society and culture. Ah, oh, this is a good thing. Anything we apply the label of empowerment must be good. So, yeah, uh... Females are, are stuck with that conundrum, and there's very few female role models with any sort of, like, mental sophistication to point out the bullshit and, and guide females through it. Because, you know, females talk, want to talk about how, like, oh, I can do the difficult thing. Really? Raise kids. Because on one hand, you'll talk about how it's so such a difficult task to raise kids, and it's not something that men can do. If it's really that difficult, why aren't you proud of that? Why are you proud of going and getting a fucking accounting job that anyone can do? Like... These, these females want to act like they're doing the hard thing now. They're doing the, the easy thing. Society is convincing them they're doing the hard thing and they're believing it because they're, they want to lie to themselves and they don't want to actually do the hard thing. And the same thing's happening. Like Meanwhile, there's all these like lazy males who just want passive income. They want to be the next Dan Bilzerian. Everyone knows that. So, you know, all these people are like, oh, no way. Freud doesn't know what he's talking about. Bro. Go look at the anti-work subreddit and tell me Freud didn't know what he was talking about. And you know what? You know what? It gets crazier. It gets crazier. And like Freud had some good insight, right? But then he goes crazy. Everyone thought Freud was out of his mind when he asserted that if you let it go further. He said this so long ago. He says, when you let it go further, if you normalize in society, if you normalize people having no self-control, they won't be able to stop themselves from having sex with their family members. And now... It's like a it's serious, you know, and back then it was a different time. People were much stronger physically and mentally, which, you know, back then it was the same thing, physical and mental strength. Um, so to them, I guess it was it was far fetched, uh, like the whole idea that like people with little self-control would have a desire to have sex with their family members. But remember, Freud had seen some shit, dude. He had dealt with all kinds of people. And I mean, all kinds. Bro, go on Ask Reddit. Look at how many stories back to back to back of people are fucking their cousins and things like that. Look at how many people are molested by their uncles and their fathers. 
I don't even want to say this. I like, like this is literally, okay. I'll say my own aunt was literally trying to smash me and I didn't know how to respond. So I just didn't respond, but she was literally trying to smash. And I swear, I saw it and I even showed my friends. I, sh I, I know that you might be like, Oh, you shouldn't have showed your friends. My friends can vouch for me. And, uh, knowing her and the lifestyle she lives before it happened, if someone were to tell me, Hey, guess who in your life has the least amount of self-control out of anyone? It would be her. It would be her. I, I would, her and like a couple others. And now that I'm thinking about it, those couple others have also said really, really provocative things to me. Like really, oh my God, th that's gross, dude. And that dude, <laughs> you don't, you don't need me to, you don't need to take my word for it, bro. Go on any porn sites. The proof is in the pudding, bro. Look at how the cookie crumbles. Go on any, any porn site and look at the front page. All the titles are like stepsister, stepmom, stepbro, like all of that. Dude, Freud was so ahead of the curve. Everyone thought he was crazy. And, and you know what? Maybe he was. But name one genius that ain't crazy. I live in a blue city, okay? I've seen motherfuckers walk around in furry suits. I've seen men, grown men, walk around with their dommy mommy. Like, I've seen this shit with my own two eyes, okay? If an afterlife exists, Freud is looking at Earth in a perpetual state of saying, I told you so. Now, at this point, I don't think people will truly appreciate Freud unless they have some actual life experiences, and most people don't. They'll think that Freud was just like talking out of his ass until they've been in a really ugly, ugly breakup, you know? They'll think that Freud was talking out of his ass until they see a family member they trust all of a sudden betray them. They'll think Freud was talking out of his ass until they spend some time around kids and they see how they act towards adults that they like versus adults that they don't like, you know? Or when they develop an eating disorder, you know, I would, I would rebel against my parents by not eating food. Like if I didn't like doing something that they wanted me to do, I would basically starve myself. And I, bro, I guarantee you way back then when I was five years old, I did not know about Freud. I was doing this just because I felt like it. I literally, there was a time where I literally went two and a half days without eating food when I was like five. I thought about it at first and I'm like, how the hell did I manage to accomplish such a feat of self-control at such a young age. And I, I think about it now and I'm like, wait a second, it's not, it, it, it wasn't self-control. It was the lack of self-control. It was, it was, Freud was right. His whole, all of his ideas about the defense mechanisms, about repression and all that stuff, it's all turning out to be a real thing, by the way. Shocker, right? The guy who dealt with people who had like trauma of the highest degree could see that they were repressing it. He knew more about whether or not they were repressing it than the average person. Who would have thunk? And like, dude, it's it's so clear. You look at the results of what he said and you have to lend some credit. Like if someone tells you everything Freud said was wrong, you have to go like, wait a second, but he invented modern therapy. It wouldn't even exist without him. Maybe like he got some things wrong, but he clearly got some things right. You know, you have to at least, you know, give him that and then dive deeper into it. Like when you really look at it, Therapy today, uh, like Rorschach test and all that stuff, you could say, okay, fine, sure, maybe. But therapy as it exists today as an industry would not exist without Freud. But I know one industry that would exist without Freud, the pharmaceutical industry, which is, you know, completely fucked and corrupt. Yet people still fall into it. People still go, yeah, I'll take this thing that I don't know what's inside it or whatever. People give shit uh, to Freud for all like the crazy stuff that he would prescribe people back then when there was no literature. But now that there is literature, nobody seems to have any problems with like doctors prescribing fucking ketamine to people, you know? So now it's not a problem. When the masses say so, it's not a problem. Now it's fine, you know? Okay, sure, fine. And bro, I don't even, I don't even need to tell you how relevant the whole like mommy issues and daddy issues thing is becoming. In fact, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to talk about it because that's probably one of Freud's most important contributions. And I won't even say a word about it because... Not even because I want you to go look at it, because I know for a damn fact that like people are going to wake up to it and realize just how actually just how important it actually was. And also, I don't think I can do it justice. And OK, look, once again, I'll say it again. To be fair, just like everyone else, I'm limited to my own personal life experience. OK, I've never actually done a study on this kind of thing, but I've personally never met a single person 
in the process of sublimation ever who claim they were depressed, okay? And claiming you're depressed is not the same as being depressed, but there's overlap, okay? And not once ever in all the people that I've talked to, hundreds of people telling me they're depressed, literally hundreds, by the way, I'm not joking about that. Literally multiple hundreds of people have told me they're depressed. Not a single one was using sublimation. But I saw, I saw everything else. I saw repression. I saw regression even in myself. You know, I saw regression to a certain degree. Um, I tried not to any. I try not to anymore. But I still see it in myself. Um, I see projection not in in myself and in everyone. I project it onto everyone else. Oh, that's that's good. But uh, yeah, everyone projects. That one's a bit of a a bit of a tricky or one. That one's not so simple to get rid of. I think. Oh my God! I didn't even mention the whole like. A, the ego and super ego thing. Holy fuck, dude. I gotta make a separate video on Freud. There's too much. There's literally too much. I'm glad I know a bit about Freud so I can actually justify this stuff. And also, okay, look, Freud talked a lot about sex, okay? Like a lot. And like almost all of his ideas revolved around sex. But I don't think that makes him surface level. In fact, I think when you start to dig deep into someone's decisions, you dig deep enough and eventually it all boils down to sex. Seriously, like I did a stream of consciousness with my friend um, where we were watching like episodes of TV shows like uh, like Love, Death and Robots and stuff like that. And there were episodes where they like had nothing to do with sex, right? And we'd analyze them and we would eventually come to the conclusion that like all of these stories and dude, I'm a fucking beast at analyzing story, okay? That's one thing I'll, I'll pride myself in saying. I'm nothing in philosophy, but I'm a beast at analyzing story. But we were analyzing stories and be like, bro, all these stories not all these stories, all stories are actually the same story deep down. And it's all just about sex. It's all just human beings are the vessels for our sex organs. We're a slave to our sex organs, that those are the real organisms and humans are just the motherships that carry sperm and egg cells. That's all we are. And actually, like when you really dig deep, I'd say maybe this is not a, a thing. Maybe I'm not so great at analyzing stories. I think I am, but I'll put that stream of consciousness in the description. And I think we were thinking some pretty deep shit. And um, I think a lot of other people would agree if they really looked into it. I think a lot of other people do agree with what Freud said. They just don't even realize it because they're not educated. Even people who hate Freud. Because really his ideas were so profound that they've embedded themselves in the deepest parts of our culture. Like find me one person who doesn't know what a fragile ego looks like. Or... Who doesn't know what insecurity looks like or, um, you know, who hasn't said the words like uh, instinct or impulse, you know, or, or, and doesn't know what those mean or um, or who hasn't reflected on themselves making an impulse buy, you know, find me someone who doesn't know what that is. Find me someone who thinks that the sexual marketplace is a perfectly fair and balanced game or uh, find me one person who doesn't think there's any value at all in therapy or, or in just getting people to speak while you listen and like truly, truly listen to them, you know? But then again, there's also people who hate free speech, right? There are people who like censorship. And those are also people who hate Freud from what I see in my own personal experience. Because if you really think about it, it actually makes perfect sense. Freud really put the highest therapeutic value in letting people speak their mind completely freely and just really just like letting people speak their thoughts out loud. Not even so other people can hear, but so that they themselves can hear what they're saying, right? So, you know, if you hate the concept of people being authentic and speaking their minds freely, it's understandable why you'd hate Freud. It's understandable why society is so averse to, to people speaking freely that people need therapy. They need a place to go to do this because society doesn't allow them to. And so, um, so, so in a way, it's like it's totally understandable why, you know, people who hate Freud would hate free speech. If anything, it's like two totally separate reasons to hate him. It's like, if you hate Freud, then you hate free speech. And if you hate free speech, then you have a reason to hate Freud, you know? So it's like a feedback loop. It makes perfect sense. In fact, like, uh, there's people who, who like to point out like, oh, psychologists today, for the most part, don't like, they don't like Freud. They don't respect Freud. You know, they don't, they don't listen to what he says. He's just pseudoscience, right? Bro, psychologists today, that's true. Psychologists today, though, are nothing. They're pathetic. Since Freud, name one person who has had anywhere close to as deep of an influence on psychology as Freud. Name one. Oh, there's two people viewing this, but you can't. 
I know you can't. I'm not even going to wait for your answer. In fact, I know this because the amount of influence that Freud had on psychology, the amount he changed the field from what it was to what it became, he changed it more just by himself than the total amount of change it has had since Freud until today. That total amount of change is not as much as what he did by himself. And I think that's, I, I think the reason why is a feedback loop. I think um, people hate Freud because he changed psychology more than like psychologists today. I think that's why psychologists are jealous. And also I think the reason why it hasn't progressed and why no psychologist has changed it at all and influenced the meta is because they hate Freud so much. It's because they, they hate free speech and free expression. Think about it like this, okay? If you're in school and the classmates are, you know, raising their hands to answer questions and you feel like, you know, you're like 70% confident that you know the answer to a question. So you raise your hand and then an administrator walks in the room and says, new rule, if you raise your hand to answer a question and you get it wrong, you get kicked out of the school. Are you going to keep your hand raised? Are you, even if you're 99% sure that you know an answer, are you going to risk that? Or would you rather just, you know, stay and get your education? That opens you up for manipulation. That opens up the education to where all that's happening is not your takes and not people interacting with each other. It's only the people in control giving lectures to people. And this is what happens when free speech is gone. In fields where there is free speech, everyone raises their hands. The students, the people learning, people new in the field, they raise their hands and they give their takes and they educate, regardless of how wrong they might be, they still try to educate, even though they're primarily there to get an education. They still, you know, will in the process because everyone raised their hands and thus everyone gets an education from everyone else. And it's a continuous game and that's how games grow and, and progress, you know. And the line, if it's a beautiful game, the line be be between teacher and student becomes blurred, you know. At, at, at a certain point, everyone is both a teacher and a student. And those are games that are really, really fun to play with each other, you know, where where I'm a teacher and a student and the person playing against me in, in like soccer or whatever is also a teacher and a student at the same time, you know? And that's when, you know, everyone is equal and all thoughts are allowed. But what happens if someone can police what is said and they get to decide, you know, who is the teacher and who is the student and the students are not allowed to teach, that's for sure. And because, you know, None of these people who are students of this great art of nature, who have a passion for this thing, are able to make any real contributions on their way, on their journey, where they might say something that might be wrong occasionally, but they might strike a chord and actually say something that's necessary because they're not allowed to. They can't teach it. It's, it's precisely that that slows it down. It's precisely their hatred of Freud that has resulted in the field becoming so slow. There's literally a whole new field called neuroscience that has had to be created in the process and had to pick up the pieces. They had to pick up the slack of psychology because psychologists don't do anything. They're lazy. They, they're not progressing the, the field. They're doing nothing with their time but being political figureheads. And in neuroscience, they're actually making progress. And you know, bro, not only is it pretty much like confirmed, 100% confirmed in neuroscience that we have an unconscious mind, just like Freud predicted today, People in neuroscience are finding out the brain is probably, it's not just one unconscious like thing. It's probably made up of multiple like living unconscious organisms, like not just left and right brain, but it's literally the culmination of like five to 10 different organisms with different like, uh, you know, desires. That's why you have so many different voices in your head conflicting. It's probably made of like ten, five to 10 different organisms that we know so far that we have an idea of at least that are all like fused together that make up the brain and they're all alive and thinking independently. That's totally new. And that's, that's rigorous, like chemistry based empirical data backing up Freud's ideas. People claim to care so much about mental health. I hear that word all the time now. Oh, mental health is so important. As a society, we should care about mental health more. We need to focus more on people's mental health. You want to care about mental health? Listen to what people say, especially people you might consider to be wrong, like Freud, because the more time passes, the more he's actually shown to be right, the more he's actually shown to be spot on in what he said. And even if he wasn't, even if he wasn't, even if he was literally 100% wrong, but all the things he said, you should still listen to him and you still shouldn't discount any idea, you know, you shouldn't censor people's ideas. 
in order to actually get somewhere, allowing people to speak authentically and freely is the ultimate bottleneck in preventing people from doing so. Philosophy as a whole, not psychology, philosophy could not be done if the whole world disagreed with Sigmund Freud. People are always like, oh, as a society, we need to talk about these issues. We never talk about them. My brother in Christ, you're the one blocking people you disagree with. But seriously, like, dig into Freud's ideas. Go in with an open mind. I mean, it, you're not going to find it on YouTube because YouTube is all about censorship nowadays. You're going to have to dig a bit deep. But um, even the shit that's like considered the most controversial is actually super interesting. Like, okay, for example, people, people are going to point out, I know they're going to point out, like, what about this, like, crazy, insane thing that Freud said? What's something that, he, that people consider, like, super, like, insane, right? Oedipus Complex, that's one, that's an example. Uh, one of many, and I can go through them, and a lot of them, even I consider crazy. But um, Oedipus Complex, and I consider that crazy, too. The idea, if you don't know, it's the idea that young boys want to have sex with their mothers. And also kind of other way around, um, like young girls want to have sex with their fathers. That's a bit of a different thing though. Um, Oedipus Complex mainly focuses on this. There's a, there's a different, um, and, and the reason why I think it's not the same thing. Actually, this is part of it. This is part of it. See, most people don't think enough about it. They don't go, wait, why is it not also, why is it, why did he say young boys want to have sex with their mothers? Why didn't he say children of this age want to have sex with their parents? Why didn't he just say that? And nobody bothers to think about that. And they just consider the idea completely meritless and they go, ah, that's crazy. And they dismiss it because uh, most people think sex is a, some surface level thing. And that's why like they think Freud is a surface level thinker because he talked a lot about sex. This might be shocking to you. It might be shocking to you because I'm not trying to be like patronizing. I only heard about this recently um, when I was talking to people, but there's a lot of people that really don't think about sex. They really think it's like just nothing, you know? They go out, they drink, they smoke, they party, and they kind of just go on autopilot. And that's fine if you're going to do that. But once again, if you're going to live life on autopilot with no pain, right? Don't have opinions at all. Someone asks your opinion on Freud, say, I don't know. You know, that, that's what you got to do. Don't expect your opinions to be so airtight if you're going to hold them without going through the pain of thinking, right? I was literally talking to these, this, this girl, like literally... Um, it was like last year around this time, actually, no, not last year around this time. It was like last year, it was like 15 months ago or something like that. And, um, I was, I was talking about like how like sex is communication and like trying to separate sex from the communication that comes with it is what makes people dehumanized. And, uh, she's like, no, it's not. Sex is just like, it's, it's, it's not like, you know. There's like contraception, all these things that, you know, will take out the communication and sex. And it, you know, I'm like, okay, so would you have sex with me? Or would you have sex with some random dude? I said that I shouldn't have. Look, I'm not the most charismatic guy, okay? You can tell from the way I'm talking. I'm not like, I just think a lot. I don't really talk a lot. I like to listen, not to talk. I'm not like super, you know, I don't enjoy parties. and that's, I'm, not, I'm not fun at parties. But I should have been like, I did say, would you have sex with some random dude you just met? And she goes, no. And I go, why not? There's no communication. It's just sex, right? Would you have sex with someone who's underage? And she goes, no. And I go, why not? You know, normally, normally, if you think about it, if you want to say there's communication, you could say there's, you know, it's a game. It's a deeply complex mental dance that you can't really have with someone less mature than you. Um, I mean, you can have it if they're less mature, but you'd be taking advantage of their ignorance, right? Hey, but if their bodies are capable of baby making, what difference does it make? There's no communication after all, right? It's just sex. Uh, would you have sex with someone unconscious? And she goes, no. And I go, why not? There's no communication. It's basically the same thing as using a dildo. It's basically the same thing as a sex doll, right? If there's no communication, then that means having sex with someone who's unconscious versus someone who's conscious is just the same thing. It's just as much communication. Like, why even, why even have a boyfriend? Why not just have a dildo? Is there a difference... If there, okay, if you can concede that there is a difference between having, I didn't say this to her, I said, I should have, I said, if you can concede that there is a difference between having a, a dildo versus having a boyfriend, then that means there is communication happening there. That's what that means. And, um, and she did have a boyfriend, by the way, that's why I should have said that. Uh, she had a boyfriend and he was there, like he wasn't talking much, he was kind of on the side. 
Um, he was like watching some like, fucking Aiden Ross or something like that. And uh, her boyfriend didn't think about like sex at all either. He, he, he actually claimed that his body count was two, including her, uh, that he only had sex with one girl before her. And the thing is like, he had been like getting head and doing anal and all this stuff with hella girls. Cause he was like, oh, I don't want to lose my virginity. Right. But he'd been doing all this stuff with like hella girls way before. I told him, I'm like, it's the same thing. You're nutting. You're, you're, you're communicating the same message to the girls, right? It's the same thing. You're just trying to find some cheap loophole. Your body count is way more than two. And he's like, no, no, no. Getting head doesn't count. Eating her out doesn't count. Anal doesn't count and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. Fine. I turn back to his girlfriend and I'm like, so on a totally unrelated note, would you let, uh, I should, I was about to say his name. Would you let your boyfriend do anal with another girl? And she's like, what? no, obviously. She said, no, I don't need, even need to say that. And I was like, would you let him get head from another girl? She said, no. And I'm like, okay, cool. So this is a important distinction. So I'm like, body count, right? If you're going to make it some arbitrary thing, like, then whatever, right? But if you're going to count the instances where you lose control of yourself, you're like, uh, conscious self, right? There's a brilliant quote, a stiff dick has no conscious. If you're going to enter that kind of situation and, and, you know, listen to the devil's laughter, um, the communication is there. So, so let's have a word for that, right? Body count. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. If you want, if you want body count to be considered dick in vagina, sure. Cool. You can have that word. Let's, let's, let's have a word for this then, because that then body count doesn't really matter. I'll never talk about body count because I don't really care. Let's have a word for this because this is a measure of something that actually matters and is actually important and means something. And it blows my mind that this couple, the like, by the way, the girl had like been in relationships, relationships before. She had cheated on guys. She had been cheated on. Like she was like very, very sexually experienced, way more than me. And she never thought about any of this. Like, Neither of these normies had, neither, neither, oh well, neither of these normies had ever once thought to like dig a little deeper as to like what they're doing, you know, and like think about it, you know, people want the pleasure of opinion without the pain of thinking. They don't want to, maybe they want to think, but they don't want to think with any depth, right? They don't want to realize what sex actually is. So Oedipus complex, look, it's, it's, it's a long, long thing. And there's a lot to talk about on like what sex is. It's literally, it's literally the most deep and, and, uh, uh, like information packed topic that a human being could ever talk about ever. It's it, it, like, this is the topic, dude. So it's like, I can't, I'm going to have to make some leaps, like think about it a bit, study up a bit, um, um, and, and spend some time meditating on it. And then you come back to this video. Uh, so now that you've done that, um, Oedipus complex, young boys want to have sex with their mothers, young boy, and be a young boy. Um, bro, young boys don't even know what sex is. Okay. So Freud is obviously wrong, right? Well, he wasn't an idiot. Let's think for a second. What was he trying to say? You know, you want to know how I interpret the Oedipus? I'm just going to get to the point. Fuck the whole, like, you know, walking you through it. It's going to take a long time. Sex is a very deep topic. Here's how I interpret the Oedipus complex, okay? In in the story of Huckleberry Finn, I like I said, I'm a storyteller. In the story of Huckleberry Finn, I remember vaguely, um, it's been a while. I remember like the little boy, there was a little boy, I don't know, I remember who it was, but the little boy was sitting outside, uh, you know, just hang like throwing rocks and stuff like that, and he sees a beautiful girl walking by, way out of his league, right? And for some reason, without really knowing what came over him, he feels compelled to do something impressive so he stands up on the fallen tree that he was sitting on and it's really thin so he tries vaulting across it and he falls over and this perfect girl right just walking by sees glances over a bit still walking she just like chuckles for a second laugh it gives it a little laugh and then just keeps on walking and he's just staring like whoa because like he doesn't even know what came over him he pushed himself. And this is a story I relate to. This is a story I think a lot of people can resonate with. He, he pushed himself to impress for no particular reason. It's not like there was any benefit to this, but he did it. He, he wanted to impress someone who we can assume was worthy of impressing, right? Someone who will 
maybe maybe the reason why they're worthy of impressing is because they'll contribute to the prosperity of the genetics of the people around them in the future, right? Maybe that's what it means. Remember um, that story I said earlier when I was talking about Pythagoras? Uh, damn, that's crazy how it came full circle. This was not intentional. This at my old house that I learned multiplication that this was at, that I was running around in. So I was, I was like five years old. I was, well, I was five years old at most. And um, I remember the moment it clicked for me, I remember going like, mom, 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 look what I could do, mom, look what I could do. And I was getting like so excited. Like I could not stop. Like she was like, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. And I'm like, mom, look, look, look. And I was like, five times five is counting, 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 counting. It took me a while. I had to count it all, but I knew what I was doing. I'm like 25. And she was like, oh my God. She was so proud. She said it in Hindi. I forgot what she said exactly. She didn't say it in English, but it's like, I think about it and I'm like, why, why? Like, okay. Hmm. Let me flail around. Like, okay, my mom raised me and my brother. Um, I saw from the moment I was born a very clear like indication. She was a good mom. Uh, she was capable. And for some reason, for some reason, I don't know why, still don't know why, I felt compelled to make her proud. I felt compelled to impress her. I didn't feel this way with my dad. My dad, uh, you know, Jungian, right? He was... Uh, my dad was the barrier between me and the unknown. He was the hero I could turn to who will keep me safe, uh, you know, from these kinds of things, right? But my mom, like, if I found a cool seashell or a cool flower, I would bring it for my mom. And I did this for years, actually, for years. I would pick flowers and bring it for my mom. Um, I never wanted to have sex with my mom. I didn't even know what that was. But isn't the result of me trying to impress my mom oddly similar to Huckleberry Finn trying to impress the image of female perfection? Isn't that like really a really weird parallel? Trying to show your capabilities that you can play games at a high level to, I don't know, gain admiration maybe from someone who is, I'm, I'm still thinking about these things. I'm not sure, but like gain admiration from someone who is capable of raising people from babies to competent adults, right? Maybe like, maybe to show them that you're competent is, I don't know, I really don't know. Why the hell was I so compelled to show my mom that I could do something impressive? I really think about it. Like, I didn't care about showing my brother. I didn't care about showing anyone else. Why was I so hype about telling my mom, hey, look what I can do, you know? Look, mom, no hands, you know? Why is it that when she smiled at me and, and she was like so surprised at the fact that I could do it, why did I feel so proud of myself? I, feel, I felt so proud of myself. I still remember it to this day, literally like almost maybe 20 years later. And still, I, I honestly don't know. I don't think anyone knows for sure, but um, maybe like because of all the people that Freud would see, he had like, cause he would see like, you know, single mothers, like, you know, basically children who were single mothers, like going through absolute hell, you know, so he could see, you know, what brought them joy. And he'd be like, wow, maybe this is their interaction between kids and mothers and things like that. He saw a lot of people. And so maybe he had a bit of a deeper insight. But um, I mean, I, I, I haven't uh, dove deep into the writings of the Oedipus complex. I know a bit about Freud, as you can tell, I know, like, this is my background. But um, yeah, it's, my point to this is like this kind of conversation, like this kind of discourse, this kind of thing that I'm saying right now is like, is culturally not accepted in society today to talk about. It gets banned, like you get, you get banned by, you get banned, you get blocked by people. Like you, oh, you can't talk about this kind of thing. And this, like it's, and, and, and you know what? It makes sense because if this kind of thing was available to talk about and people realize like the depths that Freud went into on these topics, and like how many deep truths you can find in what he wrote, you'd actually realize like he's one of the greatest minds of a generation. And 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 just like everyone else, not but just like everyone else, I was about to say but, and just like everyone else who ever lived, he said a lot of crazy shit that didn't age well, okay? But all this being said, like I'm I'm trying to I swear to god I'm trying to be brief. I can actually keep going on and on and on about how Freud was not a fraud, okay? If he was a fraud, so is everyone else on this list. So, yeah. I also have to like, 
like, I, I said all this because, like, you know, I have to defend him. But now that we're back to reality and you know he's no fucking joke and uh, the people that hate him are just haters and they're fucking stupid, back into reality, I, I judging him normally compared to all these people, I don't think he reaches, like, the B-tier levels of brilliance. I mean, I don't... I'm, I'm thinking C-tier. I'm thinking C-tier. And also, I mean, besides, there's also the whole idea, like, bro, this is a fucking tier list. Like, th this stuff is not meant to be taken all that seriously, you know? All these placements are probably completely wrong. They're all, like, they're all my biased opinions, you know? They're just, they're what I've been taught as well. So it's like, just like how, you know, people have taught others that Freud is such a terrible person and that he, he got everything wrong, I've been taught my own thing, you know? So... I really, I, I don't think I can rank someone like Freud so high, you know, especially when there's people like Socrates who have like truly, truly timeless philosophies. And that's the thing, like everyone on this list right here would create ideas, but the people at the top would like transcend ideas. They had like anti ideas, like Socrates is like the definition of like an anti philosopher, like kind of tell, saying like, hey, don't trust any philosopher. They all suck. Actually, you guys know that quote? That's, um, that's, uh, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And that's exactly right. I love that quote. And that's why Freud goes into C tier. C is for Carl Jung was better. Yeah, honestly, by the way, Carl Jung, I talked about him earlier. Just read Carl Jung. Um, he's, he's way more clear, way more comprehensive, way less metaphorical. And he goes straight to the point. That's why he's in B tier. And finally, the last person on this list, Camus. I think it's fitting actually to send it off with Camus. Um, he's one of these rare philosophers. I think there's only like three or four on this list, but he's one of the rare philosophers who actually has like a satisfying end to his philosophy, you know? Usually what happens is like people will study philosophy um, until they like reach a dead end in like whatever philosopher they like, uh, or they like just stop studying and they're like, man, I'm done with this. I don't want to keep going through or they die, you know, um, that's a, that's like a zoomer version of Agrippa's trilemma, um, or, or a doomer version rather, but it very rarely is a philosophy ever like a complete journey where like the student actually reaches the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And he completed the philosophy. Um, I guess Amor Fati is one example, but it's not like a start and it's not like a journey. It's just like a, here it is. Absurdism is also one of them. I think absurdism is a pretty solid one, I think. And that's, that's the one, that's the fucking one, dude. You fully realize Camus' philosophy and all of a sudden you become Sisyphus, whether you like it or not. <sighs> Bro, I spent way too much time on the tier list. I'm kind of tired, actually. This wasn't even like a ranking of philosophies and that one would be like 10 times as long. Because philosophers are just one small part of, like, overall philosophies. Bro, now that I'm, like, looking at it, I'm, like, really thinking about the grand scheme of things. None of these people even matter all that much. Like, you don't have to, like, go through and, like, read any of these philosophers' philosophies. I guess if you resonate with someone that I mentioned, then you can go through, right? I, I suspect a lot of people are going to go through and read a bit about Diogenes. But in my opinion, it's, like, all these people can, can be uh, replaced. You know, all these people have counterparts that are much much better than just like the spoken or written word that they said like for Camus like don't bother reading Camus in my opinion just watch Neon Genesis Evangelion that gives you everything you need to know about Camus philosophy in like a way more fun format and and that has the same sort of thing right it's an ending where everyone at the end literally just congratulates the viewer basically they all clap and they go congratulations all like staring directly at the camera it's such a weird show, but it's weird because like, unlike these other shows that are like, and they live happily ever after. Yeah, but probably not. And you can always make a sequel. Nah, dude, Neon Genesis Evangelion really does. I mean, you can make a sequel. You always can. They did. But it's like, in the end, it reached like a, uh, like Shinji felt happiness, a depressed guy. Like that's like real, that was like real depression, bro. And he, he was happy at the end. He was like, Maybe I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm ready to give it a shot, you know? And that's the beauty of Camus' philosophy. There really is a happy ending to this guy. And it's fitting that he's the last guy. And that's fucking badass, dude. To have a philosophy that has a happy ending, there's nothing more badass than that. There's so few philosophers that have a happy ending. And uh, 
I mean, just look at him, bro. Look at him. He's fucking cool, dude. I swear to God, like he knew what he was doing, bro. A guy like this today would be like super famous if he was alive today. How come nobody's like him, you know? Imagine a philosopher like Jordan Peterson, you know, in the modern era, basically. But instead of like hella dumbasses hating you, everyone thinks you're like the coolest person ever. Like how cool would that be to be like, you know, to become like the first philosopher to make like a fuck ton of money and like hella bitches just by being a philosopher. And like, you can do it. You can do it. It's possible. Camus kind of did it. Um, and if he was still alive today, he'd, he would have at least a million subs on YouTube, I think. Just to, just to cap off, you know, this placement on the tier list. There's a quote that he has that I really, really like. And it's, live to the point of tears. And that's been my mission for, for like some time now. Not for some time, for like a few months now. Like if you go look at my, uh, the beginning of my review of the Blame manga... Um, which I'll leave, I'll leave all this stuff in the description, dude. This is going to be tough to go through and, uh, watch it all over. But, um, I talk about how, like, uh, that's basically what I got going on. Like I'm spending my time nowadays, like my free time. I'm just like always like perpetually, like on the, on the verge of tears. I mean, it's like really weird state. It's like just on the verge, but not there yet. And it's really fun. I'm having a great time. And, um, I really like Albert Camus. I think he's a great philosopher. Even though he's, he's not, like, he's a relatively new philosopher, I, st I think he's so great. I think he transcends most Greek philosophers, even. I think he's, like, fantastic. However, he doesn't reach S tier. There's only two philosophers I would ever put in S tier. And I'll take one last moment to, like, draw from what I learned from them and tell you this, okay? Just one final little disclaimer at the end of the video. And although I don't usually feel the need to say this kind of thing, I'll say it here. These tier list videos are bullshit, okay? They're just like, they're a fun little exercise and not really much more than that. They're a little more, they're a little more, but not much more. Like, for example, like personally, I think um, uh, some value you might get out of this is like, I think Machiavelli's teachings are extremely mischaracterized and misunderstood, right? I think he's being done dirty by like a bunch of ignorant people. But that's also, that's also the, the, the downfall. That's also the weakness of these tier list videos. And it's why you shouldn't take them seriously. Who's to say that like Xenophonists or, or whoever, who I put in F tier, I put in the low tiers, who's to say that like, they're not being mischaracterized and misrepresented by the ignorant people like me, you know? And who's to say I'm not mischaracterizing Machiavelli by putting him at a high tier? Like a lot of people, um, a lot of people think Diogenes was anti-capitalist, right? I look at the same writings and I don't see that. I think, I, I feel like he was anti-mob mentality and anti-conformity. But neither of us can be absolutely sure. It's not like we can go ask him, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, Diogenes has this quote that's like, um, in a rich man's house, there's no place to spit but his face. And everyone who sees that thinks it's like, oh, he hated the rich, right? But I think that quote, because I know Diogenes' philosophy, I think it comes from like six different thoughts, like all combined together. One about like bodily necessities, one about like, how people will create systems that don't allow for those necessities to occur. You know, oh, uh, take your shoes off on my carpet and all stuff. Like people uh, uh, get very posh about their things and they're not actually rich uh, because they're so like, they, they value these things. They value all these materialistic things, not necessarily even about rich people, but just people who value materialistic things. I think there's like, and about how people get mad at humans just for being human and for doing human things, all that stuff, right? I think the quote is actually way deeper, but I think that even Diogenes knew that different people were going to interpret it in so many different ways, right? I think that's like part of the genius of Diogenes. He's a bad example. He's a bad example. But for all these guys, like any quote, like I can never know for sure, right? I may be mischaracterizing everyone on the list. Like I think Freud is a great psychologist and I feel like he uncovered tons of like really deep truths about like the human mind that people are too scared to admit. And the thing is, I'm only saying this because like I, there's things that I personally resonate with, right? It's my own biases. Like Diogenes said his quote about with the idea of spitting on someone's face, but he said that with the, with the like uh, understanding that like everyone will understand like, oh, it's a bad thing. It's everyone will agree that it's a bad thing when he's spitting in their face, right? But dude, I know grown ass dudes today. Like I know them personally who would love for a girl to spit in their face. Like if Freud was alive today, 
He uh, he wouldn't be surprised. He would not be surprised. But I mean, like, I can't know that for sure either. Like, the only one thing I know for sure is that I know nothing, okay? That's the only thing I know. Don't take this tier tier list seriously or any thoughts that I have all that seriously. Just listen to what people say and go like, yeah, some people are educated like this, some people are not educated like this, whatever. Oh, this sounds interesting. Maybe I might go down this journey and have some fun with this, right? Just don't take any of this stuff seriously or any of the other tier lists I make. And that's something I gotta, I'm working on myself, you know, to not have so much resentment towards YouTube for like, you know, screwing me over and stuff. I shouldn't, I shouldn't take it so seriously. I should just treat it like a game, you know? Man suffers because he takes seriously that which the gods made for fun. I know that this whole last tier list could be flipped on its head one day, right? This is just, it's just where I'm at right now. It, this tier list is a snapshot of my personal journey with philosophical truth at, the, at this very moment, 23 years after I was born. Not the very moment, at this very moment in time, uh, uh, I, don't, I can't even see the date, whatever. You know, like a few days before this is uploaded. And it's, it, because it's just a snapshot, this tier list it isn't just subject to change, it's guaranteed to change. And, uh, and as Heraclitus said, there is nothing more permanent than a temporary measure. That's more of like a corporate quote, that doesn't apply. That's not actually his quote, I just thought of that because that was, his real quote was, um, there is nothing permanent except change. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do like a drive through and accept change I uh, get it, but I'm tss. homophone plus the pun. Oh wait, yeah, homophone plus pun. Damn, I'm such a fucking boss, dude. Sometimes I sh I say shit that like impresses myself. I don't know how that happens, but um, yeah, I I gotta I gotta I always gotta remind myself, forever and always, I can't be such a fucking philosophy snob and act like my opinion is more valid than anyone else's and oh, oh yeah this person was stupid because they said a bunch of jordan peterson sucks because he talks about fucking you know the lobster overlords or what i don't give a fuck about no, like who cares bro so yeah that's um that's pretty much all i gotta say i get the feeling that uh more and more people in the future are going to start getting into philosophy as time goes on not even that they like watch the video i just think that more and more people are going to get into it Especially like the new kids, they're going to start like really biting down into all the ideas of all the great philosophers of the past. And I'm excited to see what people come up with. I predict that a ton of people are going to fall in love with Diogenes like I have. I predict that not a, people, not a lot of people are going to like Socrates all that much, believe it or not. Even though he's like literally the flawless philosopher, I, I think that uh, there's going to be a, a significant chunk of people that just don't like him. Just a hunch though, just a hunch. And I, I also predict that... The most talked about philosopher would probably be Karl, Karl Marx. Um, he already is, but I feel like it's going to be way more. Um, and then after people realize that his ideas are like relatively simple and, you know, not uh, pretty surface level, then it'll die down and people will stop talking about him so much. And then like a new wave of philosophers are going to come through, you know, not just people who are like really good at speaking, but people who are like really, really deep thinkers and coming up with really creative original ideas. And it's going to be on all sides. Um, and primarily though, it's going to be people on no political sides, you know, cause that's where the philosophy meta has evolved to. You're not really a truly deep thinker unless you like, don't pick a side, you know, at this point. But, um, yeah, it's interesting to find the patterns in this tier list. Now that I'm looking at it, people at the top are really people who like dedicated their lives to like, to basically just thinking about really nothing in particular. Oh yeah. And I also hear, I, I mentioned this earlier, I hear a lot of people don't like Plato, but um, I'm predicting it. One day, maybe I'm not predicting it, but hopefully they'll break free from their cave one day. And just to tie it all up with a nice little neat bow, put the cherry on top, I'll leave you with one final Diogenes quote, because I know hella. And this one right here, this quote, you thought what I said earlier was cool? This is the most profound quote of them all. You're gonna love this. This is literally the best quote. This is the best sentence I will say this entire video, okay? Ready? If only it was as easy to vanish hunger by rubbing your belly as it is to masturbate. That's it. Okay, bye guys.